This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 16. A Learned Italian. Seizing in his arms the friend so long and ardently desired, Dantes almost carried him towards the window, in order to obtain a better view of his features by the aid of the imperfect light that struggled through the grating. He was a man of small stature, with hair bleached rather by suffering and sorrow than by age. He had a deep-set penetrating eye, almost buried beneath the thick grey eyebrow, and a long, and still black, beard reaching down to his breast. His thin face, deeply furrowed by care, and the bold outline of his strongly marked features, betokened a man more accustomed to exercise his mental facilities than his physical strength. Large drops of perspiration were now standing on his brow, while the garments that hung about him were so ragged that one could only guess at the pattern upon which they had originally been fashioned. The stranger might have numbered sixty or sixty-five years, but a certain briskness and appearance of vigour in his movements made it probable that he was aged more from captivity than the course of time. He received the enthusiastic greeting of his young acquaintance with evident pleasure, as though his chilled affections were rekindled and invigorated by his contact with one so warm and ardent. He thanked him with grateful cordiality for his kindly welcome, although he must at that moment have been suffering bitterly to find another dungeon where he had fondly reckoned on discovering a means of regaining his liberty. "'Let us first see,' said he, "'whether it is possible to remove the traces of my entrance here. Our future tranquillity depends upon our jailers being entirely ignorant of it.' Advancing to the opening, he stooped and raised the stone easily in spite of its weight. Then, fitting it into its place, he said, "'You removed this stone very carelessly.' "'but I suppose you had no tools to aid you.' "'Why?' exclaimed Dantes with astonishment. "'Do you possess any?' "'I made myself some, and with the exception of a file, "'I have all that are necessary, a chisel, pincers, and lever. "'Oh, how I should like to see these products of your industry and patience! "'Well, in the first place, here is my chisel.' "'So saying, he displayed a sharp, strong blade.' "'with a handle made of beechwood. "'And with what did you contrive to make that?' "'inquired Dantes. "'With one of the clamps of my bedstand, "'and this very tall has sufficed me to hollow out the road "'by which I came hither, "'a distance of about fifty feet.' Fifty feet?' "'responded Dantes, almost terrified. "'Do not speak so loud, young man. "'Don't speak so loud. "'It frequently occurs in a state prison like this, that persons are stationed outside the doors of the cells, purposely to overhear the conversation of the prisoners. But they believe I am shut up alone here. That makes no difference. Are you saying that you dug your way a distance of fifty feet to get here? I do. That is about the distance that separates your chamber from mine. Only, unfortunately, I did not curve right for want of the necessary geometric instruments to calculate my scale of proportion. Instead of taking an ellipse of forty feet, I made it fifty. I expected, as I told you, to reach the outer wall, pierce through it, and throw myself into the sea. I have, however, kept along the corridor which your chamber opens, instead of going beneath it. My labour is all in vain, for I find that the corridor looks into a courtyard filled with soldiers. "'That's true,' said Dantes. "'But the corridor you speak of only bounds one side of my cell. "'There are three others. "'Do you know anything of their situation?' "'This one is built against the solid rock, "'and it would take ten experienced miners, "'duly furnished with the requisite tools, "'as many years to perforate it. "'This adjoins the lower part of the governor's apartments, "'and were we to work our way through, "'we should only get into some lock-up cells.' we must necessarily be recaptured. The fourth and last side of your cell faces on... faces on... Stop a minute. Now where does it face? 
The wall of which he spoke was the one in which was fixed the loophole by which light was admitted to the chamber. This loophole, which gradually diminished in size as it approached the outside, to an opening through which a child could not have passed, was, for better security, furnished with three iron bars, so as to quiet all apprehensions, even in the mind of the most suspicious jailer, as to the possibility of a prisoner's escape. As the stranger asked the question, he dragged the table beneath the window. "'Climb up,' said he to Dantes. The young man obeyed, mounted on the table, and, divining the wishes of his companion, placed his back securely against the wall, and held out both hands. The stranger, whom as yet Dantes knew only by the number of his cell, sprang up with an agility by no means to be expected in a person of his years, and, light and steady on his feet as a cat or a lizard, climbed from the table to the outstretched hands of Dantes, and from them to his shoulders. Then, bending double, for the ceiling of the dungeon prevented him from holding himself erect, he managed to slip his head between the upper bars of the window, so as to be able to command a perfect view from top to bottom. An instant afterwards he hastily drew back his head, saying, "'I thought so,' and sliding from the shoulders of Dantes as dexterously as he had descended, he nimbly leaped from the table to the ground." "'What was it that you thought?' asked the young man anxiously, in his turn descending from the table. The elder prisoner pondered the matter. "'Yes,' said he at length. "'It is so. This side of your chamber looks out upon a kind of open gallery, where patrols are continually passing, and sentries keep watch day and night.' "'Are you quite sure of that?' "'Certain.' I saw the soldier's shape and the top of his musket. That made me drew my head in so quickly, for I was frightful he might also see me. Well? inquired Dantes. You perceive, then, the utter impossibility of escaping through your dungeon? Then, pursued the young man eagerly. Then, answered the elder prisoner, the will of God will be done. And as the old man slowly pronounced those words, an air of profound resignation spread itself over his careworn countenance. Dantes gazed on the man who could thus philosophically resign hopes so long and ardently nourished, with an astonishment mingled with admiration. "'Tell me, I entreat of you, who and what you are,' said he at length. "'Never ever met with so remarkable a person as yourself.' "'Willingly.' "'answered the stranger, "'if indeed you feel any curiosity respecting one, "'now, alas, powerless to aid you in any way. "'Say not so. "'You can counsel and support me "'by the strength of your own powerful mind. "'Pray let me know who you really are.' "'The stranger smiled a melancholy smile. "'Then listen,' said he. "'I am the Abbey Farrier, "'and have been imprisoned, as you know, "'in this Chateau d'Ilf since the year 1811.' previously to which I had been confined for three years, in the fortress of Fenestrelia. In the year 1811, I was transferred to Piedmont in France. It was at this period I learned that the destiny which seemed subservient to every wish, formed by Napoleon, had bestowed on him a son, named King of Rome even in his cradle. I was very far then from expecting the change you have just informed me of, namely, that four years afterwards, this colossus of power to be overthrown. Then who reigns in France at this moment? Napoleon the Second? No, Louis the Eighteenth. The brother of Louis the Seventeenth? How inscrutable are the ways of Providence! For what great and mysterious purpose has it pleased heaven to abase the man once so elevated, and rise up him who was so abased? Dantes's whole attention was riveted on a man who could thus forget his own misfortunes, while occupying himself with the destinies of others. "'Yes, yes,' continued he, "'twill be the same as it were in England. After Charles I, Cromwell. After Cromwell, Charles II, and then James II, and then some son-in-law or relation, some prince of Orange, a stalled-holder, who becomes a king.' then new concessions to the people, then a constitution, then liberty, 
"'Ah, my friend,' said the abbey, turning towards Dantes, and surveying him with the kindling gaze of a prophet, "'you are young. You will see all this come to pass.' "'Probably, if I ever get out of prison.' "'True,' replied Farrier. "'We are prisoners, but I forget this sometimes, and there are even moments when my mental vision transports me beyond these walls, and I fancy myself at liberty.' "'But wherefore are you here?' "'Because, in 1807, I dreamed of the very plan Napoleon tried to realise in 1811. "'Because, like Machiavelli, I desired to alter the political face of Italy, "'and instead of allowing it to be split up into a quantity of petty principalities, "'each held by some weak or tyrannical ruler, "'I sought to form one large, compact and powerful empire. "'And lastly, because I fancied I had found my Caesar Borgia in a crowned simpleton, who feigned to enter into my views only to betray me. It was the plan of Alexander the Sixth and Clement the Seventh, but it will never succeed now, for they attempted it fruitlessly, and Napoleon was unable to complete his work. Italy seems fated to misfortune, and the old man bowed his head. Dantes could not understand a man risking his life for such matters. Napoleon certainly he knew something of, insomuch as he had seen and spoken with him. But of Clement the Seventh and Alexander the Sixth he knew nothing. "'Are you not?' he asked. "'The priest, who, here in the Chateau d'Elf, is generally thought to be ill?' "'Mad, you mean, don't you?' "'I do not like to say so,' answered Dante, smiling. "'Well, then,' resumed Faria with a bitter smile, let me ask your question in full, by acknowledging that I am the poor mad prisoner of the Chateau d'Ilf, for many years permitted to amuse the different visitors with what is said to be my insanity, and, in all probability, I should be promoted to the honour of making sport for the children, if such innocent beings could be found in an abode devoted like this to suffering and despair. Dantes remained for a short time mute and motionless. At length he said, Then you abandon all hope of escape? I perceive its utter impossibility, and I consider it impious to attempt that which the Almighty evidently does not approve. Nay, be not discouraged. Would it not be expecting too much to hope to succeed at your first attempt? Why not try to find an opening in another direction, from that which has so unfortunately failed? "'Alas, it shows how little notion you can have of all it has cost me "'to effect a purpose so unexpectedly frustrated "'that you talk of beginning over again. "'In the first place, I was four years making the tools I possess, "'and have been two years scraping and digging out earth, "'hard as granite itself. "'Then what toil and fatigue has it not been "'to remove huge stones I should once have deemed impossible to loosen? "'Whole days have I passed in these titanic efforts.' "'Consider my labour well repaid if, by night-time, "'I had contrived to carry away a square inch of this hard-bound cement, "'changed by ages into a substance unyielding as the stones themselves. "'Then, to conceal the mass of earth and rubbish I dug up, "'I was compelled to break through a staircase "'and throw the fruits of my labour into the hollow part of it. "'But this well is now so completely choked up "'that I scarcely think it would be possible to add another handful of dust "'without leading to discovery. "'Consider also that I fully believed "'I had accomplished the end and aim of my undertaking, "'for which I had so exactly husbanded my strength "'as to make it just hold out to the termination of my enterprise. "'And now, at the moment when I reckoned upon success, "'my hopes are forever dashed from me. "'No, I repeat again, "'that nothing shall induce me to renew attempts "'evidently at variance with the Almighty's pleasure.' Dantes held down his head, that the other might not see how joy at the thought of having a companion outweighed the sympathy he felt for the failure of the abbey's plans. The abbey sank upon Edmund's bed, while Edmund himself remained standing. Escape had never once occurred to him. There are indeed some things which appear so impossible that the mind does not dwell on them for an instant. To undermine the ground for fifty feet— to devote three years to a labour which, if successful, 
would conduct you to a precipice overhanging the sea, to plunge into the waves from the height of fifty, sixty, perhaps a hundred feet, at the risk of being dashed to pieces against the rocks, should you have been fortunate enough to have escaped the fire of the sentinels. And even, supposing all these perils passed, then to have to swim for your life at a distance of at least three miles ere you could reach the shore, with difficulties so startling and formidable that Dantes had never even dreamed of such a scheme, resigning himself rather to death. But the sight of an old man clinging to life with so desperate a courage gave a fresh turn to his ideas, and inspired him with new courage. Another, older and less strong than he, had attempted what he had not had sufficient resolution to undertake, and had failed only because of an error in calculation. This same person, with almost incredible patience and perseverance, had contrived to provide himself with tools requisite for so unparalleled an attempt. Another had done all this. Why, then, was it impossible to Dantes? Farrier had dug his way through fifty feet. Dantes would dig a hundred. Farrier, at the age of fifty, had devoted three years to the task. He, who was but half as old, would sacrifice six. Faria, a priest and savant, had not shrunk from the idea of risking his life by trying to swim a distance of three miles to one of the islands, Domer, Retoniu, or Limar. Should a hardy sailor, an experienced diver like himself, shrink from a similar task? Should he, who had so often for mere amusement's sake plunged to the bottom of the sea to fetch up the bright coral branch, hesitate to entertain the same project? He could do it in an hour, and how many times had he, for pure pastime, continued in the water for more than twice as long? At once Dantes resolved to follow the brave example of his energetic companion, and to remember that what has once been done may be done again. After continuing some time in profound meditation, the young man suddenly exclaimed, "'I have found what you are in search of.' Faria started. "'Have you indeed?' cried he, raising his head with quick anxiety. "'Pray let me know what it is you have discovered.' "'The corridor through which you have bored your way from the cell you occupy here "'extends in the same direction as the outer gallery, does it not?' "'It does.' "'And is not above fifteen feet from it?' "'About that.' "'Well, then, I will tell you what we must do. "'We must pierce through the corridor by forming a side opening about the middle, "'as if it were the top part of a cross. "'This time you will lay your plans more accurately. "'We shall get out into the gallery you have described, "'kill the sentinels who guards it, and make our escape. "'All we require to ensure success is courage, and that you possess.' and strength which I am not deficient in. As for patience, you have abundantly proved yours. You shall now see me prove mine. One instant, my dear friend, replied the abbey. It is clear you do not understand the nature of the courage with which I am endowed, and what use I intend making of my strength. As for patience, I consider that I have abundantly exercised that in beginning every morning the task of the night before and every night renewing the task of the day. But then, young man, and I pray of you to give me your full attention, then I thought I could not be doing anything displeasing to the Almighty in trying to set an innocent being at liberty, one who had committed no offence and merited no condemnation. And have your notions changed? asked Dantes with much surprise. Do you think yourself more guilty in making the attempt since you have encountered me? No, neither do I wish to incur guilt. Hitherto I have fancied myself merely waging war against circumstances, not men. I have thought it no sin to bore through a wall or destroy a staircase. But I cannot so easily persuade myself to pierce a heart or take away a life. A slight movement of surprise escaped Dantes. Is it possible, said he, that where your liberty is at stake you can allow any such scruple to deter you from obtaining it? Tell me, replied Farrier, 
"'What has hindered you from knocking down your jailer "'with a piece of wood torn from your bedstead, "'dressing yourselves in his clothes, "'and endeavouring to escape?' "'Simply the fact that the idea never occurred to me,' "'answered Dantes. "'Because,' said the old man, "'the natural repugnance to the commission of such a crime "'prevented you from thinking of it, "'and so it ever is, because, in simple and allowable things, "'our natural instincts keep us from deviating from the strict line of duty. "'The tiger, whose nature teaches him to delight in shedding blood, "'needs but the sense of smell to show him when his prey is within his reach, "'and by following this instinct he is enabled to measure the leap necessary "'to permit him to spring on his victim. "'But man, on the contrary, loathes the idea of blood. "'It is not alone that the laws of social life "'inspire him with the shrinking dread of taking life. "'His natural construction and physiological formation. "'Dantes was confused and silent at this explanation of the thoughts "'which had unconsciously been working in his mind, or rather soul. "'For there are two distinct sorts of ideas, "'those that proceed from the head and those that emanate from the heart. "'Since my imprisonment,' said Farrier. I have thought over all the most celebrated cases of escape on record. They have rarely been successful. Those that have been crowned with full success have been long meditated upon, and carefully arranged. Such, for instance, as the escape of the Duc de Buffont, from the Chateau de Vincennes, that of the Abbe du Bequy, from Fort Levique, of Latude, from the Bastille, then there are those for which chance sometimes affords opportunity, and those are the best of us. Let us, therefore, wait patiently for some favourable moment, and when it presents itself, profit by it. Ah, said Dantes, you might well endure the tedious delay. You were constantly employed in the task you set yourself, and when weary with toil, you had your hopes to refresh and encourage you. "'I assure you,' replied the old man, "'I do not turn to that source for recreation or support. "'What did you do, then? "'I wrote or studied. "'Were you then permitted the use of pens, ink, and paper?' "'Oh, no,' answered the abbey. "'I had none but what I made for myself.' "'You made paper, pens, and ink?' "'Yes.' "'Dantes gazed with admiration.' "'but he had some difficulty in believing. "'Faria saw this. "'When you pay me a visit in my cell, my young friend,' said he, "'I will show you an entire work, "'the fruits of the thoughts and reflections of my whole life, "'many of them meditated over in the shades of the Colosseum at Rome, "'at the foot of St. Mark's Column at Venice, "'and on the borders of the Arno at Florence, "'little imagining at the time that they would be arranged in order.' "'within the walls of the Chateau d'Ilf. "'The work I speak of is called "'A Treatise on the Possibility of a General Monarchy in Italy, "'and will make one large quarto volume. "'And on what have you written all this?' "'On two of my shirts. "'I invented a preparation that makes lines as smooth and easy to write on as parchment. "'You are then a chemist?' "'Somewhat. I know Laviosia. "'and was the intimate friend of Cabanus. "'But for such works you must have needed books. "'Had you any?' "'I had nearly five thousand in my library at Rome, "'but after reading them over many years, "'I found out that with one hundred and fifty well-chosen books, "'a man possesses, if not a complete summary of all human knowledge, "'at least all that a man need really know.' I devoted three years of my life to reading and studying these one hundred and fifty volumes, till I knew them nearly by heart, so that since I have been in prison, a very slight effort of memory has enabled me to recall their contents as readily as though the pages were open before me. I could recite you the whole of Thucydides, Xenophon, Plutarch, Titus Livius, Tacitus, Strada, John Andus, Dante, Montaigne, Shakespeare, Spinoza, Machiavelli, and Bossiet. I name only the most important. 
"'You are doubtless acquainted with a variety of languages, "'so as to be able to read all these?' "'Yes, I speak five of the modern tongues. "'That is to say, German, French, Italian, English, and Spanish. "'By the aid of ancient Greek, I learned modern Greek. "'I don't speak it so well as I could wish, "'but I am still trying to improve myself.' "'Improve yourself?' repeated Dantes. "'Why, how can you manage to do so?' Why, I made a vocabulary of the words I knew, turned, returned, and arranged them, so as to enable me to express my thoughts through their medium. I know nearly one thousand words, which is all that is absolutely necessary, although I believe there are nearly one hundred thousand in the dictionaries. I cannot hope to be very fluent, but I certainly should have no difficulty in explaining my wants and wishes, and that would be quite as much as I should ever require. Stronger grew the wonder of Dantes, who almost fancied he had to do with one gifted with supernatural powers. Still hoping to find some imperfection which might bring him down to a level with human beings, he added, Then, if you were not furnished with pens, how did you manage to write the work which you speak of? I made myself some excellent ones, which would be universally preferred to all others if once known. You are aware what huge whitings are served to us, on meagre days. Well, I selected the cartilages of the heads of these fishes, and you can scarcely imagine the delight with which I welcome the arrival of each Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, as affording me the means of increasing my stock of pens. For I will freely confess that my historical labours have been my greatest solace and relief. While retracing the past, I forget the present, and traversing at will the path of history, I cease to remember that I am myself a prisoner. But the ink, said Dantes, of what do you make your ink? There was formerly a fireplace in my dungeon, replied Faria, but it was closed up long ere I became an occupant of this prison. Still, it must have been many years in use, for it was thickly covered with a coating of soot. This soot I dissolved in a portion of the wine brought to me every Sunday and I assure you a better ink cannot be desired. For very important notes, for which closer attention is required, I pricked one of my fingers, and wrote with my own blood. And when, asked Dantes, may I see all this? Whenever you please, replied the abbey. Oh, then let it be directly, exclaimed the young man. Follow me, then, said the abbey, as he re-entered the subterranean passage, in which he soon disappeared, followed by Dantes. End of chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Vicki Barber, St. John's, Newfoundland, February 2006. THE COUNT OF MONTE CRISTO by Alexandra Dumas CHAPTER Seventeen: THE ABBÉ'S CHAMBER After having passed with tolerable ease through the subterranean passage, which, however, did not admit of their holding themselves erect, the two friends reached the further end of the corridor, into which the abbé's cell opened. From that point the passage became much narrower, and barely permitted one to creep through on hands and knees. The floor of the abbey's cell was paved, and it had been by raising one of the stones in the most obscure corner that Faria had been able to commence the laborious task of which Dante's had witnessed the completion. As he entered the chamber of his friend, Dante's cast around one eager and searching glance in quest of the expected marvels, but nothing more than common met his view. "'It is well,' said the abbey. We have some hours before us. It is now just a quarter past twelve o'clock. Instinctively, Dante's turned round to observe by what watch or clock the abbe had been able so accurately to specify the hour. Look at this ray of light which enters by my window, said the abbe, and then observe the lines traced on the wall. Well, by means of these lines, which are in accordance with the double motion of the earth, and the ellipse it describes round the sun, I am enabled to ascertain the precise hour with more minuteness than if I possessed a watch, 
for that might be broken or deranged in its movements, while the sun and earth never vary in their appointed paths. This last explanation was wholly lost upon Dante's, who had always imagined, from seeing the sun rise from behind the mountains and set in the Mediterranean, that it moved and not the earth. A double movement of the globe he inhabited, and of which he could feel nothing, appeared to him perfectly impossible. Each word that fell from his companion's lips seemed fraught with the mysteries of science, as worthy of digging out as the gold and diamonds in the mines of Guzerat and Golconda, which he could just recollect having visited during a voyage made in his earliest youth. Come, he said to the abbe, I am anxious to see your treasures. The abbe smiled, and proceeding to the disused fireplace, raised, by the help of his chisel, a long stone, which had doubtless been the hearth, beneath which was a cavity of considerable depth, serving as a safe depository of the articles mentioned to Dante's. "'What do you wish to see first? asked the abbe. "'Oh, your great work on the monarchy of Italy!' Feria then drew forth from his hiding-place three or four rolls of linen, laid one over the other, like folds of papyrus. These rolls consisted of slips of cloth, about four inches wide and eighteen long. They were all carefully numbered and closely covered with writing, so legible that Dante's could easily read it, as well as make out the sense, it being an Italian, a language he, as a Provencal, perfectly understood. There, he said, there is the work complete. I wrote the word fini at the end of the sixty-eighth strip about a week ago. I have torn up two of my shirts, and as many handkerchiefs as I was master of, to complete the precious pages. Should I ever get out of prison and find in all Italy a printer courageous enough to publish what I have composed, my literary reputation is forever secured. I see, answered Dante's. Now let me behold the curious pens with which you have written your work. Look, said Faria, showing to the young man a slender stick, about six inches long, and much resembling the size of the handle of a fine painting brush, to the end of which was tied by a piece of thread one of those cartilages of which the abbe had before spoken to Dante's. It was pointed and divided at the nib like an ordinary pen, Dante's examined it with intense admiration, then looked around to see the instrument with which it had been shaped so correctly into form. "'Ah, yes,' said Faria, "'the penknife, that's my masterpiece. I made it, as well as this larger knife, out of an old iron candlestick. The penknife was sharp and keen as a razor. As for the other knife, it would serve a double purpose, and with it one could cut and thrust.' Dantes examined the various articles shown to him with the same attention that he had bestowed on the curiosities and strange tools exhibited in the shops at Marseilles, as the works of the savages in the South Seas from whence they had been brought by the different trading vessels. "'As for the ink,' said Faria, "'I told you how I managed to obtain that, and I only just make it from time to time as I require it.' "'One thing still puzzles me,' observed Dantes. And that is how you manage to do all this by daylight. I worked at night also, replied Faria. Night? Why, for heaven's sake, are your eyes like cats that you can see to work in the dark? Indeed they are not. But God has supplied man with the intelligence that enables him to overcome the limitations of natural conditions. I furnished myself with a light. You did? Pray tell me how. I separated the fat from the meat served to me, melted it, and so made oil. Here is my lamp. So saying, the abbe exhibited a sort of torch very similar to those used in public illuminations. But light? Here are two flints and a piece of burnt linen. And matches? I pretended that I had a disorder of the skin, and asked for a little sulphur, which was readily supplied. Dante's laid the different things he had been looking at on the table, and stood with his head drooping on his breast, as though overwhelmed by the perseverance and strength of Faria's mind. "'You have not seen all yet,' continued Faria, "'for I did not think it wise to trust all my treasures in the same hiding-place. Let us shut this one up.' They put the stone back in its place, 
The abbe sprinkled a little dust over it to conceal the traces of it having been removed, rubbed his foot well on it to make it assume the same appearance as the other, and then, going towards his bed, he removed it from the spot it stood in. Behind the head of the bed, and concealed by a stone fitting in so closely as to defy all suspicion, was a hollow space, and in this space a ladder of cords between twenty-five and thirty feet in length. Dante's closely and eagerly examined it. He found it firm, solid, and compact enough to bear any weight. Who supplied you with the materials for making this wonderful work? I tore up several of my shirts and ripped out the seams in the sheets of my bed during my three years' imprisonment at Fenestrel, and when I was removed to the Chateau d'If, I managed to bring the ravelings with me so that I have been able to finish my work here. And was it not discovered that your sheets were unhemmed? Oh, no, for when I had taken out the thread I required, I hemmed the edges over again. With what? With this needle, said the abbe. As opening his ragged vestments, he showed Dante's a long, sharp fishbone, with a small perforated eye for the thread, a small portion of which still remained in it. I once thought, continued Feria, of removing these iron bars and letting myself down from the window, which, as you see, is somewhat wider than yours, although I should have enlarged it still more preparatory to my flight. However, I discovered that I should merely have dropped into a sort of inner court, and I therefore renounced the project altogether as too full of risk and danger. Nevertheless, I carefully preserved my ladder against one of those unforeseen opportunities of which I just spoke, and which sudden chance frequently brings about. While affecting to be deeply engaged in examining the ladder, the mind of Dante's was in fact busily occupied by the idea that a person so intelligent, ingenious, and clear-sighted as the Abbe might probably be able to solve the dark mystery of his own misfortunes, where he himself could see nothing. "'What are you thinking of?' asked the Abbe, smilingly, inputting the deep abstraction in which his visitor was plunged to the excess of his awe and wonder. "'I was reflecting,' in the first place, replied Dantes, upon the enormous degree of intelligence and ability you must have employed to reach the high perfection to which you have attained. What would you not have accomplished if you had been free? Possibly nothing at all. The overflow of my brain would probably, in a state of freedom, have evaporated in a thousand follies. Misfortune is needed to bring to light the treasures of the human intellect. Compression is needed to explode gone power. Captivity has brought my mental faculties to a focus, and you are well aware that from the collision of clouds, electricity is produced. From electricity, lightning. From lightning, illumination. No, replied Dantes, I know nothing. Some of your words are to me quite empty of meaning. You must be blessed indeed to possess the knowledge you have. The abbe smiled. Well, said he, but you had another subject for your thoughts. Did you not say so just now? I did. You have told me, as yet, but one of them. Let me hear the other. It was this, that while you had related to me all the particulars of your past life, you were perfectly unacquainted with mine. Your life, my young friend, has not been of sufficient length to admit of your having passed through any very important events. It has been long enough to inflict on me a great and undeserved misfortune. I would fain fix the source of it on man, that I may no longer vent reproaches upon heaven. Then you profess ignorance of the crime with which you are charged. I do indeed, and this I swear by the two beings most dear to me upon the earth, my father and Mercedes. Come, said the abbe, closing his hiding place and pushing the bed back to its original situation. Let me hear your story. Dantes obeyed, and commenced what he called his history, but which consisted only of the account of the voyage to India, and two or three voyages to the Levant, until he arrived at the recital of his last cruise, with the death of Captain Leclerc, and the receipt of a packet to be delivered by himself to the Grand Marshal. His interview with that personage, and his receiving, in place of the packet, brought a letter addressed to a Monsieur Nortier, his arrival at Marseilles, 
an interview with his father, his affection for Mercedes in their nuptial feast, his arrest and subsequent examination, his temporary detention at the Palais de Justice, and his final imprisonment in the Chateau d'If. From this point everything was a blank to Dante's. He knew nothing more, not even the length of time he had been imprisoned. His recital finished, the abbe reflected long and earnestly. There is, said he, at the end of his meditations, a clever maxim which bears upon what I was saying to you some little while ago, and that is, that unless wicked ideas take root in a naturally depraved mind, human nature, in a right and wholesome state, revolts at crime. Still, from an artificial civilization have originated wants, vices, and false tastes, which occasionally become so powerful as to stifle within us all good feelings and ultimately to lead us into guilt and wickedness. From this view of things, then, comes the axiom that if you visit to discover the author of any bad action, seek first to discover the person to whom the perpetration of that bad action could be in any way advantageous. Now, to apply it in your case, to whom could your disappearance have been serviceable? To no one by heaven I was a very insignificant person. Do not speak thus, for your reply invinces neither logic nor philosophy. Everything is relative, my dear young friend, from the king who stands in the way of his successor to the employee who keeps his rival out of a place. Now, in the event of the king's death, his successor inherits a crown. When the employee dies, the supernumerary steps into his shoes and receives his salary of twelve thousand livres. Well, these twelve thousand livres are his civil list, and are as essential to him as the twelve millions of a king. Every one, from the highest to the lowest degree, has his place on the social ladder, and is beset by stormy passions and conflicting interests, as in Descartes' theory of pressure and impulsion. But these forces increase as we go higher, so that we have a spiral which in defiance of reason rests upon the apex and not on the base. Now, let us return to your particular world. You say you were on the point of being made captain of the pharaon. Yes. And about to become the husband of a young and lovely girl. Yes. Now, could any one have had any interest in preventing the accomplishment of these two things? But let us first settle the question as to its being the interest of any one to hinder you from being captain of the pharaon. What say you? I cannot believe such was the case. I was generally liked on board, and had the sailors possessed the right of selecting a captain themselves, I feel convinced their choice would have fallen on me. There was only one person among the crew who had any feeling of ill will towards me. I had quarreled with him some time previously, and had even challenged him to fight me, but he refused. Now we are getting on, and what was this man's name? Danglars. What rank did he hold on board? He was supercargo. And had you been captain, should you have retained him in his employment? Not if the choice had remained with me, for I had frequently observed inaccuracies in his accounts. Good again. Now then, tell me, was any person present during your last conversation with Captain Leclerc? No, we were quite alone. Could your conversation have been overheard by anyone? It might, for the cabin door was open, and— Stay, now I recollect. Danglars himself passed by just as Captain Leclerc was giving me the packet for the Grand Marshal. That's better, cried the abbe. Now we are on the right scent. Did you take anybody with you when you put into the port of Elba? Nobody. Somebody there received your packet— and gave you a letter in place of it, I think. Yes, the Grand Marshal did. And what did you do with that letter? Put it into my portfolio. You had your portfolio with you, then. Now, how could a sailor find room in his pocket for a portfolio large enough to contain an official letter? You are right. It was left on board. Then it was not till your return to the ship that you put the letter in the portfolio. No. And what did you do with this same letter while returning from Porto Ferro to the vessel? I carried it in my hand. 
so that when you went on board the Pharaon, everybody could see that you held a letter in your hand? Yes. Danglars as well as the rest? Danglars as well as others. Now listen to me and try to recall every circumstance attending your arrest. Do you recollect the words in which the information against you was formulated? Oh, yes, I read it over three times, and the words sank deeply into my memory. Repeat it to me. Dantes paused a moment, then said, This is it, word for word. The king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and religion that one Edmund Dantes, mate on board the Pharaon, this day arrived from Samira, after having touched at Naples and Porto Fierro, has been entrusted by Murat with a packet for the usurper, again by the usurper, with a letter for the Bonapartist Club in Paris. This proof of his guilt may be procured by his immediate arrest, as the letter will be found either about his person, at his father's residence, or in his cabin on board the Pharaon. The abbe shrugged his shoulders. The thing is clear as day, said he, and you must have had a very confiding nature, as well as a good heart, not to have suspected the origin of the whole affair. Do you really think so? Ah, oh, that would indeed be infamous. How did Danglars usually write? Oh, in a handsome running hand. And how was the anonymous letter written? Backhanded. Again, the abbe smiled. Disguised? It was very boldly written, if disguised. Stop a bit, said the abbe, taking up what he called his pen, and after dipping it into the ink, he wrote on a piece of prepared linen, with his left hand, the first two or three words of the accusation. Dantes drew back and gazed on the abbe with a sensation almost amounting to terror. "'How very astonishing!' cried he at length. "'Why, your writing exactly resembles that of the accusation.' "'Simply because that accusation had been written with the left hand, and I have noticed that—' "'What?' "'That while the writing of different persons done with the right hand varies, that performed with the left hand is invariably uniform.' You have evidently seen and observed everything. Oh, let us proceed. Oh, yes, yes. Now, as regards the second question, I'm listening. Was there any person whose interest it was to prevent your marriage with Mercedes? Yes, a young man who loved her. And his name was? Fernand. That is the Spanish name, I think. He was a Catalan. You imagine him capable of writing the letter? Oh, no. He would more likely have got rid of me by sticking a knife into me. That is in strict accordance with the Spanish character, an assassination they will unhesitatingly commit, but an act of cowardice? Never. Besides, said Dantes, the various circumstances mentioned in the letter were wholly unknown to him. You had never spoken of them yourself to anyone? To no one. Not even to your mistress? No, not even to my betrothed. Then it is Danglars. I feel quite sure of it now. Wait a little. Pray, was Danglars acquainted with Fernand? No. Yes, he was. Now I recollect. What? To have seen them both sitting at table together under an arbor at Père Pamphys the evening before the day fixed for my wedding. They were in earnest conversation. Danglars was joking in a friendly way, but Fernand looked pale and agitated. Were they alone? There was a third person with them whom I knew perfectly well, and who had, in all probability, made their acquaintance. He was a tailor named Caderousse, but he was very drunk. Stay! Stay! How strange that it should not have occurred to me before! Now I remember quite well that on the table round which they were sitting were pens, ink, and paper. "'Oh, the heartless, treacherous scoundrels!' exclaimed Dantes, pressing his hand to his throbbing brows. "'Is there anything else I can assist you in discovering, besides the villainy of your friends?' inquired the abbe with a laugh. "'Yes, yes,' replied Dantes eagerly. "'I would beg of you, who see so completely to the depth of things, and to whom the greatest mystery seems but an easy riddle, to explain to me how it was that I underwent no second examination, was never brought to trial, and above all, was condemned without ever 
having had sentence passed on me. That is altogether a different and more serious matter, responded the abbe. The ways of justice are frequently too dark and mysterious to be easily penetrated. All we have hitherto done in the matter has been child's play. If you wish me to enter upon the more difficult part of the business, you must assist me by the most minute information on every point. Pray ask me whatever questions you please, for in good truth you see more clearly into my life than I do myself. In the first place, then, who examined you? The king's attorney, his deputy, or a magistrate? The deputy. Was he young or old? About six or seven and twenty years of age, I should say. So, answered the abbe, old enough to be ambitious, but too young to be corrupt. And how did he treat you? With more of mildness than severity. Did you tell him your whole story? I did. And did his conduct change at all in the course of your examination? He did appear much disturbed when he read the letter that had brought me into this scrape. He seemed quite overcome by my misfortune. By your misfortune? Yes. Then you feel quite sure that it was your misfortune he deplored. He gave me one great proof of his sympathy at any rate. And that? He burnt the sole evidence that could have at all incriminated me. What? The accusation? No, the letter. Are you sure? I saw it done. That alters the case. This man might, after all, be a greater scoundrel than you have thought possible. Upon my word, said Dantes, you make me shudder. Is the world filled with tigers and crocodiles? Yes, and remember that two-legged tigers and crocodiles are more dangerous than the others. Never mind, let us go on. With all my heart, you tell me he burned the letter? He did, saying at the same time, you see, I thus destroy the only proof existing against you. This action is somewhat too sublime to be natural. You think so? I am sure of it. To whom was this letter addressed? To Monsieur Nortier, number 13, Coq Heron, Paris. Now, can you conceive of any interest that your heroic deputy could possibly have had in the destruction of that letter? Why... It is not altogether impossible. He might have had, for he made me promise several times never to speak of that letter to anyone, assuring me he so advised me for my own interest. And more than this, he insisted on my taking a solemn oath never to utter the name mentioned in the address. Noirtier, repeated the abbe, Noirtier. I knew a person of that name at the Count of the Queen of Etrunia, a Noirtier, who had been a Garondin during the Revolution. What was your deputy called? De Villefort. The abbe burst into a fit of laughter, while Dantes gazed on him in utter astonishment. What ails you? he said at length. Do you see that ray of sunlight? I do. Well, the whole thing is more clear to me than that sunbeam is to you. Poor fellow! You poor young man, and you tell me this magistrate expressed great sympathy and commiseration for you? He did. And the worthy man destroyed your compromising letter? Yes. Why, you poor, short-sighted simpleton, can you not guess who this Noirtier was, whose very name he was so careful to keep concealed? Noirtier was his father. Had a thunderbolt fallen at the feet of Dante's, or a hell opened its yawning gulf before him, he could not have been more completely transfixed with horror than he was at the sound of these unexpected words. Starting up, he clasped his hands around his head as though to prevent his very brain from bursting, and exclaimed, "'His father! His father!' "'Yes, his father,' replied the abbe. His right name was Noir Thierre de Villefort. At this instant a bright light shot through the mind of Dantes, and cleared up all that had been dark and obscure before. The change that had come over Villefort during the examination, the destruction of the letter, the exacted promise, the almost supplicating tones of the magistrate, 
who seemed rather to implore mercy than to pronounce punishment, all returned with a stunning force to his memory. He cried out, and staggered against the wall like a drunken man. Then he hurried to the opening that led from the abbe's cell to his own, and said, I must be alone, to think over all this. When he regained his dungeon, he threw himself on his bed, where the turnkey found him in the evening visit, sitting with fixed gaze and contracted features, dumb and motionless as a statue. During these hours of profound meditation, which to him had seemed only minutes, he had formed a fearful resolution, and bound himself to its fulfillment by a solemn oath. Dante's was at length roused from his reverie by the voice of Faria, who, having also been visited by his jailer, had come to invite his fellow sufferer to share his supper. The reputation of being out of his mind, though harmlessly, and even amusingly so, had procured for the abbe unusual privileges. He was supplied with bread of a finer, whiter quality than the usual prison fare, and even regaled each Sunday with a small quantity of wine. Now this was a Sunday, and the abbe had come to ask his young companion to share the luxuries with him. Dante's followed. His features were no longer contracted, and now wore their usual expression. But there was that in his whole appearance that bespoke one who had come to a fixed and desperate resolve. Faria bent on him his penetrating eye. "'I regret now,' said he, "'having helped you in your late inquiries, "'or having given you the information I did.' "'Why so?' inquired Dantes. "'Because it has instilled a new passion in your heart, "'that of vengeance.' Dantes smiled. "'Let us talk of something else,' said he. "'Again the abbe looked at him, "'then mournfully shook his head, "'but in an accordance with Dante's request, he began to speak of other matters. The elder prisoner was one of those persons whose conversation, like that of all who have experienced many trials, contained many useful and important hints, as well as sound information. But it was never egotistical, for the unfortunate man never alluded to his own sorrows. Dante's listened with admiring attention to all he said. Some of his remarks corresponded with what he already knew or applied to the sort of knowledge his nautical life had enabled him to acquire. A part of the good abbe's words, however, were wholly incomprehensible to him. But, like the aurora which guides the navigator in northern latitudes, opened new vistas to the inquiring mind of the listener, and gave fantastic glimpses of new horizons, enabling him, justly, to estimate the delight an intellectual mind would have in following one so richly gifted as Faria along the heights of truth, where he was so much at home. "'You must teach me a small part of what you know,' said Dantes, "'if only to prevent your growing weary of me. I can well believe that so learned a person as yourself would prefer absolute solitude to being tormented with the company of one as ignorant and uninformed as myself.' If you will only agree to my request, I promise you never to mention another word about escaping. The abbe smiled. Alas, my boy, said he, human knowledge is confined within very narrow limits, and when I have taught you mathematics, physics, history, and the three or four modern languages with which I am acquainted, you will know as much as I do myself. Now, it will scarcely require two years for me to communicate to you the stock of learning I possess. Two years? exclaimed Dantes. Do you really believe I can acquire all these things in so short a time? Not their application, certainly, but their principles, you may. To learn is not to know. There are the learners and the learned. Memory makes the one, philosophy the other. But cannot one learn philosophy? Philosophy cannot be taught. It is the application of the sciences to truth. It is like the golden cloud in which the Messiah went up to heaven. Well, then, said Dantes, what shall you teach me first? I am in a hurry to begin. I want to learn. Everything, said the abbe. And that very evening the prisoner sketched a plan of education to be entered upon the following day. Dantes possessed a prestigious memory, combined with an astonishing quickness and readiness of conception. The mathematical turn of his mind rendered him apt at all kinds of calculation. 
while his naturally poetical feelings throw a light and pleasing veil over the dry reality of arithmetical computation or the rigid severity of geometry. He already knew Italian, and had also picked up a little of the romantic dialect during voyages to the East, and by the aid of these two languages he easily comprehended the construction of all the others, so that at the end of six months he began to speak Spanish, English, and German. In strict accordance with the promise made to the abbe, Dantes spoke no more of escape. Perhaps the delight his studies afforded him left no room for such thoughts. Perhaps the recollection that he had pledged his word, on which his sense of honor was keen, kept him from referring in any way to the possibilities of flight. Days, even months, passed by unheeded in one rapid and instructive course. At the end of a year, Dante's was a new man. Dante's observed, however, that Feria, in spite of the relief his society afforded, daily grew sadder. One thought seemed incessantly to harass and distract his mind. Sometimes he would fall into long reveries, sigh heavily and involuntarily, then suddenly rise, and with folded arms, began pacing the confined space of his dungeon. One day he stopped all at once and exclaimed, Oh, if there were no sentinel! There shall not be one a minute longer than you please, said Dantes, who had followed the workings of his thoughts as accurately as though his brain were enclosed in crystal, so clear as to display its minutest operation. I have already told you, answered the abbe, that I loathe the idea of shedding blood, and yet the murder, if you choose to call it so, would be simply a measure of self-preservation. No matter, I could never agree to it. Still, you have thought of it. Incessantly, alas, cried the abbe, and you have discovered a means of regaining our freedom, have you not? asked Dantes eagerly. I have. If it were only possible to place a deaf and blind sentinel in the gallery beyond us. He shall be both blind and deaf, replied the young man, with an air of determination that made his companion shudder. No, no, cried the abbe. Impossible. Dante's endeavored to renew the subject. The abbe shook his head in token of disapproval and refused to make any further response. Three months passed away. Are you strong? the abbe asked one day of Dante's. The young man, in reply, took up the chisel, bent it into the form of a horseshoe, and then as readily straightened it. And will you engage not to do any harm to the sentry, except as a last resort? I promise on my honor. Then, said the abbe, we may hope to put our design into execution. And how long shall we be in accomplishing the necessary work? At least a year. And shall we begin at once? At once. We have lost a year to no purpose, cried Dante's. Do you consider the last twelve months to have been wasted? asked the abbe. Forgive me, cried Edmund, blushing deeply. Tut, tut, answered the abbe. Man is but man after all, and you are about the best specimen of the genus I have ever known. Come, let me show you my plan. The abbe then showed Dante's the sketch he had made for their escape. It consisted of a plan of his own cell and that of Dante's with the passage which united them. In this passage he proposed to drive a level, as they do in mines. This level would bring the two prisoners immediately beneath the gallery, where the sentry kept watch. Once there, a large excavation would be made, and one of the flagstones with which the gallery was paved be so completely loosened that at the desired moment it would give way beneath the feet of the soldier, who, stunned by his fall, would be immediately bound and gagged by Dante's, before he had power to offer any resistance. The prisoners were then to make their way through one of the gallery windows, and to let themselves down from the outer walls by means of the abbe's ladder of cords. Dante's eyes sparkled with joy, and he rubbed his hands with delight at the idea of a plan so simple, yet apparently so certain to succeed. That very day the miners began their labors, with a vigor and altruity proportionate to their long rest from fatigue and their hopes of ultimate success. 
Nothing interrupted the progress of the work, except the necessity that each was under of returning to his cell in anticipation of the turnkey's visit. They had learned to distinguish the almost imperceptible sound of his footsteps as he descended towards their dungeons, and happily never failed of being prepared for his coming. The fresh earth excavated during their present work, and which would have entirely blocked up the old passage, was thrown, by degrees and with the utmost precaution, out of the window, in either Faria's or Dante's cell, the rubbish being first pulverized so finely that the night wind carried it far away without permitting the smallest trace to remain. More than a year had been consumed in this undertaking, the only tools for which had been a chisel, a knife, and a wooden lever. Faria still continuing to instruct Dante's by conversing with him, sometimes in one language, sometimes in another, at others, relating to him the history of nations and great men who from time to time have risen to fame and trodden the path of glory. The abbe was a man of the world, and had moreover mixed in the first society of the day. He wore an air of melancholy dignity, which Dante's, thanks to the imitative powers bestowed on him by nature, easily acquired, as well as that outward polish and politeness he had before been wanting in, and which is seldom possessed except by those who have been placed in constant intercourse with persons of high birth and breeding. At the end of fifteen months the level was finished, and the excavation completed beneath the gallery and the two workmen could distinctly hear the measured tread of the sentinel as he paced to and fro over their heads. Compelled as they were to await a night sufficiently dark to favor their flight, they were obliged to defer their final attempt till that auspicious moment should arrive. Their greatest dread now was lest the stone through which the sentry was doomed to fall should give way before its right time and this they had in some measure provided against by propping it up with a small beam which they had discovered in the walls through which they had worked their way. Dante's was occupied in arranging this piece of wood when he heard Faria, who had remained in Edmund's cell for the purpose of cutting a peg to secure their rope ladder, call to him in a tone indicative of great suffering. Dante's hastened to his dungeon, where he found him standing in the middle of the room pale as death, his forehead streaming with perspiration, and his hands clenched tightly together. "'Gracious heavens!' exclaimed Dante. "'What is the matter? What has happened?' "'Quick, quick,' returned the abbe. "'Listen to what I have to say.' Dante's looked in fear, and wonder at the livid countenance of Faria, whose eyes, already dull and sunken, were surrounded by purple circles." while his lips were white as those of a corpse, and his very hair seemed to stand on end. "'Tell me, I beseech you, what ails you?' cried Dante's, letting his chisel fall to the floor. "'Alas!' faltered out the abbe. "'All is over with me. I am seized with a terrible, perhaps mortal, illness. I can feel that the paroxysm is fast approaching.' I had a similar attack the year previous to my imprisonment. This malady admits but of one remedy. I will tell you what that is. Go into my cell as quickly as you can. Draw out one of the feet that support the bed. You will find it has been hollowed out for the purpose of containing a small phial. You will see they're half filled with a red-looking fluid. Bring it to me. Or rather, no, no. I may be found here, therefore— Help me back to my room while I have the strength to drag myself along. Who knows what may happen, or how long the attack may last. In spite of the magnitude of the misfortune which thus suddenly frustrated his hopes, Dante's did not lose his presence of mind, but descended into the passage, dragging his unfortunate companion with him. Then, half carrying, half supporting him, he managed to reach the abbe's chamber, when he immediately laid the sufferer on his bed. "'Thanks,' said the poor abbe, shivering as though his veins were filled with ice. "'I am about to be seized with a feat of catalepsy. When it comes to its height, I shall probably lie still and motionless, as though dead, uttering neither sigh nor groan. On the other hand, the symptoms may be much more violent, and cause me to fall into fearful convulsions, foam at the mouth, and cry out loudly.' 
Take care my cries are not heard, for if they are, it is more than probable I should be removed to another part of the prison, and we be separated for ever. When I become quite motionless, cold, and rigid as a corpse, then, and not before, be careful about this, force open my teeth with a knife, pour from eight to ten drops of the liquor contained in the phial down my throat, and I may perhaps revive. Perhaps, exclaimed Dante's in grief-stricken tones. Help, help, cried the abbe. I, I, die. So sudden and violent was the fit that the unfortunate prisoner was unable to complete the sentence. A violent convulsion shook his whole frame. His eyes stared from their sockets, his mouth was drawn on one side, his cheeks became purple. He struggled, foamed, dashed himself about, and uttered the most dreadful cries, which, however, Dante's prevented from being heard by covering his head with the blanket. The fit lasted two hours. Then, more helpless than an infant, and colder and paler than marble, more crushed and broken than a reed trampled underfoot, he fell back, doubled up in one last convulsion, and became as rigid as a corpse. Edmund waited till life seemed extinct in the body of his friend. Then, taking up a knife, he with difficulty forced open the closely fixed jaws, carefully administered the appointed number of drops, and anxiously awaited the result. An hour passed away, and the old man gave no sign of returning animation. Dante's began to fear he had delayed too long ere he administered the remedy, and thrusting his hands into his hair, continued gazing on the lifeless features of his friend. At length a slight color tinged the livid cheeks. Consciousness returned to the dull open eyeballs. A faint sigh issued from the lips and the sufferer made a feeble effort to move. "'He is saved! He is saved!' cried Dante's in a paroxysm of delight. The sick man was not yet able to speak, but he pointed with evident anxiety towards the door. Dante's listened, and plainly distinguished the approaching steps of the jailer. It was therefore near seven o'clock, but Edmund's anxiety had put all thoughts of time out of his head. The young man sprang to the entrance, darted through it, carefully drawing the stone over the opening, and hurried to his cell. He had scarcely done so before the door opened, and the jailer saw the prisoner seated as usual on the side of his bed. Almost before the key had turned in the lock, and before the departing steps of the jailer had died away in the long corridor he had to traverse, Dante's, whose restless anxiety concerning his friend left him no desire to touch the food brought him, hurried back to the abbe's chamber and raising the stone by pressing his head against it, was soon beside the sick man's couch. Faria had now fully regained his consciousness, but he still lay helpless and exhausted. "'I did not expect to see you again,' he said feebly to Dante's. "'And why not?' asked the young man. "'Did you fancy yourself dying?' "'No, I had no such idea. But knowing that all was ready for flight, I thought you might have made your escape.' The deep glow of indignation suffused the cheeks of Dante's. "'Without you? Did you really think me capable of that?' "'At least,' said the abbe, "'I now see how wrong such an opinion would have been. "'Alas, alas, I am fearfully exhausted and debilitated by this attack.' "'Be of good cheer,' replied Dante's. "'Your strength will return.' And as he spoke, he seated himself near the bed besides Faria and took his hands. The abbe shook his head. "'The last attack I had,' said he, "'lasted but half an hour, and after it I was hungry, and got up without help. Now I can move neither my right arm nor leg, and my head seems uncomfortable, which shows that there has been a suffusion of blood on the brain. The third attack will either carry me off or leave me paralyzed for life.' "'No!' cried Dantes. "'You are mistaken.' You will not die, and your third attack, if indeed you should have another, will find you at liberty. We shall save you another time, as we have done this, only with a better chance of success, because we shall be able to command every requisite assistance. My good Edmund, answered the abbe, be not deceived. The attack, 
which has just passed away, condemns me for ever to the walls of a prison. None can fly from a dungeon who cannot walk. Well, we will wait. A week, a month, two months, if need be. And meanwhile, your strength will return. Everything is in readiness for our flight, and we can select any time we choose. As soon as you feel able to swim, we will go. I shall never swim again, replied Faria. This arm is paralyzed, not for a time, but for ever. Lift it, and judge if I am mistaken. The young man raised the arm, which fell back by its own weight, perfectly inanimate and helpless. A sigh escaped him. "'You are convinced now, Edmund, are you not?' asked the abbe. "'Depend upon it. I know what I say. Since the first attack I experienced of this malady, I have continually reflected on it. Indeed, I expected it, for it is a family inheritance. Both my father and grandfather died of it in a third attack. The physician who prepared for me the remedy I have twice successfully taken was no other than the celebrated Cabanus and he predicted a similar end for me. "'The physician may be mistaken,' exclaimed Dantes. "'And as for your poor arm, what difference will that make? I can take you on my shoulders and swim for both of us.' "'My son,' said the abbe, "'you who are a sailor and a swimmer must know as well as I do that a man so loaded would sink before he had done fifty strokes.' Cease, then, to allow yourself to be duped by vain hopes that even your own excellent heart refuses to believe in. Here I shall remain till the hour of my deliverance arrives, and that, in all human probability, will be the hour of my death. As for you, who are young and active, delay not on my account, but fly, go. I give you back your promise. It is well, said Dante's. Then I shall also remain. Then, rising and extending his hand with an air of solemnity over the old man's head, he slowly added, By the blood of Christ, I swear never to leave you while you live. Faria gazed fondly on his noble-minded, single-hearted, high-principled young friend, and read in his countenance ample confirmation of the sincerity of his devotion and the loyalty of his purpose. "'Thanks,' murmured the invalid, extending one hand. "'I accept. "'You may one of these days reap the reward of your disinterested devotion, "'but as I cannot, and you will not, quit this place, "'it becomes necessary to fill up the excavation beneath the soldier's gallery. "'He might, by chance, hear the hollow sound of his footsteps "'and call the attention of his officer to the circumstance.' That would bring about a discovery which would inevitably lead to our being separated. Go, then, and set about this work, in which, unhappily, I can offer you no assistance. Keep at it all night, if necessary, and do not return here to-morrow, till after the jailer has visited me. I shall have something of the greatest importance to communicate to you. Dantes took the hand of the abbe in his, and affectionately pressed it. Faria smiled encouragingly on him, and the young man retired to his task, in the spirit of obedience and respect which he had sworn to show towards his aged friend. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Count of Monte Cristo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 18 The Treasure. When Dantes returned next morning to the chamber of his companion in captivity, he found Faria seated and looking composed. In the ray of light which entered by the narrow window of his cell, he held open in his left hand, of which alone it will be recollected he retained the use, a sheet of paper which, from being constantly rolled into a small compass, had the form of a cylinder, and was not easily kept open. He did not speak, but showed the paper to Dantes. 
"'What is that?' he inquired. "'Look at it,' said the abbe, with a smile. "'I have looked at it with all possible attention,' said Dantes, "'and I only see a half-burnt paper, "'on which are traces of Gothic characters "'inscribed with a peculiar kind of ink.' "'This paper, my friend,' said Faria, "'I may now avow to you, since I have the proof of your fidelity. "'This paper is my treasure, of which, from this day forth, one half belongs to you.' "'The sweat started forth on Dante's brow. "'Until this day, and for how long a time, "'he had refrained from talking of the treasure, "'which had brought upon the abbe the accusation of madness.' With his instinctive delicacy, Edmond had preferred avoiding any touch on this painful cord, and Faria had been equally silent. He had taken the silence of the old man for a return to reason, and now these few words uttered by Faria, after so painful a crisis, seemed to indicate a serious relapse into mental alienation. "'Your treasure?' stammered Dantes. Faria smiled. "'Yes,' said he. You have indeed a noble nature, Edmond, and I see by your paleness and agitation what is passing in your heart at this moment. No, be assured, I am not mad. This treasure exists, Dantes, and if I have not been allowed to possess it, you will. Yes, you. No one would listen or believe me, because everyone thought me mad. But you, who must know that I am not, listen to me, and believe me so afterwards, if you will. Alas, murmured Edmund to himself, this is a terrible relapse. There was only this blow wanting. Then he said aloud, My dear friend, your attack has perhaps fatigued you. Had you not better repose a while? Tomorrow, if you will, I will hear your narrative, but today I wish to nurse you carefully. Besides, he said, a treasure is not a thing we need hurry about. On the contrary, it is a matter of the utmost importance, Edmond replied the old man. Who knows if to-morrow or the next day after the third attack may not come on, and then must not all be over? Yes, indeed, I have often thought with a bitter joy that these riches, which would make the wealth of a dozen families, will be for ever lost to those men who persecute me. This idea was one of vengeance to me, and I tasted it slowly, in the night of my dungeon and the despair of my captivity. But now— I have forgiven the world for the love of you, now that I see you young and with a promising future, now that I think of all that may result to you in the good fortune of such a disclosure. I shudder at any delay, and tremble lest I should not assure to one, as worthy as yourself, the possession of so vast an amount of hidden wealth. Edmond turned away his head with a sigh. "'You persist in your incredulity, Edmond,' continued Faria. My words have not convinced you. I see you require proofs. Well, then, read this paper, which I have never shown to any one. Tomorrow, my dear friend, said Edmond, desirous of not yielding to the old man's madness, I thought it was understood that we should not talk of that until tomorrow. Then we will not talk of it until tomorrow, but read this paper today. I will not irritate him thought Edmund, and taking the paper, of which half was wanting, having been burnt, no doubt, by a, some accident, he read, This treasure, which may amount to two, of Roman crowns in the most distant A, of the second opening, declared to belong to him a low heir, 25th April, 1490. Well, said Faria, when the young man had finished reading it, why replied dantes i see nothing but broken lines and unconnected words which are rendered eligible by fire yes to you my friend who read them for the first time but not for me who have grown pale over them by many nights study and have reconstructed every phrase completed every thought and do you believe you have discovered the hidden meaning i am sure i have and you shall judge for yourself but first listen to the history of this paper Silence! exclaimed Dantes. Steps approach. I go. Adieu. And Dantes, happy to escape the history and explanation which would be sure to confirm his belief in his friend's mental instability, glided like a snake along the narrow passage while Faria, restored by his alarm into a certain amount of activity, 
pushed the stone into place with his foot and covered it with a mat in order the more effectually to avoid discovery. It was the governor who, hearing of Faria's illness from the jailer, had come in person to see him. Faria sat up to receive him, avoiding all gestures in order that he might conceal from the governor the paralysis that had already half-stricken him with death. His fear was lest the governor, touched with pity, might order him to be removed to better quarters and thus separate him from his young companion. But fortunately this was not the case, and the governor left him convinced that the poor madman, for whom in his heart he felt a kind of affection, was only troubled with a slight indisposition. During this time Edmond, seated on his bed with his head in his hands, tried to collect his scattered thoughts. Faria, since their first acquaintance, had been on all points so rational and logical, so wonderfully sagacious, in fact, that he could not understand how so much wisdom on all points could be allied with madness. Was Faria deceived as to his treasure, or was all the world deceived as to Faria? Dantes remained in his cell all day, not daring to return to his friend, thinking thus to death for the moment when he should be convinced once for all that the abbey was mad. Such a conviction would be so terrible. But, towards the evening, after the hour for the customary visit had gone by, Faria, not seeing the young men appear, tried to move and get over the distance which separated them. Edmond shuddered when he heard the painful efforts which the old man made to drag himself along. His leg was inert, and he could no longer make use of one arm. Edmond was obliged to assist him, for otherwise he would not have been able to enter by the small aperture which led to Dantes's chamber. "'Here I am, pursuing you remorselessly,' he said, with a benignant smile. "'You thought to escape my munificence, but it is in vain. Listen to me.' Edmond saw there was no escape, and placing the old man on his bed, he seated himself on the stool beside him. "'You know,' said the abbe, "'that I was the secretary and intimate friend of Cardinal Spada, the last of the princes of that name. I owe to this worthy lord all the happiness I ever knew.' He was not rich, although the wealth of his family had passed into a proverb, and I heard the phrase very often, as rich as a spada. But he, like public rumor, lived on this reputation for wealth. His palace was my paradise. I was tutor to his nephews, who are dead, and when he was alone in the world, I tried by absolute devotion to his will to make up to him all he had done for me during ten years of unremitting kindness. The cardinal's house had no secrets for me. I had often seen my noble patron annotating ancient volumes and eagerly searching amongst dusty family manuscripts. One day, when I was reproaching him for his unavailing searches and deploring the prostration of mind that followed them, he looked at me and, smiling bitterly, opened a volume relating to the history of the city of Rome. There, in the twentieth chapter of the life of Pope Alexander the Sixth, were the following lines which I can never forget. The great wars of Romagna had ended. Cesar Borgia, who had completed his conquest, had need of money to purchase all Italy. The Pope had also need of money to bring matters to an end with Louis the Twelfth. King of France was formidable, still in spite of his recent reverses, and it was necessary, therefore, to have recourse to some profitable scheme, which was a matter of great difficulty in the impoverished condition of exhausted Italy. His Holiness had an idea. He determined to make two cardinals. By choosing two of the greatest personages of Rome, especially rich men, this was the return the Holy Father looked for. In the first place he could sell the great appointments and splendid offices which the cardinals already held, and then he had the two hats to sell besides. There was a third point in view, which will appear hereafter. The Pope and Cesar Borgia first found the two future cardinals. They were Giovanni Rospigliosi, who held four of the highest dignities of the Holy See, and Cesar Spada. One of the noblest and richest of the Roman nobility, both felt the high honor of such a favor from the Pope. They were ambitious, and Cesar Borgia soon found purchasers for their appointments. The result was that Rospigliosi and Spada paid for being cardinals, and eight other persons paid for the offices the cardinals held before their elevation, and thus eight hundred thousand crowns entered into the coffers of the speculators. 
It is time now to proceed to the last part of the speculation. The Pope heaped attentions upon Respigliosi and Spada, conferred upon them the insignia of the cardinalate, and induced them to arrange their affairs and take up their residence at Rome. Then the Pope and Cesar Borgia invited the two cardinals to dinner. This was a matter of dispute between the Holy Father and his son. Cesar thought they could make use of one of the means which he always had ready for his friends, that is to say, in the first place, the famous key which was given to certain persons with the request that they go and open a designated cupboard. This key was furnished with a small iron point, a negligence on the part of the locksmith. When this was pressed to effect the opening of the cupboard, of which the lock was difficult, the person was pricked by this small point and died next day. Then there was the rich king with the lion's head which Cesar wore when he wanted to greet his friends with a clasp of the hand. The lion bit the hand thus favored, and at the end of twenty-four hours the bite was mortal. Cesar proposed to his father that they should either ask the cardinals to open the cupboard or shake hands with them, but Alexander the Sixth replied, Now as to the worthy cardinals, Spada and Respigliosi, let us ask both of them to dinner. Something tells me that we shall get that money back. Besides, you forgot, Cesar, an indigestion declares itself immediately, while a prick or a bite occasions a delay of a day or two. Cesar gave way before such cogent reasoning, and the cardinals were consequently invited to dinner. The table was laid in a vineyard belonging to the Pope, near San Pierdarena, a charming retreat which the cardinals knew very well by report. Ros Pigliosi, quite set up with his new dignities, went with a good appetite in his most ingratiating manner. Spada, a prudent man, and greatly attached to his only nephew, a young captain of the highest promise, took paper and pen, and made his will. He then sent word to his nephew to wait for him near the vineyard, but it appeared the servant did not find him. Spada knew what these invitations meant, since Christianity, so eminently civilizing, had made progress in Rome. It was no longer a centurion who came from the tyrant with a message, Cesar wills that you die. But it was a legate, a latere, who came with a smile on his lips to say from the Pope, His Holiness requests you to dine with him. Spada set out about two o'clock to San Pier d'Arena. The Pope awaited him. The first sight that attracted the eyes of Spada was that of his nephew in full costume, and Cesar Borgia paying him most marked attentions. Spada turned pale, as Cesar looked at him with an ironical air which proved that he had anticipated all, and that the snare was well spread. They began dinner, and Spada was only able to inquire of his nephew if he had received his message. The nephew replied no, perfectly comprehending the meaning of the question. It was too late for he had already drunk a glass of excellent wine placed for him expressly by the Pope's butler. Spada at the same moment saw another bottle approach him which he was pressed to taste. An hour afterwards a physician declared they were both poisoned through eating mushrooms. Spada died on the threshold of the vineyard. The nephew expired at his own door, making signs which his wife could not comprehend. Then Cesar and the Pope hastened to lay hands on the heritage under presence of seeking for the papers of the dead man. But the inheritance consisted in this only, a scrap of paper on which Spada had written, I bequeath to my beloved nephew, my coffers, my books, and amongst others, my breviary with the gold corners which I beg he will preserve in remembrance of his affectionate uncle. The heir sought everywhere, admired the breviary, laid hands on the furniture, and were greatly astonished that Spada, the rich man, was really the most miserable of uncles, no treasures, unless they were those of science, contained in the library and laboratories. That was all. Cesar and his father searched, examined, scrutinized, but found nothing, or at least very little, not exceeding a few thousand crowns in plate, and about the same in ready money, but the nephew had time to say to his wife before he expired, Look well among my uncle's papers, there is a will. They sought even more thoroughly than the august heirs had done, but it was fruitless. There were two palaces and a vineyard behind the Palatine Hill, but in these days landed property had not much value, and the two palaces and the vineyard remained to the family since they were beneath the rapacity of the Pope and his son. Months and years rolled on. Alexander the Sixth died, poisoned, 
you know by what mistake. Cesar, poisoned at the same time, escaped by shedding his skin like a snake, but the new skin was spotted by the poison till it looked like a tiger's. Then, compelled to quit Rome, he went and got himself obscurely killed in a night skirmish, scarcely noticed in history. After the Pope's death and his son's exile, it was supposed that the Spada family would resume the splendid position they had held before the Cardinal's time, but this was not the case. The Spadas remained in doubtful ease, a mystery hung over this dark affair, and the public rumor was that Cesar, a better politician than his father, had carried off from the Pope the fortune of the two cardinals. I say the two, because Cardinal Rospigliosi, who had not taken any precaution, was completely despoiled. Up to this, said Faria, interrupting the thread of his narrative, this seems to you very meaningless, no doubt, eh? Oh, my friend! cried Dantes. On the contrary, it seems as if I were reading a most interesting narrative. Go on, I beg of you. I will. The family began to get accustomed to their obscurity. Years rolled on, and amongst the descendants some were soldiers, others diplomatists, some churchmen, some bankers. Some grew rich, and some were ruined. I come now to the last of the family whose secretary I was, the Count of Spada. I had often heard him complain of the disproportion of his rank with his fortune, and I advised him to invest all he had in an annuity. He did so, and thus doubled his income. The celebrated breviary remained in the family, and was in the Count's possession. It had been handed down from father to son, for the singular clause of the only will that had been found had caused it to be regarded as a genuine relic, preserved in the family with superstitious veneration. It was an illuminated book, with beautiful Gothic characters, and so weighty with gold, that a servant always carried it before the cardinal on days of great solemnity. At the sight of papers of all sorts, titles, contracts, parchments, which were kept in the archives of the family, all descending from the poisoned cardinal, I in my turn examined the immense bundles of documents like twenty servitors, stewards, secretaries before me but in spite of the most exhaustive researches I found nothing. Yet I had read, I had even written a precise history of the Borgia family, for the sole purpose of assuring myself whether any increase of fortune had occurred to them on the death of the Cardinal Cesar Spada, but could only trace the acquisition of the property of the Cardinal Rospigliosi, his companion in misfortune. I was then almost assured that the inheritance had neither profited the Borgias nor the family, but had remained unpossessed like the treasures of the Arabian Nights, which slept in the bosom of the earth under the eyes of the genie. I searched, ransacked, counted, calculated a thousand and a thousand times the income and expenditure of the family for three hundred years. It was useless. I remained in my ignorance and the Count of Spada in his poverty. My patron died. He had reserved from his annuity his family papers, his library composed of five thousand volumes, and his famous breviary. All these he bequeathed to me with a thousand Roman crowns, which he had in ready money, on condition that I would have anniversary masses said for the repose of his soul, and that I would draw up a genealogical tree and history of his house. All this I did scrupulously. Be easy, my dear Edmond, we are near the conclusion." In 1807, a month before I was arrested, and a fortnight after the death of the Count of Spada, on the 25th of December, you will see presently how the date became fixed in my memory. I was reading for the thousandth time the papers I was arranging, for the palace was sold to a stranger, and I was going to leave Rome and settle at Florence, intending to take with me twelve thousand francs I possessed, my library and the famous breviary, when— Tired with my constant labor at the same thing, and overcome by a heavy dinner I had eaten, my head dropped on my hands, and I fell asleep about three o'clock in the afternoon. I awoke as the clock was striking six. I raised my head. I was in utter darkness. I rang for a light, but as no one came, I determined to find one for myself. It was indeed, but anticipating the simple manners which I should soon be under the necessity of adopting. I took a wax candle in one hand, and with the other groped about for a piece of paper, my matchbox being empty, with which I proposed to get a light from the small flame still playing on the embers. 
Fearing, however, to make use of any valuable piece of paper, I hesitated for a moment, then recollected that I had seen in the famous breviary, which was on the table beside me, an old paper, quite yellow with age, and which had served as a marker for centuries, kept there by the request of the heirs. I felt for it, found it, twisted it up together, and putting it on to the expiring flame, set light to it. But beneath my fingers, as if by magic, in proportion as the fire ascended, I saw yellowish characters appear on the paper. I grasped it in my hand, put out the flame as quickly as I could, lighted my taper in the fire itself, and opened the crumpled paper with inexpressible emotion, recognizing, when I had done so, that these characters had been traced in mysterious and sympathetic ink, only appearing when exposed to the fire. Nearly one-third of the paper had been consumed by the flame. It was that paper you read this morning. Read it again, Dantes, and then I will complete for you the incomplete words and unconnected sense. Faria, with an air of triumph, offered the paper to Dantes, who this time read the following words, traced with an ink of a reddish color resembling rust. This twenty-fifth day of April, 1498, B. Alexander the Sixth, and fearing that not... He may desire to become my heir, and re, and Bentivoglio, who were poisoned, my sole heir that I have bu, and has visited with me that is in Island of Monte Cristo all I possess, jewels, diamonds, gems that I alone may amount to nearly two mil, will find on raising the twentieth row, creek to the east in a right line, to open. In these caves, the treasure is in the furthest A, which treasure I bequeath and leave N, as my sole heir, 25th April, 1498, says. And now, said the abbe, read this other paper. And he presented to Dantes a second leaf with fragments of lines written on it, which Edmund read as follows. Ing invited to dine by his holiness, content with making me pay for my hat, serves for me the fate of Cardinals Caprara, I declare to my nephew Guido Spada, read in a place he knows, the caves of the small, est of ingots gold money, know of the existence of this treasure, which, lions of Roman crowns, and which he, ick from the small, Ings have been made, Engeld in the second, tire to him, our spada. Faria followed him with an excited look, and now, he said, when he saw that Dantes had read the last line, put the two fragments together and judge for yourself. Dantes obeyed, and the conjointed pieces gave the following. This twenty-fifth day of April, 1498, being invited to dine by his holiness alexander the sixth and fearing that not content with making me pay for my hat he may desire to become my heir and re serves for me the fate of cardinals caprara and bentivoglio who were poisoned i declare to my nephew guido spada my sole heir that i have buried in a place he knows and has visited with me that is in the caves of the small island of Monte Cristo, all I possessed, of ingots, gold, money, jewels, diamonds, gems, that I alone know of the existence of this treasure, which may amount to nearly two millions of Roman crowns, and which he will find on raising the twentieth rock from the small creek to the east in a right line. Two openings have been made in these caves. The treasure is in the furthest angle in the second, which treasure I bequeath and leave entire to him as my sole heir. 25th April, 1498. Cesar Spada. Well, do you comprehend now? inquired Faria. It is the declaration of Cardinal Spada and the will so long sought for replied Edmond, still incredulous. Yes, a thousand times, yes. And who completed it as it now is? I did. Aided by the remaining fragment, I guessed the rest, measuring the length of the lines by those of the paper, and divining the hidden meaning by means of what was in part revealed, 
as we are guided in a cavern, by the small ray of light above us. And what did you do when you arrived at this conclusion? I resolved to set out, and did set out at that very instant, carrying with me the beginning of my great work, the unity of the Italian kingdom, but for some time the imperial police, who at this period, quite contrary to what Napoleon desired so soon as he had a son born to him, wished for a partition of provinces, had their eyes on me and my hasty departure, the cause of which they were unable to guess, having aroused their suspicions. I was arrested at the very moment I was leaving Piombino. Now, continued Faria, addressing Dantes with an almost paternal expression, now, my dear fellow, you know as much as I do myself. If we ever escape together, half this treasure is yours. If I die here and you escape alone, the whole belongs to you. But, inquired Dantes, hesitating, has this treasure no more legitimate possessor in the world than ourselves? No, no, be easy on that score. The family is extinct. The last Count of Spada, moreover, made me his heir, bequeathing to me this symbolic breviary. He bequeathed to me all it contained. No, no, make your mind satisfied on that point. If we lay hands on this fortune, we may enjoy it without remorse. And you say this treasure amounts to two millions of Roman crowns, nearly thirteen millions of our money, two million six hundred thousand in eighteen ninety four. Impossible, said Dante, staggered at the enormous amount. Impossible, and why? asked the old man. The Spada family was one of the oldest and most powerful families of the fifteenth century, and in those times when other opportunities for investment were wanting, such accumulations of golden jewels were by no means rare. There are at this day Roman families perishing of hunger, though possessed of nearly a million in diamonds and jewels handed down by entail, and which they cannot touch. Edmund thought he was in a dream. He wavered between incredulity and joy. "'I have only kept this secret so long from you,' continued Faria, "'that I might test your character, and then surprise you. Had we escaped before my attack of catalepsy, I should have conducted you to Monte Cristo. Now,' he added with a sigh, "'it is you who will conduct me thither. Well, Dantes, you do not thank me?' This treasure belongs to you, my dear friend, replied Dantes, and to you only. I have no right to it. I am no relation of yours. You are my son, Dantes, exclaimed the old man. You are the child of my captivity. My profession condemns me to celibacy. God has sent you to me to console, at one and the same time, the man who could not be a father, and the prisoner who could not get free and Faria extended the arm, of which alone the use remained to him, to the young man who threw himself upon his neck and wept. End of chapter 18 The Treasure This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas Chapter 19 The Third Attack Now that this treasure, which had so long been the object of the Abbe's meditations, could ensure the future happiness of him whom Faria really loved as a son, it had doubled its value in his eyes, and every day he expatiated on the amount, explaining to Dantes all the good which, with thirteen or fourteen millions of francs, a man could do in these days to his friends. And then Dante's countenance became gloomy, for the oath of vengeance he had taken recurred to his memory, and he reflected how much ill in these times a man with thirteen or fourteen millions could do to his enemies. The abbe did not know the island of Monte Cristo, but Dantes knew it, and had often passed it, situated twenty-five miles from Pianosa, between Corsica and the island of Elba, and had once touched there. This island was, always had been, and still is, completely deserted. It is a rock of almost conical form, which looks as though it had been thrust up by volcanic force from the depth to the surface of the ocean. Dantes drew a plan of the island for Faria, and Faria gave Dantes advice as to the means he should employ to recover the treasure. 
But Dantes was far from being as enthusiastic and confident as the old man. It was past a question now that Faria was not a lunatic, and the way in which he had achieved the discovery, which had given rise to the suspicion of his madness, increased Edmond's admiration of him. But at the same time, Dantes could not believe that the deposit, supposing it had ever existed, still existed, and though he considered the treasure as by no means chimerical, he yet believed it was no longer there. However, as if fate resolved on depriving the prisoners of their last chance, and making them understand that they were condemned to perpetual imprisonment, a new misfortune befell them. The gallery on the sea side, which had long been in ruins, was rebuilt. They had repaired it completely, and stopped up with vast masses of stone the hole Dantes had partly filled in. But for this precaution, which it will be remembered the abbe had made to Edmond, the misfortune would have been still greater, for their attempt to escape would have been detected, and they would undoubtedly have been separated. Thus a new, a stronger, and more inexorable barrier was interposed to cut off the realization of their hopes. "'You see,' said the young man, with an air of sorrowful resignation to Faria, "'that God deems it right to take from me any claim to merit for what you call my devotion to you. I have promised to remain forever with you, and now I could not break my promise if I would. The treasure will be no more mine than yours, and neither of us will quit this prison. But my real treasure is not that, my dear friend, which awaits me beneath the sombre rocks of Monte Cristo. It is your presence, our living together five or six hours a day, in spite of our jailers. It is the rays of intelligence you have elicited from my brain, the languages you have implanted in my memory, and which have taken root there with all their philological ramifications. These different sciences that you have made so easy to me by the depth of the knowledge you possess of them, and the clearness of the principles to which you have reduced them. This is my treasure, my beloved friend, and with this you have made me rich and happy. Believe me, and take comfort. This is better for me than tons of gold and cases of diamonds, even were they not as problematical as the clouds we see in the morning floating over the sea, which we take for terra firma, and which evaporate and vanish as we draw near to them. To have you as long as possible near me, to hear your eloquent speech, which embellishes my mind, strengthens my soul, and makes my whole frame capable of great and terrible things. If I should ever be free, so fills my whole existence that the despair to which I was just on the point of yielding when I knew you has no longer any hold over me, and this, this my fortune, not chimerical but actual, I owe you my real good, my present happiness, and all the sovereigns of the earth, even Caesar Borgia himself, could not deprive me of this. Thus, if not actually happy, yet the days these two unfortunates passed together went quickly. Faria, who for so long a time had kept silence as to the treasure, now perpetually talked of it. As he had prophesied would be the case, he remained paralyzed in the right arm and the left leg, and had given up all hope of ever enjoying it himself. But he was continually thinking over some means of escape for his young companion, and anticipating the pleasure he would enjoy. For fear the letter might be some day lost or stolen, he compelled Dantes to learn it by heart, and Dantes knew it, from the first to the last word. Then he destroyed the second portion assured that if the first were seized, no one would be able to discover its real meaning. Whole hours sometimes passed while Faria was giving instructions to Dantes, instructions which were to serve him when he was at liberty. Then, once free, from the day and hour and moment he was so, he could have but one only thought, which was to gain Monte Cristo by some means and remain there alone under some pretext which would arouse no suspicions and once there, to endeavor to find the wonderful caverns, and search in the appointed spot, the appointed spot, be it remembered, being the farthest angle in the second opening. In the meanwhile, the hours passed, if not rapidly, at least tolerably. Faria, as we have said, without having recovered the use of his hand and foot, had regained all the clearness of his understanding, and had gradually, besides the moral instructions we have detailed, taught his youthful companion the patient and sublime duty of a prisoner, who learns to make something from nothing. They were thus perpetually employed, Faria, that he might not see himself grow old, Dantes, for fear of recalling the almost extinct past 
which now only floated in his memory like a distant light wandering in the night. So life went on for them as it does for those who are not victims of misfortune, and whose activities glide along mechanically and tranquilly beneath the eye of providence. But beneath this superficial calm there were in the heart of the young man, and perhaps in that of the old man, many repressed desires, many stifled sighs, which found vent when Faria was left alone, and when Edmond returned to his cell. One night Edmond awoke suddenly, believing that he heard some one calling him. He opened his eyes upon utter darkness. His name, or rather a plaintive voice, which essayed to pronounce his name, reached him. He sat up in bed, and a cold sweat broke out upon his brow. Undoubtedly the call came from Faria's dungeon. Alas, murmured Edmond, can it be? He moved his bed, drew up the stone, rushed into the passage, and reached the opposite extremity. The secret entrance was open. By the light of the wretched and wavering lamp, of which we have spoken, Dantes saw the old man, pale, but yet erect, clinging to the bedstead. His features were writhing with those horrible symptoms which he already knew and which had so seriously alarmed him when he saw them for the first time. "'Alas, my dear friend,' said Faria, in a resigned tone, "'you understand, do you not? And I need not attempt to explain to you.' Edmond uttered a cry of agony, and quite out of his senses rushed towards the door, exclaiming, "'Help! Help!' Faria had just sufficient strength to restrain him. "'Silence!' he said, "'or you are lost. We must now only think of you, my dear friend and so act as to render your captivity supportable, or your flight possible. It would require years to do again what I have done here, and the results would be instantly destroyed if our jailers knew we had communicated with each other. Besides, be assured, my dear Edmond, the dungeon I am about to leave will not long remain empty. Some other unfortunate being will soon take my place, and to him you will appear like an angel of salvation. Perhaps. He will be young, strong, and enduring like yourself, and will aid you in your escape, while I have been but a hindrance. You will no longer have half a dead body tied to you as a drag to all your movements. At length Providence has done something for you. He restores to you more than he takes away, and it was time I should die." Edmond could only clasp his hands and exclaim, "'Oh, my friend, my friend, speak not thus! and then resuming all his presence of mind, which had for a moment staggered under this blow, and his strength, which had failed at the words of the old man, he said, "'Oh, I have saved you once, and I will save you a second time.' And raising the foot of the bed, he drew out the phial, still a third filled with the red liquor. "'See!' he exclaimed. "'There remains still some of the magic draught. Quick, quick! Tell me what I must do this time. Are there fresh instructions? Speak, my friend, I listen.' "'There is not a hope.' replied Faria, shaking his head. But no matter. God wills it that man whom he has created, and in whose heart he has so profoundly rooted the love of life, should do all in his power to preserve that existence, which, however painful it may be, is yet always so dear. Oh, yes, yes, exclaimed Dantes, and I tell you that I will save you yet. Well, then, try. The cold gains upon me. I feel the blood flowing towards my brain. These horrible chills, which make my teeth chatter and seem to dislocate my bones, begin to pervade my whole frame. In five minutes the malady will reach its height, and in a quarter of an hour there will be nothing left of me but a corpse." "'Oh!' exclaimed Dantes, his heart wrung with anguish. "'Do as you did before, only do not wait so long. All the springs of life are now exhausted in me. And death,' he continued, looking at his paralyzed arm and leg has but half its work to do. If, after having made me swallow twelve drops instead of ten, you see that I do not recover, then pour the rest down my throat. Now, lift me on my bed, for I can no longer support myself." Edmond took the old man in his arms and laid him on the bed. "'And now, my dear friend,' said Faria, "'sole consolation of my wretched existence, you whom heaven gave me somewhat late, but still gave me, a priceless gift, and for which I am most grateful. At the moment of separating from you forever, I wish you all the happiness and all the prosperity you so well deserve. My son, I bless thee." The young man cast himself on his knees, leaning his head against the old man's bed. Listen now to what I say in this my dying moment. The treasure of the spadas exists. 
God grants me the boon of vision unrestricted by time or space. I see it in the depths of the inner cavern. My eyes pierce the inmost recesses of the earth and are dazzled at the sight of so much riches. If you do escape, remember that the poor Ave, whom all the world called mad, was not so. Hasten to Monte Cristo. Avail yourself of the fortune, for you have indeed suffered long enough. A violent convulsion attacked the old man. Dantes raised his head and saw Faria's eyes injected with blood. It seemed as if a flow of blood had ascended from the chest to the head. I do, I do, murmured the old man, clasping Edmond's hand convulsively. I do. Oh, no, no, not yet, he cried. Do not forsake me. Oh, succor him. Help, help, help. Hush, hush, murmured the dying man. That they may not separate us if you save me. You are right. Oh, yes, yes, be assured I shall save you. Besides, although you suffer much, you do not seem to be in such agony as you were before. Do not mistake. I suffer less, because there is in me less strength to endure. At your age, we have faith in life. It is the privilege of youth to believe and hope, but old men see death more clearly. Oh, tis here, tis here, tis over, my sight is gone, my senses fail. Your hand, Dantes. Adieu, adieu. And raising himself by a final effort, in which he summoned all of his faculties, he said, Monte Cristo, forget not Monte Cristo and fell back on the bed. The crisis was terrible, and a rigid form with twisted limbs, swollen eyelids, and lips flecked with bloody foam lay on the bed of torture, in place of the intellectual being who so lately rested there. Dantes took the lamp, placed it on a projecting stone above the bed, whence its tremulous light fell with strange and fantastic ray on the distorted countenance and motionless, stiffened body. With steady gaze he awaited confidently the moment for administering the restorative. When he believed that the right moment had arrived, he took the knife, pried open the teeth, which offered less resistance than before, counted one after the other twelve drops, and watched. The file contained perhaps twice as much more. He waited ten minutes. A quarter of an hour. Half an hour. No change took place. Trembling, his hair erect, his brow bathed with perspiration, he counted the seconds by the beating of his heart. Then he thought it was time to make the last trial, and he put the file to the purple lips of Faria, and without having occasion to force open his jaws, which had remained extended, he poured the whole of the liquid down his throat. The draught produced a galvanic effect. A violent trembling pervaded the old man's limbs. His eyes opened until it was fearful to gaze upon them. He heaved a sigh which resembled a shriek and then his convulsed body returned gradually to its former immobility, the eyes remaining open. Half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half elapsed, and during this period of anguish Edmond leaned over his friend, his hand applied to his heart, and felt the body gradually grow cold, and the heart's pulsation become more and more deep and dull, until at length it stopped. The last movement of the heart ceased. The face became livid. The eyes remained open, but the eyeballs were glazed. It was six o'clock in the morning. The dawn was just breaking, and its feeble ray came into the dungeon and paled the ineffectual light of the lamp. Strange shadows passed over the countenance of the dead man, and at times gave it the appearance of life. While the struggle between day and night lasted, Dantes still doubted, but as soon as the daylight gained the preeminence, he saw that he was alone with a corpse. Then an invincible and extreme terror seized upon him, and he dared not again press the hand that hung out of bed. He dared no longer to gaze on those fixed and vacant eyes, which he tried many times to close, but in vain. They opened again as soon as shut. He extinguished the lamp, carefully concealed it, and then went away closing as well as he could the entrance to the secret passage by the large stone as he descended. It was time, for the jailer was coming. On this occasion he began his round at Dantes' cell, and on leaving him he went on to Faria's dungeon, taking thither breakfast and some linen. Nothing betokened that the man know anything of what had occurred. He went on his way. Dantes was then seized with an indescribable desire to know what was going on in the dungeon of his unfortunate friend. 
He therefore returned by the subterraneous gallery, and arrived in time to hear the exclamations of the turnkey, who called out for help. Other turnkeys came, and then was heard the regular tramp of soldiers. Last of all came the governor. Edmond heard the creaking of the bed as they moved the corpse, heard the voice of the governor, who asked them to throw water on the dead man's face, and seeing that, in spite of this application, the prisoner did not recover, they sent for the doctor. The governor then went out, and words of pity fell on Dante's listening ears, mingled with brutal laughter. "'Well, well,' said the one, "'the madman has gone to look after his treasure. Good journey to him.' "'With all his millions he will not have enough to pay for his shroud,' said another. "'Oh,' added a third voice, "'the shrouds of Chateau d'If are not dear.' "'Perhaps,' said one of the previous speakers, "'as he was a churchman, they may go to some expense on his behalf. "'They may give him the honours of the sack.' "'Edmund did not lose a word, but comprehended very little of what was said. "'The voices soon ceased, and it seemed to him as if every one had left the cell. "'Still, he dared not to enter.' as they might have left some turnkey to watch the dead. He remained, therefore, mute and motionless, hardly venturing to breathe. At the end of an hour he heard a faint noise, which increased. It was the governor who returned, followed by the doctor and other attendants. There was a moment's silence. It was evident that the doctor was examining the dead body. The inquiries soon commenced. The doctor analyzed the symptoms of the malady to which the prisoner had succumbed, and declared that he was dead. Questions and answers followed in a nonchalant manner that made Dantes indignant, for he felt that all the world should have for the poor Abbe a love and respect equal to his own. "'I am very sorry for what you tell me,' said the governor, replying to the assurance of the doctor, "'that the old man is really dead, for he was a quiet, inoffensive prisoner, happy in his folly, and required no watching.' "'Ah,' added the turnkey, "'there was no occasion for watching him.' He would have stayed here fifty years, I'll answer for it, without any attempt to escape. Still, said the governor, I believe it would be requisite, notwithstanding your certainty, and not that I doubt your science, but in discharge of my official duty, that we should be perfectly assured that the prisoner is dead. There was a moment of complete silence, during which Dantes, still listening, knew that the doctor was examining the corpse a second time. You may make your mind easy, said the doctor. He is dead. I will answer for that. "'You know, sir,' said the governor, persisting, "'that we are not content in such cases as this "'with such a simple examination. "'In spite of all appearances, be so kind, therefore, "'as to finish your duty by fulfilling the formalities described by law.' "'Let the irons be heated,' said the doctor. "'But really it is a useless precaution.' "'This order to heat the irons made Dantes shudder. "'He heard hasty steps, the creaking of a door, "'people going and coming, and some minutes afterwards he entered, saying, "'Here's a brazier, lighted.' There was a moment's silence, and then was heard the crackling of burning flesh, of which the peculiar and nauseous smell penetrated even behind the wall where Dantes was listening in horror. The perspiration poured forth upon the young man's brow, and he felt as if he should faint. "'You see, sir, he really is dead,' said the doctor. "'This burn in the heel is decisive. The poor fool is cured of his folly.' and delivered from his captivity. "'Wasn't his name Faria?' inquired one of the officers who accompanied the governor. "'Yes, sir. And, as he said, it was an ancient name. He was, too, very learned, and rational enough on all points which did not relate to his treasure. But on that, indeed, he was intractable.' "'It is a sort of malady which we call monomania,' said the doctor. "'You never had anything to complain of,' said the governor to the jailer who had charge of the abbe. "'Never, sir,' replied the jailer. Never. On the contrary, he sometimes amused me very much by telling me stories. One day, too, when my wife was ill, he gave me a prescription which cured her. Ah, ah, said the doctor, I did not know that I had a rival. But I hope, Governor, that you will show him all proper respect. Yes, yes, make your mind easy. He shall be decently interred in the newest sack we can find. Will that satisfy you? Must this last formality take place in your presence, sir? inquired a turnkey. Certainly, but make haste. I cannot stay here all day. Other footsteps, going and coming, were now heard, and a moment afterwards the noise of rustling canvas reached Dante's ears. The bed creaked, and the heavy footfall of a man who lifts a weight sounded on the floor. 
Then the bed again creaked under the weight deposited upon it. "'This evening,' said the governor. "'Will there be any mass?' asked one of the attendants. "'That is impossible,' replied the governor. "'The chaplain of the chateau came to me yesterday to beg for leave of absence, in order to take a trip to Jerez for a week. I told him I would attend to the prisoners in his absence. If the poor Ave had not been in such a hurry, he might have had his requiem.' "'Poh, poh,' said the doctor, with the impiety usual in persons of his profession. "'He is a churchman. God will respect his profession, and not give the devil the wicked delight of sending him to a priest.' A shout of laughter followed this brutal jest. Meanwhile, the operation of putting the body in the sack was going on. "'This evening,' said the governor, when the task was ended. "'At what hour?' inquired the turnkey. "'Why, about ten or eleven o'clock. "'Shall we watch by the corpse?' Of what use would it be? Shut the dungeon as if he were alive, that is all. Then the steps retreated, and the voices died away in the distance. The noise of the door, with its creaking hinges and bolts, ceased, and a silence more somber than that of solitude ensued, the silence of death, which was all pervasive and struck its icy chill to the very soul of Dantes. Then he raised the flagstone cautiously with his head, and looked carefully around the chamber. It was empty, and Dantes emerged from the tunnel. End of chapter 19「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma, greenkri.com The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 20 The Cemetery of Chateau d'If On the bed, at full length, and faintly illuminated by the pale light that came from the window, lay a sack of canvas, and under its rude folds was stretched a long and stiffened form. It was Faria's last winding-sheet, a winding-sheet which, as the turnkey said, cost so little. Everything was in readiness. A barrier had been placed between Dantes and his old friend. No longer could Edmund look into those wide-opened eyes which had seemed to be penetrating the mysteries of death. No longer could he clasp the hand which had done so much to make his existence blessed. Faria, the beneficent and cheerful companion, with whom he was accustomed to live so intimately, no longer breathed. He seated himself on the edge of that terrible bed, and fell into melancholy and gloomy reverie. Alone! He was alone again! Again condemned to silence! Again face to face with nothingness! Alone! Never again to see the face! never again to hear the voice of the only human being who united him to earth. Was not Faria's fate the better, after all, to solve the problem of life at its source, even at the risk of horrible suffering? The idea of suicide, which his friend had driven away and kept away by his cheerful presence, now hovered like a phantom over the abbey's dead body. "'If I could die,' he said, I should go where he goes, and should assuredly find him again. But how to die! It is very easy," he went on with a smile. I will remain here, rush on the first person that opens the door, strangle him, and then they will guillotine me. But excessive grief is like a storm at sea, where the frail bark is tossed from the depths to the top of the wave. Dantes recoiled from the idea of so infamous a death, and passed suddenly from despair to an ardent desire for life and liberty. "'Die? Oh, no!' he exclaimed. "'Not die now, after having lived and suffered so long and so much. "'Die? Yes. Had I died years ago. "'But now to die would be, indeed, to give away to the sarcasm of destiny. "'No, I want to live. I shall struggle to the very last.' I will yet win back the happiness of which I have been deprived. Before I die, 
I must not forget that I have my executioners to punish, and perhaps, too, who knows, some friends to reward. Yet they will forget me here, and I shall die in my dungeon like Faria. As he said this, he became silent, and gazed straight before him like one overwhelmed with a strange and amazing thought. Suddenly he arose, lifted his hand to his brow as if his brain were giddy, paced twice or thrice round the dungeon, and then paused abruptly by the bed. "'Just God!' he muttered. "'Whence comes this thought? Is it from thee? Since none but the dead pass freely from this dungeon, let me take the place of the dead.' Without giving himself time to reconsider his decision, and, indeed, that he might not allow his thoughts to be distracted from his desperate resolution, he bent over the appalling shroud, opened it with the knife which Faria had made, drew the corpse from the sack, and bore it along the tunnel to his own chamber, laid it on his couch, tied around its head the rag he wore at night around his own, covered it with his counterpane, once again kissed the ice-cold brow, and tried vainly to close the resisting eyes, which glared horribly, turned the head towards the wall, so that the jailer might, when he brought the evening meal, believe that he was asleep, as was his frequent custom. Entered the tunnel again, drew the bed against the wall, returned to the other cell, took from the hiding-place the needle and thread, flung off his rags that they might feel only naked flesh beneath the coarse canvas, and, getting inside the sack, placed himself in the posture in which the dead body had been laid, and sewed up the mouth of the sack from the inside. He would have been discovered by the beating of his heart, if by any mischance the jailers had entered at that moment. Dantes might have waited until the evening visit was over, but he was afraid that the governor would change his mind, and order the dead body to be removed earlier. In that case his last hope would have been destroyed. Now his plans were fully made, and this is what he intended to do. If, while he was being carried out, the gravediggers should discover that they were bearing a live instead of a dead body, Dantes did not intend to give them time to recognize him, but with a sudden cut of the knife he meant to open the sack from top to bottom, and, profiting by their alarm, escape. If they tried to catch him, he would use his knife to better purpose. If they took him to the cemetery and laid him in a grave, he would allow himself to be covered with earth, and then, as it was night, the gravediggers could scarcely have turned their backs before he would have worked his way through the yielding soil and escaped. He hoped that the weight of the earth would not be so great that he could not overcome it. If he was detected in this and the earth proved too heavy, he would be stifled, and then, so much the better, all would be over. Dantes had not eaten since the preceding evening but he had not thought of hunger, nor did he think of it now. His situation was too precarious to allow him even time to reflect on any thought but one. The first risk that Dantes ran was that the jailer, when he brought him his supper at seven o'clock, might perceive the change that had been made. Fortunately, twenty times at least from misanthropy or fatigue, Dantes had received his jailer in bed, and then the man placed his bread and soup on the table and went away without saying a word. This time the jailer might not be as silent as usual, but speak to Dantes, and seeing that he received no reply, go to the bed and thus discover all. When seven o'clock came, Dantes' agony really began. His hand, placed upon his heart, was unable to redress its throbbings, while with the other he wiped the perspiration from his temples. From time to time, Chills ran through his whole body, and clutched his heart in a grasp of ice. Then he thought he was going to die. Yet the hours passed on without any unusual disturbance, and Dantes knew that he had escaped the first peril. It was a good augury. At length, about the hour the governor had appointed, footsteps were heard on the stairs. Edmund felt that the moment had arrived, summoned up all his courage, held his breath, and would have been happy if at the same time he could have repressed the throbbing in his veins. The footsteps, they were double, paused at the door, and Dantes guessed that the two gravediggers had come to seek him, 
This idea was soon converted into certainty, when he heard the noise they made in putting down the hand-beer. The door opened, and a dim light reached Dantes's eyes through the coarse sack that covered him. He saw two shadows approach his bed, a third remaining at the door with the torch in its hand. The two men, approaching the ends of the bed, took the sack by its extremities. "'He's heavy, though, for an old man,' said one, as he raised the head. "'They say every year adds half a pound to the weight of bones,' added another, lifting the feet. "'Have you tied the knot?' inquired the first speaker. "'What would be the use of carrying so much more weight?' was the reply. "'I can do that when we get there.' "'Yes, you're right,' replied the companion. "'What's the knot for?' thought Dantes. They deposited the supposed corpse on the bier. Edmund stiffened himself in order to play the part of a dead man, and then the party, lighted by the man with the torch who went first, ascended the stairs. Suddenly he felt the fresh and sharp night air, and Dantes knew that the mistral was blowing. It was a sensation in which pleasure and pain were strangely mingled. The bearers went on for twenty paces, then stopped, putting the bier down on the ground. One of them went away, and Dantes heard his shoes striking on the Where pavement. "'Where am I?' he asked himself. "'Really, he is by no means a light load,' said the other bearer, sitting on the edge of the hand-barrow. Dantes's first impulse was to escape, but fortunately he did not attempt it. "'Give us a light,' said the other bearer, "'or I shall never find what I am looking for.' The man with a torch complied, although not asked in the most polite terms. "'What can he be looking for?' thought Edmund. "'The spade, perhaps.' An exclamation of satisfaction indicated that the gravedigger had found the object of his search. "'Here it is at last,' he said. "'Not without some trouble, though.' "'Yes,' was the answer. "'But it has lost nothing by waiting.' As he said this, the man came towards Edmund, who heard a heavy metallic substance laid down beside him, and at the same moment a cord was fastened round his feet, with sudden and painful violence. "'Well, have you tied the knot?' inquired the gravedigger, who was looking on. "'Yes, and pretty tight, too, I can tell you,' was the answer. "'Move on, then,' and the bier was lifted once more, and they proceeded. They advanced fifty paces farther, and then stopped to open a door, then went forward again. The noise of the waves dashing against the rocks on which the chateau was built reached Dantes's ear distinctly as they went forward. "'Bad weather,' observed one of the bearers. "'Not a pleasant night for a dip in the sea.' "'Why, yes, the abbey runs a chance of being wet,' said the other. And then there was a burst of brutal laughter. Dantes did not comprehend the jest, but his hair stood erect on his head. "'Well, here we are at last,' said one of them. "'A little farther, a little farther.' said the other. You know very well that the last was stopped on his way, dashed on the rocks, and the governor told us next day that we were careless fellows. They ascended five or six more steps, and then Dantes felt that they took him, one by the head and the other by the heels, and swung him to and fro. One, said the gravers, two, three. At the same instant Dantes felt himself flung into the air like a wounded bird, falling, falling with a rapidity that made his blood curdle. Although drawn downwards by the heavy weight which hastened his rapid descent, it seemed to him as if the fall lasted for a century. At last, with a horrible splash, he darted like an arrow into the ice-cold water, and as he did so he uttered a shrill cry, stifled in a moment by his immersion beneath the waves. Dantes had been flung into the sea, and was dragged to its depths by a thirty-six-pound shot tied to his feet. The sea is the cemetery of the Chateau d'If. End of chapter 20。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lemoyne. Green, K -R -I, dot com. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter twenty one The Island of Tiboulin. 
Dantes, although stunned and almost suffocated, had sufficient presence of mind to hold his breath, and as his right hand, prepared as he was for every chance, held his knife open, he rapidly ripped up the sack, extricated his arm, and then his body. But in spite of all his efforts to free himself from the shot, he felt it dragging him down still lower. He then bent his body, and by a desperate effort severed the cord that bound his legs, at the moment when it seemed as if he were actually strangled. With a mighty leap he rose to the surface of the sea, while the shot dragged down to the depths the sack that had so nearly become his shroud. Dantes waited only to get breath, and then dived in order to avoid being seen. When he arose a second time, he was fifty paces from where he had first sunk. He saw overhead a black and tempestuous sky, across which the wind was driving clouds that occasionally suffered a twinkling star to appear. Before him was the vast expanse of waters, somber and terrible, whose waves foamed and roared, as if before the approach of a storm. Behind him, blacker than the sea, blacker than the sky, rose, phantom-like, the vast stone structure, whose projecting crags seemed like arms extended to seize their prey, and on the highest rock was a torch lighting two figures. He fancied that these two forms were looking at the sea. Doubtless these strange grave-diggers had heard his cry. Dantes dived again, and remained a long time beneath the water. This was an easy feat to him, for he usually attracted a crowd of spectators in the bay before the lighthouse at Marseilles when he swam there, and was unanimously declared to be the best swimmer in the port. When he came up again the light had disappeared. He must now get his bearings. Ratonneau and Pomègue are the nearest islands of all those that surround the Chateau d'If, but Ratonneau and Pomègue are inhabited, as is also the islet of Daum. Tiboulin and Le Maire were therefore the safest for Dantes's adventure. The island of Tiboulin and Le Maire are a league from the Chateau d'If. Dantes, nevertheless, determined to make for them. But how could he find his way in the darkness of the night? At this moment he saw the light of Planier, gleaming in front of him like a star. By leaving this light on the right, he kept the island of Tiboulin a little on the left. By turning to the left, therefore, he would find it. But, as we have said, it was at least a league from the Chateau d'If to this island. Often in prison Faria had said to him, when he saw him idle and inactive, Dantes, you must not give way to this listlessness. You will be drowned if you seek to escape, and your strength has not been properly exercised and prepared for exertion. These words rang in Dantes's ears, even beneath the waves. He hastened to cleave his way through them, to see if he had not lost his strength. He found with pleasure that his captivity had taken away nothing of his power and he was still master of that element on whose bosom he had so often sported as a boy. Fear, that relentless pursuer, clogged Dantes's efforts. He listened for any sound that might be audible, and every time that he rose to the top of a wave he scanned the horizon, and strove to penetrate the darkness. He fancied that every wave behind him was a pursuing boat, and he redoubled his exertions, increasing rapidly his distance from the chateau, but exhausting his strength. He swam on still, and already the terrible chateau had disappeared in the darkness. He could not see it, but he felt its presence. An hour passed, during which Dantes, excited by the feeling of freedom, continued to cleave the waves. Let us see said he, I have swum about an hour, but as the wind is against me, that has retarded my speed. However, if I am not mistaken, I must be close to Tiboulin. But what if I were mistaken? A shudder passed over him. He sought to tread water in order to rest himself, but the sea was too violent, and he felt that he could not make use of this means of recuperation. Well, said he, I will swim on until I am worn out or the cramp seizes me, and then I shall sink, and he struck out with energy or despair. Suddenly the sky seemed to him to become still darker, 
and more dense, and heavy clouds seemed to sweep down towards him. At the same time he felt a sharp pain in his knee. He fancied for a moment that he had been shot, and listened for the report. But he heard nothing. Then he put out his hand and encountered an obstacle, and with another stroke knew that he had gained the shore. Before him rose a grotesque mass of rocks that resembled nothing so much as a vast fire petrified at the moment of its most fervent combustion. It was the island of Tiboulin. Dantes rose, advanced a few steps, and with a fervent prayer of gratitude stretched himself on the granite, which seemed to him softer than down. Then, in spite of the wind and rain, he fell into the deep, sweet sleep of utter exhaustion. At the expiration of an hour Edmund was awakened by the roar of thunder. The tempest was let loose and beating the atmosphere with its mighty wings. From time to time a flash of lightning stretched across the heavens like a fiery serpent, lighting up the clouds that rolled on in vast chaotic waves. Dantes had not been deceived. He had reached the first of the two islands, which was, in fact, Tiboulin. He knew that it was barren and without shelter, but when the sea became more calm, he resolved to plunge into its waves again, and swim to La Mer, equally arid but larger, and consequently better adapted for concealment. An overhanging rock offered him a temporary shelter, and scarcely had he availed himself of it when the tempest burst forth in all its fury. Edmund felt the trembling of the rock beneath which he lay. The waves, dashing themselves against it, wetted him with their spray. He was safely sheltered, and yet he felt dizzy in the midst of the warring of the elements and the dazzling brightness of the lightning. It seemed to him that the island trembled to its base, and that it would, like a vessel at anchor, break moorings and bear him off into the center of the storm. He then recollected that he had not eaten or drunk for four and twenty hours. He extended his hands and drank greedily of the rainwater that had lodged in a hollow of the rock. As he rose, a flash of lightning that seemed to rive the remotest heights of heaven illumined the darkness. By its light, between the island of Le Mer and Cape Croisel, a quarter of a league distant, Dantes saw a fishing boat driven rapidly like a spectre before the power of winds and waves. A second after he saw it again, approaching with frightful rapidity. Dantes cried at the top of his voice to warn them of their danger, but they saw it themselves. Another flash showed him four men clinging to the shattered mast and the rigging, while a fifth clung to the broken rudder. The men he beheld saw him undoubtedly, for their cries were carried to his ears by the wind. Above the splintered mast a sail, rent to tatters, was waving. Suddenly the ropes that still held it gave way, and it disappeared in the darkness of the night, like a vast sea-bird. At the same moment a violent crash was heard, and cries of distress. Dantes, from his rocky perch, saw the shattered vessel, and among the fragments the floating forms of the hapless sailors. Then all was dark again. Dantes ran down the rocks at the risk of being himself dashed to pieces. He listened, he groped about, but he heard and saw nothing. The cries had ceased and the tempest continued to rage. By degrees the wind abated. Vast gray clouds rolled towards the west, and the blue firmament appeared studded with bright stars. Soon a red streak became visible in the horizon. The waves widened. A light played over them, and gilded their foaming crests with gold. It was day. Dantes stood mute and motionless before this majestic spectacle, as if he now beheld it for the first time. And indeed, since his captivity in the Chateau d'If, he had forgotten that such scenes were ever to be witnessed. He turned toward the fortress, and looked at both sea and land. The gloomy building rose from the bosom of the ocean, with imposing majesty, and seemed to dominate the scene. It was about five o'clock. The sea continued to get calmer. In two or three hours, thought Tantes, the turnkey will enter my chamber, find the body of my poor friend, recognize it, 
seek for me in vain and give the alarm. Then the tunnel will be discovered. The men who cast me into the sea, and who must have heard the cry I uttered, will be questioned. The boats filled with armed soldiers will pursue the wretched fugitive. The cannon will warn every one to refuse shelter to a man wandering about naked and famished. The police of Marseilles will be on the alert by land, whilst the governor pursues me by sea. I am cold. I am hungry. I have lost even the knife that saved me. Oh, my God, I have suffered enough, surely. Have pity on me, and do for me what I am unable to do for myself. As Dantes, his eyes turned in the direction of the Chateau d'If, uttered this prayer, he saw off the farther point of the island of Pomègue a small vessel with latin sail skimming the sea like a gull in search of prey, and with his sailor's eye he knew it to be a Genoese tartan. She was coming out of Marseilles harbour, and was standing out to sea rapidly her sharp prow cleaving through the waves. "'Oh!' cried Edmund, "'to think that in half an hour I could join her! Did I not fear being questioned, detected, and conveyed back to Marseilles? What can I do? What story can I invent? Under pretext of trading along the coast, these men, who are in reality smugglers, will prefer selling me to doing a good action. Oh, I must wait. But I cannot. I am starving. In a few hours my strength will be utterly exhausted. Besides, perhaps I have not been missed at the fortress. I can pass as one of the sailors wrecked last night. My story will be accepted, for there is no one left to contradict me." As he spoke, Dantes looked toward the spot where the fishing vessel had been wrecked, and started. The red cap of one of the sailors hung to a point of the rock, and some timbers that had formed part of the vessel's keel floated at the foot of the crag. In an instant Dantes's plan was formed. He swam to the cap, placed it on his head, seized one of the timbers, and struck out so as to cut across the course the vessel was taking. Oh, "'I am saved,' murmured he, and this conviction restored his strength. He soon saw that the vessel, with the wind dead ahead, was tacking between the Chateau d'If and the Tower of Planier. For an instant he feared lest, instead of keeping in shore, she should stand out to sea, but he soon saw that she would pass, like most vessels bound for Italy between the islands of Jaros and Casalaregne. However, the vessel and the swimmer insensibly neared one another, and in one of its tacks the tartan bore down with a quarter of a mile of him. He rose on the waves, making signs of distress, but no one on board saw him, and the vessel stood on another tack. Dantes would have shouted, but he knew that the wind would drown his voice. It was then he rejoined at his precaution in taking the timber, for without it he would have been unable, perhaps, to reach the vessel, certainly to return to shore, should he be unsuccessful in attracting attention. Dantes, although sure as to what course the vessel would take, had yet watched it anxiously until it tacked and stood towards him. Then he advanced but before they could meet, the vessel again changed her course. By a violent effort he rose half out of the water, waving his cap, and uttering a loud shout peculiar to sailors. This time he was both seen and heard, and the tartan instantly steered towards him. At the same time he saw they were about to lower the boat. An instant after the boat, rowed by two men, advanced rapidly towards him. Dantes let go of the timber, which he now thought to be useless, and swam vigorously to meet them. But he had reckoned too much upon his strength, and then he realized how serviceable the timber had been to him. His arms became stiff, his legs lost their flexibility, and he was almost breathless. He shouted again, the two sailors redoubled their efforts, and one of them cried in Italian, Courage! The word reached his ear as a wave which he no longer had the strength to surmount passed over his head. He rose again to the surface, struggled with the last desperate effort of a drowning man, uttered a third cry, and felt himself sinking, as if the fatal cannon-shot were again tied to his feet. The water passed over his head, and the sky turned grey. A convulsive movement again brought him to the surface. He felt himself seized by the hair. Then he saw and heard nothing. He had fainted. When he opened his eyes, Dantes found himself on the deck of the tartan. 
His first care was to see what course they were taking. They were rapidly leaving the Chateau d'If behind. Dantes was so exhausted that the exclamation of joy he uttered was mistaken for a sigh. As we have said, he was lying on the deck. A sailor was rubbing his limbs with a woolen cloth. Another, whom he recognized as the one who had cried out, Courage! held a gourd full of rum to his mouth, while the third, an old sailor, at once the pilot and captain, looked on with that egotistical pity men feel for a misfortune that they have escaped yesterday, and which may overtake them to-morrow. A few drops of the rum restored suspended animation, while the friction of his limbs restored their elasticity. "'Who are you?' said the pilot in bad French. "'I am,' replied Dantes in bad Italian. A Maltese sailor. We were coming from Syracuse laden with grain. The storm of last night overtook us at Cape Morgan, and we were wrecked on these rocks. Where do you come from? From these rocks that I had the good luck to cling to while our captain and the rest of the crew were all lost. I saw your vessel, and fearful of being left to perish on the desolate island, I swam off on a piece of wreckage to try and intercept your course. You have saved my life, and I thank you continued Dantes. I was lost when one of your sailors caught hold of my hair. It was I, said a sailor, of a frank and manly appearance, and it was time, for you were sinking. Yes, returned Dantes, holding out his hand, I thank you again. I almost hesitated, though, replied the sailor. You looked more like a brigand than an honest man, with your beard six inches and your hair a foot long. Dantes recollected that his hair and beard had not been cut all the time he was at the Chateau d'If. Yes, said he, I made a vow to Our Lady of the Grotto not to cut my hair or beard for ten years if I were saved in a moment of danger, but to-day the vow expires. Now what are we to do with you? said the captain. Alas, anything if you please. My captain is dead. I have barely escaped, but I am a good sailor. Leave me at the first port you make. I shall be sure to find employment. Do you know the Mediterranean? I have sailed it over since my childhood. You know the best harbors? There are few ports that I could not enter or leave with a bandage over my eyes. I say, Captain, said the sailor who had cried courage to Dantes, if what he says is true, what hinders his staying with us? If he says true, said the Captain doubtingly, but in his present condition he will promise anything, and take his chance of keeping it afterwards. I will do more than promise, said Dantes. We shall see, returned the other, smiling. Where are you going? asked Dantes. To Leghorn. Then why, instead of tacking so frequently, do you not sail nearer the wind? Because we should run straight on to the island of Rion. You shall pass by it by twenty fathoms. Take the helm, and let us see what you know. The young man took the helm felt to see if the vessel answered the rudder promptly, and seeing that, without being a first-rate sailor, she yet was tolerably obedient. "'To the sheets,' said he. The four seamen who composed the crew obeyed, while the pilot looked on. Hall taught. They obeyed. Belay. This order was also executed, and the vessel passed, as Dantes had predicted, twenty fathoms to windward. Bravo! Bravo! said the captain. Bravo! repeated the sailors, and they all looked with astonishment at this man whose eye now disclosed an intelligence, and his body a vigor they had not thought him capable of showing. You see, said Dantes, quitting the helm, I shall be of some use to you, at least during the voyage. If you do not want me at Leghorn, you can leave me there, and I will pay you out of the first wages I get for my food and the clothes you lend me. Ah, said the captain, we can agree very well if you are reasonable. Give me what you give the others, and it will be all right, returned Dantes. That's not fair, said the seaman who had saved Dantes, for you know more than we do. What is that to you, Jacopo? returned the captain. Every one is free to ask what he pleases. That's true, replied Jacopo. I only make a remark. Well, you would do much better to find him a jacket and a pair of trousers, if you have them. No, said Jacopo, but I have a shirt and a pair of trousers. 
that is all I want, interrupted Dantes. Jacopo dived into the hold and soon returned with what Edmund wanted. Now then, do you wish for anything else? said the patron. A piece of bread and another glass of the capital rum I tasted, for I have not eaten or drunk for a very long time. He had not tasted food for forty hours. A piece of bread was brought, and Jacopo offered him the gourd. "'Larboard your helm!' cried the captain to the steersman. Dantes glanced that way as he lifted the gourd to his mouth, then paused with his hand in mid-air. "'Holo! What's the matter at Chateau d'If? said the captain. A small white cloud, which had attracted Dantes's attention, crowned the summit of the bastion of the Chateau d'If. At the same moment the faint report of a gun was heard. The sailors looked at one another. "'What is this?' asked the captain. "'A prisoner has escaped from the Chateau d'If, and they are firing the alarm gun,' replied Dantes. The captain glanced at him, but he had lifted the rum to his lips and was drinking it with so much composure that suspicions, if the captain had any, died away. "'At any rate,' murmured he, "'if it be, so much the better, for I have made a rare acquisition.' Under pretense of being fatigued, Dantes asked to take the helm. The steersman, glad to be relieved, looked at the captain, and the latter, by a sign, indicated that he might abandon it to his new comrade. Dantes could thus keep his eye on Marseille. "'What is the day of the month?' he asked Jacopo, who sat down beside him. "'The twenty-eighth of February.' "'In what year?' "'In what year? You ask me in what year?' Yes, replied the young man. I ask you in what year? You have forgotten, then? I got such a fright last night, replied Dantes, smiling, that I have almost lost my memory. I ask you, what year is it? The year 1829, returned Jacopo. It was fourteen years, day for day, since Dantes's arrest. He was nineteen when he entered the Chateau d'If. He was thirty-three when he escaped. A sorrowful smile passed over his face. He asked himself what had become of Mercedes, who must believe him dead. Then his eyes lighted up with hatred, as he thought of the three men who had caused him so long and wretched a captivity. He renewed against Danglars, Fernand, and Villefort the oath of implacable vengeance he had made in his dungeon. This oath was no longer a vain menace for the fastest sailor in the Mediterranean would have been unable to overtake the little tartan, that with every stitch of canvas set was flying before the wind to Leghorn. End of chapter 22Please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Kristen Luoma at GreenKRI.com. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 22 The Smugglers. Dantes had not been a day on board before he had a very clear idea of the men with whom his lot had been cast. Without having been in the school of the Abbe Faria, the worthy master of the young Amelia, the name of the Genoese Tartan, knew a smattering of all the tongues spoken on the shores of that large lake called the Mediterranean, from the Arabic to the Provençal, and this, while it spared him interpreters, persons always troublesome and frequently indiscreet, gave him great facilities of communication, either with the vessels he met at sea, with the small boats sailing along the coast, or with the people without name country or occupation, who are always seen on the quays of the seaports, and who live by hidden and mysterious means, which we must suppose to be the direct gift of providence, as they have no visible means of support. It is fair to assume that Dantes was on board a smuggler. At first the captain had received Dantes on board with a certain degree of distrust. He was very well known to the customs officers of the coast and as there was between these worthies and himself a perpetual battle of wits, he had at first thought that Dantes might be an emissary of these industrious guardians of rights and duties, who perhaps employed this ingenious means of learning some of the secrets of his trade. 
but the skilful manner in which Dantes had handled the luger had entirely reassured him. And then, when he saw the light plume of the smoke floating above the bastion of the Chateau d'If, and heard the distant report, he was instantly struck with the idea that he had on board his vessel one whose coming and going, like that of kings, was accompanied with salutes of artillery. This made him less uneasy, it must be owned, than if the newcomer had proved to be a customs officer. But this supposition also disappeared like the first, when he beheld the perfect tranquillity of his recruit. Edmund thus had the advantage of knowing what the owner was, without the owner knowing who he was, and however the old sailor and his crew tried to pump him, they extracted nothing more from him. He gave accurate descriptions of Naples and Malta, which he knew as well as Marseilles, and held stoutly to his first story. Thus the Genoese, subtle as he was, was duped by Edmund, in whose favour his mild demeanour, his nautical skill, and his admirable dissimulation pleaded. Moreover, it is possible that the Genoese was one of those shrewd persons who know nothing but what they should know, and believe nothing but what they should believe. In this state of mutual understanding they reached Leghorn. Here Edmund was to undergo another trial. He was to find out whether he could recognize himself, as he had not seen his own face for fourteen years. He had preserved a tolerably good remembrance of what the youth had been, and was now to find out what the man had become. His comrades believed that his vow was fulfilled. As he had twenty times touched at Leghorn, he remembered a barber in St. Ferdinand Street. He went there to have his beard and hair cut. The barber gazed in amazement at this man with the long, thick, and black hair and beard, which gave his head the appearance of one of Titian's portraits. At this period it was not the fashion to wear so large a beard and hair so long. Now a barber would only be surprised if a man gifted with such advantages should consent voluntarily to deprive himself of them. The leghorn barber said nothing and went to work. When the operation was concluded, and Edmund felt that his chin was completely smooth and his hair reduced to its usual length, he asked for a hand-glass. He was now, as we have said, three and thirty years of age, and his fourteen years' imprisonment had produced a great transformation in his appearance. Dantes had entered the Chateau d'If with the round, open, smiling face of a young and happy man, with whom the early paths of life have been smooth, and who anticipates a future corresponding with his past. This was now all changed. The oval face was lengthened. His smiling mouth had assumed the firm and marked lines which betoken resolution. His eyebrows were arched beneath a brow furrowed with thought. His eyes were full of melancholy, and from their depths occasionally sparkled gloomy fires of misanthropy and hatred. His complexion, so long kept from the sun, had now that pale color which produces, when the features are encircled with black hair, the aristocratic beauty of the man of the north. The profound learning he had acquired had besides diffused over his features a refined intellectual expression. And he had also acquired, being naturally of a goodly stature, that vigor which a frame possesses which has so long concentrated all its force within itself. To the elegance of a nervous and slight form had succeeded the solidity of a rounded and muscular figure. As to his voice, prayers, sobs, and imprecations had changed it so that at times it was of a singularly penetrating sweetness, and at others rough and almost hoarse. Moreover, from being so long in twilight or darkness, his eyes had acquired the faculty of distinguishing objects in the night, common to the hyena and the wolf. Edmund smiled when he beheld himself. It was impossible that his best friend, if indeed he had any friends left, could recognize him he could not recognize himself. The master of the young Amelia, who was very desirous of retaining amongst his crew a man of Edmund's value, had offered to advance him funds out of his future profits, which Edmund has accepted. His next care on leaving the barbers, who had achieved his first metamorphosis, was to enter a shop and buy a complete sailor's suit, a garb, as we all know, very simple and consisting of white trousers, a striped shirt, and a cap. It was in this costume, and bringing back to Jacopo the shirt and trousers he had lent him, 
that Edmund reappeared before the captain of the lugger, who had made him tell his story over and over again before he could believe him, or recognize in the neat and trim sailor the man with thick and matted beard, hair tangled with seaweed, and body soaking in sea brine, whom he had picked up naked and nearly drowned. Attracted by his prepossessing appearance, he renewed his offers of an engagement to Dantes. But Dantes, who had his own projects, would not agree for a longer time than three months. The young Amelia had a very active crew, very obedient to their captain, who lost as little time as possible. He had scarcely been a week at Leghorn before the hold of his vessel was filled with printed muslins, contraband cottons, English powder, and tobacco on which the excise had forgotten to put its mark. The master was to get all this out of Leghorn free of duties, and land it on the shores of Corsica where certain speculators undertook to forward the cargo to France. They sailed. Edmund was again cleaving the azure sea which had been the first horizon of his youth, and which he had so often dreamed of in prison. He left Gorgon on his right, and La Pionassa on his left, and went towards the country of Paoli and Napoleon. The next morning going on deck, as he always did at an early hour, the patron found Dantes leaning against the bulwarks, gazing with intense earnestness at a pile of granite rocks, which the rising sun tinged with rosy light. It was the island of Monte Cristo. The young Amelia left it three-quarters of a league to the larboard, and kept on for Corsica. Dantes thought, as they passed so closely to the island, whose name was so interesting to him, that he had only to leap into the sea, and in half an hour be at the promised land. But then what could he do without instruments to discover his treasure, without arms to defend himself? Besides, what would the sailors say? What would the patron think? He must wait. Fortunately Dantes had learned how to wait. He had waited fourteen years for his liberty, and now he was free, he could wait at least six months or a year for wealth. Would he not have accepted liberty without riches if it had been offered to him? Besides, were not those riches chimerical? Offspring of the brain of the poor Abbe Faria, had they not died with him? It is true, the letter of the Cardinal Spada was singularly circumstantial, and Dantes repeated it to himself from one end to the other, for he had not forgotten a word. Evening came, and Edmund saw the island tinged with the shades of twilight and then disappear in the darkness from all eyes but his own, for he, with vision accustomed to the gloom of a prison, continued to behold it last of all, for he remained alone upon deck. The next morn broke off the coast of Valeria. All day they coasted, and in the evening saw fires lighted on land. The position of these was no doubt a signal for landing, for a ship's lantern was hung up at the masthead instead of the streamer, and they came to within a gunshot of the shore. Dantes noticed that the captain of the young Amelia had, as he neared the land, mounted two small culverins which, without making much noise, can throw a four-ounce ball a thousand paces or so. But on this occasion the precaution was superfluous, and everything proceeded with the utmost smoothness and politeness. Four shallops came off with very little noise alongside the lugger, which no doubt, in acknowledgment of the compliment, lowered her own shallop into the sea, and the five boats worked so well that by two o'clock in the morning all the cargo was out of the young Amelia and on terra firma. The same night such a man of regularity was the patron of the young Amelia. The profits were divided, and each man had a hundred Tuscan livres, or about eighty francs but the voyage was not ended. They turned the bowsprit towards Sardinia, where they intended to take in a cargo, which was to replace what had been discharged. The second operation was as successful as the first. The young Amelia was in luck. This new cargo was destined for the coast of the Duchy of Lucca, and consisted almost entirely of Havana cigars, sherry, and Malaga wines. There they had a bit of a skirmish in getting rid of the duties. The excise was, in truth, the everlasting enemy of the patron of the young Amelia. A customs officer was laid low, and two sailors wounded. Dantes was one of the latter, a ball having touched him in the left shoulder. 
Dantes was almost glad of this affray, and almost pleased at being wounded, for they were rude lessons which taught him with what eye he could view danger, and with what endurance he could bear suffering. He had contemplated danger with a smile, and when wounded had exclaimed with the great philosopher, Pain, thou art not an evil. He had, moreover, looked upon the customs officer wounded to death, and whether from heat of blood produced by the encounter, or chill of human sentiment, this sight had made but slight impression upon him. Dantes was on the way he desired to follow, and was moving towards the end he wished to achieve. His heart was in a fair way of petrifying in his bosom. Jacopo, seeing him fall, had believed him killed, and rushing towards him raised him up, and then attended to him with all the kindness of a devoted comrade. This world was not then so good as Dr. Pangloss believed it, neither was it so wicked as Dantes thought it, since this man, who had nothing to expect from his comrade but the inheritance of his share of the prize-money, manifested so much sorrow when he saw him fall. Fortunately, as we have said, Edmund was only wounded, and with certain herbs gathered at certain seasons, and sold to the smugglers by the old Sardinian women, the wound soon closed. Edmund then resolved to try Jacopo, and offered him in return for his attention a share of his prize-money, but Jacopo refused it indignantly. As a result of the sympathetic devotion which Jacopo had from the first bestowed on Edmund, the latter was moved to a certain degree of affection. But this sufficed for Jacopo, who instinctively felt that Edmund had a right to superiority of position a superiority which Edmund had concealed from all others, and from this time the kindness which Edmund showed him was enough for the brave seaman. Then in the long days on board ship when the vessel, gliding on with security over the azure sea, required no care but the hand of the helmsman, thanks to the favorable winds that swelled her sails, Edmund, with a chart in his hand, became the instructor of Jacopo, as the poor Abbe Faria had been his tutor. He pointed out to him the bearings of the coast, explained to him the variations of the compass, and taught him to read in that vast book, opened over our heads which they call heaven, and where God writes in azure with letters of diamonds. And when Jacopo inquired of him, What is the use of teaching all these things to a poor sailor like me? Edmund replied, Who knows? You may one day be the captain of a vessel. Your fellow countryman, Bonaparte, became emperor. We had forgotten to say that Jacopo was a Corsican. Two months and a half elapsed in these trips, and Edmund had become as skillful a coaster as he had been a hardy seaman. He had formed an acquaintance with all the smugglers on the coast, and learned all the Masonic signs by which these half-pirates recognize each other. He had passed and repassed his island of Monte Cristo twenty times but not once had he found an opportunity of landing there. He then formed a resolution. As soon as his engagement with the patron of the young Amelia ended, he would hire a small vessel on his own account, for in his several voyages he had amassed a hundred piastres, and under some pretext land at the island of Monte Cristo. Then he would be free to make his researches, not perhaps entirely at liberty, for he would be doubtless watched by those who accompanied him. But in this world we must risk something. Prison had made Edmund prudent, and he was desirous of running no risk whatever. But in vain did he rack his imagination, fertile as it was, he could not devise any plan for reaching the island without companionship. Dantes was tossed about on these doubts and wishes, when the patron, who had great confidence in him, and was very desirous of retaining him in his service, took him by the arm one evening and led him to a tavern on the Via del Oglio, where the leading smugglers of Leghorn used to congregate and discuss affairs connected with their trade. Already Dantes had visited this maritime bourse two or three times, and seeing all these hardy free traders, who supplied the whole coast for nearly two hundred leagues in extent, he had asked himself what power might not that man attain who should give the impulse of his will to all these contrary and diverging minds. This time was a great matter that was under discussion, connected with a vessel laden with turkey carpets, stuffs of the Levant and cashmeres. 
it was necessary to find some neutral ground on which an exchange could be made, and then to try and land these goods on the coast of France. If the venture was successful, the profit would be enormous. There would be a gain of fifty or sixty piastres, each for the crew. The patron of the young Amelia proposed as a place of landing the island of Monte Cristo, which being completely deserted, and having neither soldiers nor revenue officers, seemed to have been placed in the midst of the ocean since the time of the heathen Olympus by Mercury, the god of merchants and robbers, classes of mankind which we in modern times have separated, if not made distinct, but which antiquity appears to have included in the same category. At the mention of Monte Cristo, Dantes started with joy. He rose to conceal his emotion, and took a turn around the smoky tavern, where all the languages of the known world were jumbled in a lingua franca. When he again joined the two persons who had been discussing the matter, it had been decided that they should touch at Monte Cristo and set out on the following night. Edmund, being consulted, was of opinion that the island afforded every possible security, and that great enterprises to be well done should be done quickly. Nothing, then, was altered in the plan, and orders were given to get under way next night, and, wind and weather permitting, to make the neutral island by the following day. End of chapter 22 The Count of Monte Cristo This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 23 The Island of Monte Cristo Thus, at length, by one of the unexpected strokes of fortune which sometimes befall those who have for a long time been the victims of an evil destiny, Dantes was about to secure the opportunity he wished for, by simple and natural means, to land on the island without incurring any suspicion. One night more, and he would be on his way. The night was one of feverish distraction, and in its progress visions good and evil passed through Dante's mind. If he closed his eyes he saw Cardinal Spada's letter, written on the wall in characters of flame. If he slept for a moment the wildest dreams haunted his brain. He ascended into grottoes paved with emeralds, with panels of rubies, and the roof glowing with diamond stalactites. Pearls fell drop by drop, as subterranean waters filter in their caves. Edmund, amazed, wonderstruck, filled his pockets with the radiant gems, and then returned to daylight, when he discovered that his prizes had all changed into common pebbles. He then endeavoured to re-enter the marvellous grottoes, but they had suddenly receded, and now the path became a labyrinth, and then the entrance vanished, and in vain did he tax his memory for the magic and mysterious word which opened the splendid caverns of Ali Baba to the Arabian fishermen. All was useless. The treasure disappeared, and had again reverted to the genie from whom for a moment he had hoped to carry it off. The day came at length, and was almost as feverish as the night had been, but it brought reason to the aid of imagination, and Dantes was then enabled to arrange a plan which had hitherto been vague and unsettled in his brain. Night came, and with it the preparations for departure, and these preparations served to conceal Dantes' agitation. He had by degrees assumed such authority over his companions that he was almost like a commander on board, and as his orders were always clear, distinct, and easy of execution, his comrades obeyed him with celerity and pleasure. The old patron did not interfere, for he too had recognized the superiority of Dantes over the crew and himself. He saw in the young man his natural successor and regretted that he had not a daughter, since he might have bound Edmund to him by a more secure alliance. At seven o'clock in the evening all was ready, and at ten minutes past seven they doubled the lighthouse just as the beacon was kindled. The sea was calm, and with a fresh breeze from the south-east they sailed beneath a bright blue sky, 
in which God also lighted up in turn his beacon lights, each of which is a world. Dantes told them that all hands might turn in, and he would take the helm. When the Maltese, for so they called Dantes, had said this, it was sufficient, and all went to their bunks contentedly. This frequently happened. Dantes, cast from solitude into the world, frequently experienced an imperious desire for solitude, and what solitude is more complete or more poetical than that of a ship floating in isolation on the sea during the obscurity of the night, in the silence of immensity, and under the eye of heaven? Now, this solitude was peopled with his thoughts, the night lighted up by his illusions, and the silence animated by his anticipations. When the patron awoke, the vessel was hurrying on with every sail set and every sail full with the breeze. They were making nearly ten knots an hour. The island of Monte Cristo loomed large in the horizon. Edmund resigned the lugger to the master's care, and went and lay down in his hammock, but in spite of a sleepless night he could not close his eyes for a moment. Two hours afterward he came on deck, as the boat was about to double the island of Elba. They were just abreast of Marikiana and beyond the flat but verdant isle of La Pianosa. The peak of Monte Cristo, reddened by the burning sun, was seen against the azure sky. Dantes ordered the helmsman to put down his helm, in order to leave La Pianosa to starboard, as he knew that he should shorten his course by two or three knots. After five o'clock in the evening the island was distinct, and everything on it was plainly perceptible owing to that clearness of the atmosphere peculiar to the light which the rays of the sun cast at its setting. Edmund gazed very earnestly at the mass of rocks which gave out all the variety of twilight colours, from the brightest pink to the deepest blue, and from time to time his cheeks flushed, his brow darkened, and a mist passed over his eyes. Never did gamester, whose whole fortune is staked on one cast of the die, experience the anguish which Edmund felt in his, his paroxysms of hope. Night came, and at ten o'clock they anchored. The young Amelia was first at the rendezvous. In spite of his usual command over himself, Dantes could not restrain his impetuosity. He was the first to jump on shore, and, had he dared, he would, like Lucius Brutus, have kissed his mother earth. It was dark, but at eleven o'clock the moon rose in the midst of the ocean, whose every wave she silvered, and then, ascending high, played in floods of pale light on the rocky hills of this second Pelion. The island was familiar to the crew of the young Amelia. It was one of her regular haunts. As to Dantes, he had passed it on his voyage to and from the Levant, but never touched at it. He questioned Jacopo. "'Where shall we pass the night?' he inquired. "'Why, on board the Tartan,' replied the sailor. "'Should we not do better in the grottoes?' "'What grottoes?' "'Why, the grottoes, caves of the island.' "'I do not know of any grottoes,' replied Jacopo. The cold sweat sprang forth on Dante's brow. "'What? Are there no grottoes at Monte Cristo?' he asked. "'None.' For a moment Dante's was speechless. Then he remembered that these caves might have been filled up by some accident, or even stopped up for the sake of greater security by Cardinal Spada. The point was, then, to discover the hidden entrance. It was useless to search at night, and Dante's therefore delayed all investigation until the morning. Besides, a signal made half a league out at sea, and to which the young Amelia replied by a similar signal, indicated that the moment for business had come. The boat that now arrived, assured by the answering signal that all was well, soon came in sight, white and silent as a phantom, and cast anchor within a cable's length of shore. Then the landing began. Dantes reflected as he worked on the shout of joy which with a single word, he could evoke from all these men, if he gave utterance to the one unchanging thought that pervaded his heart. But, 
Far from disclosing this precious secret, he almost feared that he had already said too much, and by his restlessness and continual questions, his minute observations and evident preoccupation, aroused suspicions. Fortunately, as regarded this circumstance at least, his painful past gave to his countenance an indelible sadness, and the glimmerings of gaiety seen beneath this cloud were indeed but transitory. No one had the slightest suspicion, and when next day, taking a fowling-piece, powder and shot, Dantes declared his intention to go and kill some of the wild goats that were seen springing from rock to rock, his wish was construed into a love of sport, or a desire for solitude. However, Jacopo insisted on following him, and Dantes did not oppose this, feeling if he did so that he might incur distrust. Scarcely, however, had they gone a quarter of a league, when, having killed a kid, he begged Jacopo to take it to his comrades, and request them to cook it, and when ready to let him know by firing a gun. This, and some dried fruits, and a flask of Montepulciano, was the bill of fare. Dantes went on, looking from time to time behind and around about him. Having reached the summit of a rock, he saw, a thousand feet beneath him, his companions, whom Jacopo had rejoined, and who were all busy preparing the repast which Edmund's skill as a marksman had augmented with a capital dish. Edmund looked at them for a moment with the sad and gentle smile of a man superior to his fellows. "'In two hours' time,' said he, "'these persons will depart richer by fifty piastres each, to go and risk their lives again by endeavouring to gain fifty more. Then they will return with a fortune of six hundred francs, and waste this treasure in some city with the pride of sultans and the insolence of nabobs. At this moment hope makes me despise their riches, which seem to me contemptible. Yet perchance to-morrow deception will so act on me that I shall, on compulsion, consider such a contemptible possession as the utmost happiness. Oh, no! exclaimed Edmund, that will not be. The wise, unerring Faria could not be mistaken in this one thing. Besides, it were better to die than to continue to lead this low and wretched life. Thus Dantes, who but three months before had no desire but liberty, had now not liberty enough, and panted for wealth. This cause was not in Dantes, but in Providence, who, while limiting the power of man, has filled him with boundless desires. Meanwhile, by a cleft between two walls of rock, following a path worn by a torrent, and which in all human probability human foot had never before trod, Dantes approached the spot where he supposed the grottoes must have existed. Keeping along the shore, and examining the smallest object with serious attention, he thought he could trace, on certain rocks, marks made by the hand of man. Time, which encrusts all physical substances with its mossy mantle, as it invests all things of the mind with forgetfulness, seemed to have respected these signs, which apparently had been made with some degree of regularity, and probably with a definite purpose. Occasionally the marks were hidden under tufts of myrtle, which spread into large bushes laden with blossoms, or beneath parasitical lichen. So Edmund had to separate the branches, or brush away the moss, to know where the guide-marks were. The sight of marks renewed Edmund's fondest hopes. Might it not have been the cardinal himself who had first traced them, in order that they might serve as a guide for his nephew in the event of a catastrophe, which he could not foresee, would have been so complete? This solitary place was precisely suited to the requirements of a man desirous of burying treasure. Only, might not those betraying marks have attracted other eyes than those for whom they were made, and had the dark and wondrous island indeed faithfully guarded its precious secret? It seemed, however, to Edmund, who was hidden from his comrades by the inequalities of the ground, that at sixty paces from the harbour the marks ceased, nor did they terminate at any grotto. A large round rock placed solidly on its base, was the only spot to which they seemed to lead. Edmund concluded that perhaps, instead of having reached the end of the route, he had only explored its beginning, and he therefore turned round and retraced his steps. 
Meanwhile his comrades had prepared the repast, had got some water from a spring, spread out the fruit and bread, and cooked the kid. Just at the moment when they were taking the dainty animal from the spit, they saw Edmund springing with the boldness of a chamois from rock to rock, and they fired the signal agreed upon. The sportsman instantly changed his direction and ran quickly towards them. But even while they watched his daring progress, Edmund's foot slipped, and they saw him stagger on the edge of a rock and disappear. They all rushed towards him, for all loved Edmund in spite of his superiority. Yet Jacopo reached him first. He found Edmund lying prone, bleeding, and almost senseless. He had rolled down a declivity of twelve or fifteen feet. They poured a little rum down his throat, and this remedy, which had before been so beneficial to him, produced the same effect as formerly. Edmund opened his eyes, complained of a great pain in his knee, a feeling of heaviness in his head, and severe pains in his loins. They wished to carry him to the shore, but when they touched him, although under Jacopo's directions, he declared with heavy groans that he could not bear to be moved. It may be supposed that Dantes did not now think of his dinner, but he insisted that his comrades, who had not his reasons for fasting, should have their meal. As for himself, he declared that he had only need of a little rest, and that when they returned he should be easier. The sailors did not require much urging. They were hungry, and the smell of the roasted kid was very savoury, and your tars are not very ceremonious. An hour afterwards they returned. All that Edmund had been able to do was to drag himself about a dozen paces forward, to lean against a moss-grown rock. But, instead of growing easier, Dante's pains appeared to increase in violence. The old patron who was obliged to sail in the morning in order to land his cargo on the frontiers of Piedmont and France, between Nice and Freu, urged Dante to try and rise. Edmund made great exertions in order to comply, but at each effort he fell back, moaning and turning pale. "'He has broken his ribs,' said the commander, in a low voice. "'No matter, he is an excellent fellow, and we must not leave him. We will try and carry him on board the Tartan.' Dantes declared, however, that he would rather die where he was than undergo the agony which the slightest movement cost him. "'Well,' said the patron, "'let what may happen. It shall never be said that we deserted a good comrade like you. We will not go till evening.' This very much astonished the sailors, although not one opposed it. The patron was so strict that this was the first time they had ever seen him give up an enterprise or even delay in its execution. Dantes would not allow that any such infraction of regular and proper rules should be made in his favour. "'No, no,' he said to the patron, "'I was awkward, and it is just that I pay the penalty of my clumsiness. Leave me a small supply of biscuit, a gun, powder, and balls to kill the kids or defend myself at need, and a pickaxe that I may build a shelter if you delay in coming back for me. "'But you'll die of hunger,' said the patron. "'I would rather do so,' was Edmund's reply, "'than suffer the inexpressible agonies which the slightest movement causes me.' The patron turned towards his vessel, which was rolling on the swell in the little harbour, and, with sails partly set, would be ready for sea when her toilet should be completed. "'What are we to do, Maltese?' asked the captain. "'We cannot leave you here so, and yet we cannot stay.' "'Go, go!' exclaimed Dantes. "'We shall be absent at least a week,' said the patron, "'and then we must run out of our course to come here and take you up again.' "'Why,' said Dantes, "'if in two or three days you hail any fishing-boat, "'desire them to come here to me. "'I will pay twenty-five piastres for my passage back to Leghorn. "'If you do not come across one, return for me.' The patron shook his head. "'Listen, Captain Baldy, there's one way of settling this,' said Jacopo. "'Do you go, and I will stay and take care of the wounded man.' "'And give up your share of the venture,' said Edmund, "'to remain with me?' "'Yes,' said Jacopo, "'and without any hesitation. "'You are a good fellow, and a kind-hearted messmate,' replied Edmund. "'And heaven will recompense you for your generous intentions, "'but I do not wish any one to stay with me. "'A day or two of rest will set me up, "'and I hope I shall find among the rocks "'certain herbs most excellent for bruises.' "'A peculiar smile passed over Dante's lips. "'He squeezed Jacopo's hand warmly, "'but nothing could shake his determination to remain, "'and remain alone. 
the smugglers left with Edmund what he had requested, and set sail, but not without turning around several times, and each time making signs of a cordial farewell, to which Edmund replied with his hand only, as if he could not move the rest of his body. Then, when they had disappeared, he said with a smile, "'It is strange that it should be among such men that we find proofs of friendship and devotion.' Then he dragged himself cautiously to the top of a rock, from which he had a full view of the sea, and thence he saw the Tartan complete her preparations for sailing, weigh anchor, and, balancing herself as gracefully as a waterfowl, ere it takes to the wing, set sail. At the end of an hour she was completely out of sight. At least it was impossible for the wounded man to see her any longer from the spot where he was. Then Dante's rose, more agile and light than the kid among the myrtles and shrubs of these wild rocks, took his gun in one hand, his pickaxe in the other, and hastened towards the rock on which the marks he had noted terminated. "'And now,' he exclaimed, remembering the tale of the Arabian fisherman, which Faria had related to him, "'now open sesame!' End of chapter 23「The leaves of the myrtle and olive trees waved and rustled in the wind. At every step that Edmond took he disturbed the lizards glittering with the hues of the emerald. Afar off he saw the wild goats bounding from crag to crag. In a word, the island was inhabited, yet Edmond felt himself alone, guided by the hand of God. He felt an indescribable sensation somewhat akin to dread, that dread of the daylight which even in the desert makes us fear we are watched and observed. This feeling was so strong that at the moment when Edmond was about to begin his labor, he stopped, laid down his pickaxe, seized his gun, mounted to the summit of the highest rock, and from thence gazed round in every direction. But it was not upon Corsica, the very houses of which he could distinguish, or on Sardinia, or on the island of Elba with its historical associations, or upon the almost imperceptible line that to the experienced eye of a sailor alone revealed the coast of Genoa the Proud and leghorn the commercial that he gazed it was at the brigantine that had left in the morning and the tartan that had just set sail that edmond fixed his eyes the first was just disappearing in the straits of bonifacio the other following in opposite direction was about to round the island of corsica this sight reassured him he then looked at the objects near him he saw that he was on the highest point of the island a statue on this vast pedestal of granite nothing human appearing in sight, while the blue ocean beat against the base of the island and covered it with a fringe of foam. Then he descended with cautious and slow step, for he dreaded lest an accident similar to that he had so adroitly feigned should happen in reality. Dantes, as we have said, had traced the marks along the rocks, and he had noticed that they led to a small creek, which was hidden like the bath of some ancient nymph. This creek was sufficiently wide at its mouth, and deep in the center, to admit of the entrance of a small vessel of the lugger class, which would be perfectly concealed from observation. Then following the clue that, in the hands of the Abbe Faria, had been so skillfully used to guide him through the Didalian labyrinth of probabilities, he thought that the Cardinal Spada, anxious not to be watched, had entered the creek, concealed his little bark, followed the line marked by the notches in the rock, and at the end of it had buried his treasure. It was this idea that had brought Dantes back to the circular rock. One thing only perplexed Edmond and destroyed his theory. How could this rock, which weighed several tons, have been lifted to the spot without the aid of many men? Suddenly an idea flashed across his mind. Instead of raising it, thought he, they have lowered it, and he sprang from the rock in order to inspect the base on which it had formerly stood. He soon perceived that a slope had been formed, and the rock had slid along this until it stopped at the spot it now occupied. A large stone had served as a wedge. Flints and pebbles had been inserted around it so as to conceal the orifice. 
this species of masonry had been covered with earth and grass and weeds had grown there moss had clung to these stones myrtle bushes had taken root and the old rock seemed fixed to the earth dantes dug away the earth carefully and detected or fancied he detected the ingenious artifice he attacked this wall cemented by the hand of time with his pickaxe after ten minutes labor the wall gave way and a hole large enough to insert the arm was open dantes went and cut the strongest olive tree he could find stripped off his branches inserted it in the hole and used it as a lever but the rock was too heavy and too firmly wedged to be moved by any one man were he hercules himself dantes saw that he must attack the wedge but how he cast his eyes around and saw the horn full of powder which his friend jacopo had left him he smiled this infernal invention would serve him for this purpose with the aid of his pickaxe dantes after the manner of a labor-saving pioneer dug a mine between the upper rock and the one that supported it filled it with powder then made a match by rolling his handkerchief in saltpeter he lighted it and retired the explosion soon followed the upper rock was lifted from its base by the terrific force of the powder the lower one flew into pieces thousands of insects escaped from the aperture dantes had previously formed and a huge snake like the guardian demon of the treasure rolled himself along in darkening coils and disappeared dantes approached the upper rock which now without any support leaned towards the sea the intrepid treasure seeker walked round it and selecting the spot from whence it appeared most susceptible to attack placed his lever in one of the crevices and strained every nerve to move the mass the rock already shaken by the explosion tottered on its base dantes redoubled his efforts he seemed like one of the ancient titans who uprooted the mountains to hurl against the father of the god the rock yielded, rolled over, bounded from point to point, and finally disappeared in the ocean. On the spot it had occupied was a circular space, exposing an iron ring let into a square flagstone. Dantes uttered a cry of joy and surprise. Never had a first attempt been crowned with more perfect success. He would fain have continued, but his knees trembled, and his heart beat so violently, and his sight became so dim that he was forced to pause. This feeling lasted but for a moment. Edmond inserted his lever in the ring and exerted all his strength. The flagstone yielded and disclosed steps that descended until they were lost in the obscurity of a subterraneous grotto. Anyone else would have rushed on with a cry of joy. Dantes turned pale, hesitated and reflected. Come, said he to himself, be a man. I am accustomed to adversity. I must not be cast down by the discovery that I have been deceived. What, then, would be the use of all I have suffered? The heart breaks when, after having been elated by flattering hopes, it sees all its illusions destroyed. Faria has dreamed this, the Cardinal Spada buried no treasure here. Perhaps he never came here, or if he did, Caesar Borgia, the intrepid adventurer, the stealthy and indefatigable plunderer, has followed him, discovered his traces, pursued them as I have done, raised the stone, and descending before me, has left me nothing. He remained motionless and pensive, his eyes fixed on the gloomy aperture that was open at his feet. Now that I expect nothing, now that I no longer entertain the slightest hopes, the end of this adventure becomes simply a matter of curiosity. And he remained again motionless and thoughtful. Yes, yes, this is an adventure worthy of place in the varied career of that royal bandit. This fabulous event formed but a link in a long chain of marvels. Yes, Borgia has been here, a torch in one hand, a sword in the other and within twenty paces at the foot of this rock perhaps two guards kept watch on land and sea while their master descended as i am about to descend dispelling the darkness before his awe-inspiring progress but what was the fate of the guards who thus possessed his secret asked dantes of himself the fate replied he smiling of those who buried alaric yet had he come thought dantes he would have found the treasure and borgia he who compared italy to an artichoke which he could devour leaf by leaf knew too well the value of time to waste it in replacing this rock. I will go down. Then he descended, a smile on his lips, and murmuring that last word of human philosophy, perhaps. But instead of this darkness, and the thick and memphitic atmosphere he had expected to find, Dantes saw a dim and bluish light, which, as well as the air, entered not merely by the aperture he had just formed, but by the interstices and crevices of the rock which were visible from without and through which he could distinguish the blue sky 
and the waving branches of the evergreen oaks and the tendrils of the creepers that grew from the rocks after having stood a few minutes in the cavern the atmosphere of which was rather warm than damp dantes's eye habituated as it was to darkness could pierce even to the remotest angles of the cavern which was of granite that sparkled like diamonds alas said edmond smiling these are the treasures the cardinal has left and the good abbey seeing in a dream these glittering walls as indulged in fallacious hopes but he called to mind the words of the will which he knew by heart in the farthest angle of the second opening said the cardinal's will he had only found the first grotto he had now to seek the second dantes continued his search he reflected that this second grotto must penetrate deeper into the island he examined the stones and sounded one part of the wall where he fancied the opening existed mass for precaution's sake the pickaxe struck for a moment with a dull sound that drew out of dantes's forehead large drops of perspiration at last it seemed to him that one part of the wall gave forth a more hollow and deeper echo he eagerly advanced and with the quickness of perception that no one but a prisoner possesses saw that there in all probability the opening must be however he like caesar borgia knew the value of time and in order to avoid fruitless toil he sounded all the other walls with his pickaxe struck the earth with the butt of his gun and finding nothing that appeared suspicious returned to that part of the wall whence issued the consoling sound he had before heard he again struck it and with greater force then a singular thing occurred as he struck the wall pieces of stucco similar to that used in the groundwork of arabesques broke off and fell to the ground in flakes exposing a large white stone the aperture of the rock had been closed with stones then this stucco had been applied and painted to imitate granite dantes struck with the sharp end of his pickaxe which entered somewhere between the interstices it was there he must dig but by some strange play of emotion in proportion as the proofs that faria had not been deceived became stronger so did his heart give way and a feeling of discouragement stole over him this last proof instead of giving him fresh strength deprived him of it the pickaxe descended or rather fell he placed it on the ground passed his hand over his brow and remounted the stairs alleging to himself as an excuse a desire to be assured that no one was watching him but in reality because he felt that he was about to faint the island was deserted and the sun seemed to cover it with its fiery glance afar off a few small fishing boats studded the bosom of the blue ocean dantes had tasted nothing but he thought not of hunger at such a moment he hastily swallowed a few drops of rum and again entered the cavern the pickaxe that had seemed so heavy was now like a feather in his grasp he seized it and attacked the wall after several blows he perceived that the stones were not cemented but had been merely placed one upon the other and covered with stucco he inserted the point of his pickaxe and using the handle as a lever with joy saw the stone turn as if on hinges and fall at his feet he had nothing more to do now but with the iron tooth of the pickaxe to draw the stones towards him one by one the aperture was already sufficiently large for him to enter but by waiting he could still cling to the hope and retard the certainty of deception at last after renewed hesitation dantes entered the second grotto the second grotto was lower and more gloomy than the first the air that could only enter by the newly formed opening had that memphitic spell dantes was surprised not to find in the outer cabin he waited in order to allow pure air to displace the foul atmosphere and then went on at the left of the opening was a dark and deep angle but to Dantes's eye there was no darkness. He glanced around this second grotto. It was, like the first, empty. The treasure, if it existed, was buried in this corner. The time had at last arrived. Two feet of earth removed, and Dantes's fate would be decided. He advanced towards the angle, and summoning all his resolution, attacked the ground with the pickaxe. At the fifth or sixth blow, the pickaxe struck against an iron substance. Never did funeral knell, never did alarm bell, produce a greater effect on the hearer had dantes found nothing he could not have become more ghastly pale he again struck his pickaxe into the earth and encountered the same resistance but not with the same sound it is a casket of wood bound with iron thought he at this moment a shadow passed rapidly before the opening dantes seized his gun sprang through the opening and mounted the stair a wild goat had passed before the mouth of the cave and was feeding at a little distance this would have been a favorable occasion to secure his dinner but dantes feared lest the report of his gun should attract attention 
he thought a moment cut a branch of a resinous tree lighted it at the fire at which the smugglers had prepared their breakfast and descended with his torch he wished to see everything he approached the hole he had dug and now with the aid of the torch saw that his pickaxe had in reality struck against iron and wood he planted his torch in the ground and resumed his labor in an instant a space three feet long by two feet broad was cleared and dantes could see an oaken copper bound with cut steel in the middle of the lid he saw engraved on a silver plate which was still untarnished the arms of the spada family that is a sword pale on an oval shield like all the italian armorial bearings and surmounted by a cardinal's hat dantes easily recognized them faria had so often drawn them for him there was no longer any doubt the treasure was there no one would have been at such pains to conceal an empty casket in an instant he had cleared every obstacle away and he saw successively the lock placed between two padlocks and the two handles at each end all carved as things were carved at that epoch when art rendered the commonest metals precious dantes seized the handles and strove to lift the copper it was impossible he sought to open it lock and padlock were fastened these faithful guardians seemed unwilling to surrender their trust dantes inserted the sharp end of the pickaxe between the copper and the lid and pressing with all his force on the handle burst open the fastenings the hinges yielded in their turn and fell still holding in their grasp fragments of the wood and the chest was open edmond was seized with vertigo he cocked his gun and laid it beside him he then closed his eyes as children do in order that they may see in the resplendent night of their own imagination more stars than are visible in the firmament he then reopened them and stood motionless with amazement three compartments divided the copper in the first blazed piles of golden coin in the second were ranged bars of unpolished gold which possessed nothing attractive save their value in the third edmond grasped handfuls of diamonds pearls and rubies which as they fell on one another sounded like hail against glass after having touched felt examined these treasures edmond rushed through the caverns like a man seized with frenzy he leaped upon a rock from whence he could behold the sea he was alone alone with these countless these unheard-of treasures was he awake or was it but a dream he would fain have gazed upon his gold and yet he had not strength enough for an instant he leaned his head in his hands as if to prevent his senses from leaving him and then rushed madly about the rocks of monte cristo terrifying the wild goats and scaring the sea fowls with his wild cries and gestures then he returned and still unable to believe the evidence of his senses rushed into the grotto and found himself before this mine of gold and jewels this time he fell on his knees and clasping his hands convulsively uttered a prayer intelligible to god alone he soon became calmer and more happy for only now did he begin to realize his felicity he then set himself to work to count his fortune there were a thousand ingots of gold each weighing from two to three pounds then he piled up twenty-five thousand crowns each worth about eighty francs of our money and bearing the effigies of alexander the sixth and his predecessors and he saw that the complement was not half empty and he measured ten double handfuls of pearls diamonds and other gems many of which mounted by the most famous workmen were valuable beyond their intrinsic worth dantes saw the light gradually disappear and fearing to be surprised in the cavern left it his gun in his hand a piece of biscuit and a small quantity of rum formed his supper and he snatched a few hours sleep lying over the mouth of the cave it was a night of joy and terror such as this man of stupendous emotions had already experienced twice or thrice in his lifetime End of chapter 24 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ana Sofia Simão, de Portugal. The Count of Monte Cristo, by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 25. The Unknown. Day, for which Dantes had so eagerly and impatiently waited with open eyes, again dawned. With the first light, Dantes resumed this search. Again he climbed the rocky aid he had ascended the previous evening, and strained his view to catch every peculiarity of the landscape. But it wore the same wild, barren aspect when seen by the rays of the morning sun, which it had done when surveyed by the fading glimmer of eve. Descending into the grotto, he lifted the stone, 
filled his pockets with gems, put the box together as well, and securely as he could, sprinkled fresh sand over the spot from which it had been taken, and then carefully trod down the earth to give it everywhere a uniform appearance. Then, quitting the grotto, he replaced the stone, heaping on it broken masses of rock and rough fragments of crumbling granite, filling the interstices with earth, into which he deftly inserted rapidly growing plants, such as the wild myrtle and flowering thorn. Then, carefully watering these new plantations, he scrupulously effaced every trace of footsteps, leaving the approach to the cavern as savage-looking and untrodden as he had found it. This done, he impatiently awaited the return of his companions, to wait at Monte Cristo for the purpose of watching like a dragon over the almost incalculable riches that had thus fallen into his possession, satisfied not the cravings of his heart, which yearned to return to dwell among mankind, and to assume the rank, power, and influence which are always according to wealth, that first and greatest of all the forces within the grasp of man. On the sixth day, the smugglers returned. From a distance, Dantes recognized the dragon right handling of the young Amelia, and dragging himself with affected difficulty toward the landing place, he met his companions with an assurance that, although considerably better than when they quitted him, he still suffered acutely from his late accident. He then inquired how they had fared in their trip. To this question, the smugglers replied that, Although successful in landing their cargo in safety, they had scarcely done so when they received intelligence that the guard ship had just quitted the port of Toulon and was crowding all sails toward them. This obliged them to make all the speed they could to evade the enemy, when they could but lament the absence of Dantes, whose superior skill in the management of a vessel would have availed them so materially. In fact, the pursuing vessel had almost overtaken them when, fortunately, night came on, and enabled them to double the Cape of Corsica, and so elude all further pursuit. Upon the whole, however, the trip had been sufficiently successful to satisfy all concerned, while the crew, and particularly Jacopo, expressed great regrets that Dantes had not been an equal sharer with themselves in the profits, which amounted to no less a sum than fifty piastres each. Edmund preserved the most admirable self-command, not suffering the faintest indication of a smile to escape him at the enumeration of all the benefits he would have reaped had he been able to quit the island. But, as the young Amelia had nearly come to Monte Cristo to fetch him away, he embarked that same evening and proceeded with the captain to Leghorn. Arrived at Leghorn, he repaired to the house of a Jew, a jeweler in precious stones, to whom he disposed of four of his smallest diamonds for five thousand francs each. Dantes half feared that such valuable jewels in the hands of a poor sailor like himself might excite suspicions. But the cunning processor asked no troublesome questions concerning a bargain, by which he gained a round profit of at least eighty per cent. The following day, Dantes presented Jacopo with an entirely new vessel, accompanying the gift by a donation of one hundred piastres, that he might provide himself with a suitable crew and other requisites for his outfit, upon condition that he would go at once to Marseilles for the purpose of acquiring after an old man named Louis Dantes, residing in the alleys de Melan, and also a young woman called Mercedes, an inhabitant of the Catalan village. Jacopo could scarcely believe his senses at receiving this magnificent present, which Dantes hastened to account for by saying that he had merely been a sailor from him with a desire to spite his family, who did not allow him as much money as he liked to spend, but that on his arrival at Leghorn he had come into possession of a large fortune, left him by an uncle, whose sole heir he was. The superior education of Dantes gave an air of such extreme probability to this statement that it never at once occurred to Jacopo to doubt its accuracy. The terms for which Edmund had engaged to serve on board the young Amelia having expired, Dantes took leave of the captain, who would first try all his powers of persuasion to induce him to remain as one of the crew, 
but having been told the history of the legacy, he ceased to importune him further. The following morning, Jacopo set sail for Marseilles, with direction from Dantes to join him at the island of Monte Christ. Having seen Jacopo fairly out of the harbour, Dantes proceeded to make his final adieu on board the young Amelia, distributing so liberal a gratuity among her crew as to secure him the good wishes of all and expressions of cordial interest in all that concerned him. To the captain he promised to write when he had made up his mind as to his future plans. Then Dantes departed for Genoa. At the moment of his arrival a small yacht was under trial in the bay. This yacht had been built by order of an Englishman who, having heard that Genoese excelled all other builders along the shores of the Mediterranean in the construction of fast-sailing vessels, was desirous of possessing a specimen of their skill. The price agreed upon between the Englishman and the Genoese builder was 40,000 francs. Dantes, struck with the beauty and capability of the little vessel, applied to its owner to transfer it to him, offering 60,000 pounds, upon condition that he should be allowed to take immediate possession. The proposal was too advantageous to be refused, the more so as the person for whom the edge was intended had gone upon a tour through Switzerland, and was not expected back in less than three weeks or a month, by which time the builder reckoned upon being able to complete another. A bargain was therefore struck. Dantes led the owner to the yacht to the dwelling of a Jew, retired with later from a few minutes to a small back parlour, and upon their return the Jew counted out the shipholder the sum of sixty thousand francs in bright gold pieces. The delighted builder then offered their services in providing a suitable crew for a little vessel, but this Dantes declined with many thanks, saying he was accustomed to cruise about quite alone, and his principal pleasure consisted in managing his yacht himself. The only thing the builder could oblige him in would be to contrive a sort of secret closet in the cabin at his bed's head, the closet to contain three divisions so constructed as to be concealed from all but himself. The builder cheerfully undertook the commission, and promised to have this secret place completed by the next day. Dentes, furnishing the dimensions of and plan in accordance with which they were to be constructed. The following day Dantes sailed with his yacht from Genoa, under the inspection of an immense crowd that drawn together by curiosity to see the rich Spanish nobleman who preferred managing his own yacht. But their wonder was soon changed to admiration at seeing the perfect skill with which Dantes handled her helm. The boat, indeed, seemed to be animated with almost human intelligence, so promptly did it obey the slightest touch. And Dantes required but the short trial of his beautiful craft to acknowledge that the Genoese had not without reason attained her high reputation in the art of shipbuilding. Spectators followed the little vessel with their eyes as long as it remained visible. They then returned their conjectures upon her probable destination. Some insisted she was making for Corsica, others the island of Elba. Bets were offered to any amount that she was bound for Spain, while Africa was possibility reported by many persons as her intended course, but no one thought of Monte Cristo. Yet, thither it was that Dantes guided his vessel, and that Monte Cristo here arrived at the close of the second day. His boat had proved herself a first-class sailor, and it had come the distance from Genoa in thirty-five hours. Dantes had carefully noted the general appearance of the shore, and, instead of landing at the usual place, he dropped anchor in the little creek. The island was utterly deserted, and bore no evidence of having been visited since he went away. His treasure was just as he had left it. Early on the following morning, he commenced the removal of its riches, and here nightfall, the whole of his immense wealth was safely deposited in the compartments of the secret locker. A week passed by. Dantes employed it in maneuvering his riat round the island, studying it as a skilful horseman would the animal he destined for some important service, till at the end of that time he had perfectly conversant with its good and bad qualities. The former Dantes 
proposed to augment the later to remedy. Upon the eighty day, he discerned a small vessel under full sail approaching Monte Cristo. As it drew near, he recognized as the boat he had given to Jacopo. He immediately signaled it. His signal was returned, and in two hours afterwards, the newcomer lay an anchor beside the yacht. A mournful answer awaited each of Edmund's eager inquiries as to the information Jacopo had obtained. All Dantes was dead, and Mercedes had disappeared. Dantes listened to these melancholy tidings with outward calmness, but, leaping lightly ashore, he signified his desire to be quite alone. In a couple of hours he returned. Two of the men from the Copa's boat came on board the yacht to assist him in navigating it, and he gave orders that she should be steered direct to Marseilles. For his father's death he was in some manner prepared, but he knew not how to account for the mysterious disappearance of Mercedes. Without divulging his secret, Dantes could not give sufficiently clear instructions to an agent. There were, besides, other particulars he was desirous of asserting, and those who were of a nature he alone could investigate in a manner satisfactory to him. His looking-glass had assured him, during his stay at Leghorn, that he ran no risk of recognition. Moreover, he had not the means of adopting any disguise he thought proper. One fine morning, then, his yacht, followed by the little fishing boat, boldly entered the port of Marseilles, and anchored exactly opposite the spot from whence, on the never-to-be-forgotten night of his departure at Chateau d'If, he had been put on board the boat destined to convey him thither. Still, Dantes could not view without a shudder the approach of a gendarme who accompanied the officer's deputy to demand his bill of health, here the edge was permitted to hold communication with shore, but with that perfect self-possession he had acquired during his acquaintances with Faria, Dantes coolly presented an English passport he had obtained from Leghorn, and, as this gave him a standing which a French passport would not have afforded, he was informed that there existed no obstacle to his immediate divertation. The first person to attract the attentions of Dantes as he launched on the canopier, was one of the crew belonging to the pharaoh. Edmund welcomed the meeting with this, this fellow, who had been one of his own sailors, as a sure means of testing the extent of the change which time had worked in his own appearance. Going straight towards him, he propounded a variety of questions on different subjects, carefully watching the man's countenance as he did so but not a word or look implied that he had the slightest idea of ever having seen before the portion which whom he was then conversing. Giving the sailor a piece of money in return for his civility, Dantes proceeded onwards, but here he had gone many steps, he heard the man loudly calling in to stop. Dantes instantly turned to meet him. I beg your pardon, sir, said the honest fellow in almost breathless haste. But I believe you make a, made the mistake. You intended to give me a two-franc piece, and see, you gave me a double Napoleon. Thank you, my good friend. I see that I have made a trifling mistake, as you say. But by way of rewarding your honesty, I give you another double Napoleon, that you may drink to my health, and be able to ask your messmates to join you. So extreme was surprised at the sailor, that he was... Unable even to thank Edmund, whose receding figure he continued to gaze after in speechless astonishment. Some Nabob from India was his comment. Dentons, meanwhile, went on his way. Each step he trod the press his heart with fresh emotion. His first and most indelible recollections were there. Not a tree, not a street, that he passed, but seemed filled with dear and cherished memories and thus he proceeded onwards, till he arrived at the end of the Rue de Noyelles, from whence a full view of Alice de Melian was obtained. At this spot, so pregnant with fond and filial remembrances, his heart beat almost so bursting, his knees tottered under him, a mist floated over his side, and had he not clung for support to one of the trees, 
he would inevitably have fallen to the ground and been crushed beneath the many vehicles continually passing him there. Recovering himself, however, he wiped the perspiration from his brows and stopped not again till he found himself at the door of the house in which his father had lived. The nasturtiums and other plants, which his father had delighted to train before his window, had all disappeared from the upper part of the house. Leaning against the tree, he gazed thoughtfully for a time at the upper stories of the shabby little house. Then he advanced to the door and asked whether there were any rooms to be let. Though answered in the negative, he begged so earnestly to be permitted to visit those on the fifth floor that, in spite of the of the repeated assurance of the concierge that they were occupied, Dantis succeeded in inducing the man to go up to the tenants and ask permission for a gentleman to be allowed to look at them. The tenants of the humble lodging were a young couple who had been scarcely married a week, and seeing them, Dantis sighed heavily. Nothing in the two small chambers forming the apartments remained as it had been in the time of the elder dentist. The very paper was different while the articles of antiquated furniture with which the room had been filled in Edmund's time had all disappeared. The four walls alone remained as he had left them. The bed belonging to the present occupants was placed as former owner of the chamber had been accustomed to have is, and, in spite of his efforts to prevent it, the eyes of Edmund were suffused in tears as he reflected that, on that spot, the old man had breath of his last, vainly calling for his son. The young couple gazed with astonishment at sight of their visitor's emotion, and wondered to see the large tears silently chasing each other down his otherwise stern and immovable features. But they felt the sacredness of his grief, and kindly refrained from questioning him as to its cause, while, with instinctive delicacy, they left him to enjoy his sorrow alone. When he withdrew from the scene of his painful recollections, they both accompanied him downstairs, reiterating their hope that he would come again whenever he pleased, and assuring him that their poor dwelling would ever be open to him. As Edmund passed the door on, on the fourth floor, he paused to inquire whether Cadrus, the tailor, still dwelt there. But he received for reply that the person in question had got into difficulties, and at the present time kept a small inn on the route from Bellegarde to pay care. Having obtained the address of the person to whom the house in Ailes de Mayen belonged, Dantes next proceeded thither, and, under the name of Lord Wilmore, the name and title inscribed on his passport, purchased the small dwelling for the sum of twenty-five thousand francs, at least ten thousand more than it was worth. But as its owner asked half a million, it would unhesitantly have been given. The very same day the occupants of the apartments on the fifth floor of the house, now become the property of Dantes, were duly informed by the notary, who had arranged the necessary transfer of deeds, etc., that the new landlord gave them their choice of any of the rooms in the house, without the least argumentation of rents, upon condition of their giving instant possession of the two small chambers they at present inhabited. This strange event aroused great wonder and curiosity in the neighborhood of the Alice de Maya, and a multitude of theories were afloat, none of which was anywhere near the truth. But what raised public astonishment to a climax, and set all conjecture at defiance, was the knowledge that the same stranger who had in the morning visited the Alice de Maya had been seen in the evening walking in the little village of the Catalans, and afterwards observed to enter a poor fisherman's hut, and to pass more than an hour in inquiring after persons who had either been dead or gone away for more than fifteen or sixteen years. But on the following day, the family from whom all these particulars had been asked received a handsome present, consisting of an entirely new fishing boat, with two saints and a tender. The delighted recipients of these munificent gifts would gladly have poured out their thanks to their general's benefactor, but they had seen him, upon quitting the hut, merely give some orders to a sailor, and then, springing lightly on horseback, leave Marseilles by the port day. 
End of chapter 25《Day, for which Dantes had so eagerly and impatiently waited with open eyes, again dawned. With the first light, Dantes resumed his search. Again he climbed the rocky height he had ascended the previous evening, and strained his view to catch every peculiarity of the landscape. But it wore the same wild, barren aspect when seen by the rays of the morning sun, which it had done when surveyed by the fading glimmer of eve. Descending into the grotto, he lifted the stone, filled his pockets with gems, put the box together as well and securely as he could, sprinkled fresh sand over the spot from which it had been taken, and then carefully trod down the earth to give it everywhere a uniform appearance. Then, quitting the grotto, he replaced the stone, heaping on it broken masses of rocks and rough fragments of crumbling granite, filling the interstices with earth into which he deftly inserted rapidly growing plants, such as the wild myrtle and flowering thorn, then carefully watering these new plantations, he scrupulously effaced every trace of footsteps, leaving the approach to the cavern as savage-looking and untrodden as he had found it. This done, he impatiently awaited the return of his companions. To wait at Monte Cristo for the purpose of watching like a dragon over the almost incalculable riches that had thus fallen into his possession satisfied not the cravings of his heart, which yearned to return to dwell among mankind, and to assume the rank, power and influence which are always accorded to wealth, that first and greatest of all the forces within the grasp of man. On the sixth day the smugglers returned. From a distance Dantes recognized the rig and handling of the young Amelia, and dragging himself with affected difficulty towards the landing-place, he met his companions with an assurance that, although considerably better than when they quitted him, he still suffered acutely from his late accident. He then inquired how they had fared in their trip. To this question the smugglers replied that, although successful in landing their cargo in safety, they had scarcely done so when they received intelligence that a guard-ship had just quitted the port of Toulon, and was crowding all sail towards them. This obliged them to make all the speed they could to evade the enemy, when they could but lament the absence of Dantes, whose superior skill in the management of a vessel would have availed them so materially. In fact, the pursuing vessel had almost overtaken them when, fortunately, night came on, and enabled them to double the Cape of Corsica, and so elude all further pursuit. Upon the whole, however, the trip had been sufficiently successful to satisfy all concerned, while the crew, and particularly Jacopo, expressed great regrets that Dantes had not been an equal sharer with themselves in the profits, which amounted to no less a sum than fifty piastres each. Edmond preserved the most admirable self-command, not suffering the faintest indication of a smile to escape him at the enumeration of all the benefits he would have reaped had he been able to quit the island. But as the young Amelia had merely come to Monte Cristo to fetch him away, he embarked that same evening, and proceeded with the captain to Leghorn. Arrived at Leghorn, he repaired to the house of a Jew, a dealer in precious stones, to whom he disposed of four of his smallest diamonds for five thousand francs each. Dantes half feared that such valuable jewels in the hands of a poor sailor like himself might excite suspicion, but the cunning purchaser asked no troublesome questions concerning a bargain by which he gained a round profit of at least eighty per cent. The following day Dantes presented Jacopo with an entirely new vessel, accompanying the gift by a donation of one hundred piastres, that he might provide himself with a suitable crew and other requisites for his outfit, upon condition that he would go at once to Marseilles for the purpose of inquiring after an old man named Louis Dantes, residing in the Allée des Meillons, and also a young woman called Mercedes, an inhabitant of the Catalan village. 
Jacopo could scarcely believe his senses at receiving this magnificent present, which Dantes hastened to account for by saying that he had merely been a sailor from whim and a desire to spite his family, who did not allow him as much money as he liked to spend, but that on his arrival at Leghorn he had come into possession of a large fortune, left him by an uncle whose sole heir he was. The superior education of Dantes gave an air of such extreme probability to this statement that it never once occurred to Jacopo to doubt its accuracy. The term for which Edmond had engaged to serve on board the young Amelia having expired, Dantes took leave of the captain, who at first tried all his powers of persuasion to induce him to remain as one of the crew, but having been told the history of the legacy, he ceased to importune him further. The following morning Jacopo set sail for Marseilles, with directions from Dantes to join him at the island of Monte Cristo. Having seen Jacopo fairly out of the harbour, Dantes proceeded to make his final adieus on board the young Amelia, distributing so liberal a gratuity among her crew as to secure for him the good wishes of all, and expressions of cordial interest in all that concerned him. To the captain he promised to write when he had made up his mind as to his future plans. Then Dantes departed for Genoa. At the moment of his arrival, a small yacht was under trial in the bay. This yacht had been built by order of an Englishman, who, having heard that the Genoese excelled all other builders along the shores of the Mediterranean in the construction of fast-sailing vessels, was desirous of possessing a specimen of their skill. The price agreed upon between the Englishman and the Genoese builder was 40,000 francs. Dantes, struck with the beauty and capability of the little vessel, applied to its owner to transfer it to him, offering sixty thousand francs, upon condition that he should be allowed to take immediate possession. The proposal was too advantageous to be refused, the more so as the person for whom the yacht was intended had gone upon a tour through Switzerland, and was not expected back in less than three weeks or a month, by which time the builder reckoned upon being able to complete another. A bargain was therefore struck. Dantes led the owner of the yacht to the dwelling of a Jew, retired with the latter for a few minutes to a small back parlour, and upon their return the Jew counted out to the shipbuilder the sum of sixty thousand francs in bright gold pieces. The delighted builder then offered his services in providing a suitable crew for the little vessel, but this Dantes declined with many thanks, saying he was accustomed to cruise about quite alone, and his principal pleasure consisted in managing his yacht himself. The only thing the builder could oblige him in would be to contrive a sort of secret closet in the cabin at his bed's head, the closet to contain three divisions, so constructed as to be concealed from all but himself. The builder cheerfully undertook the commission, and promised to have these secret places completed by the next day, Dantes furnishing the dimensions and plan in accordance with which they were to be constructed. The following day Dantes sailed with his yacht from Genoa, under the inspection of an immense crowd, drawn together by curiosity to see the rich Spanish nobleman who preferred managing his own yacht. But their wonder was soon changed to admiration at seeing the perfect skill with which Dantes handled the helm. The boat, indeed, seemed to be animated with almost human intelligence, so promptly did it obey the slightest touch and Dantes required but a short trial of his beautiful craft to acknowledge that the Genoese had not without reason attained their high reputation in the art of shipbuilding. The spectators followed the little vessel with their eyes as long as it remained visible. They then turned their conjectures upon her probable destination. Some insisted she was making for Corsica, others the island of Elba. Bets were offered to any amount that she was bound for Spain, while Africa was positively reported by many persons as her intended course. But no one thought of Monte Cristo. Yet thither it was that Dantes guided his vessel, and at Monte Cristo he arrived at the close of the second day. His boat had proved herself a first-class sailor, and had come the distance from Genoa in thirty-five hours. Dantes had carefully noted the general appearance of the shore, and instead of landing at the usual place, he dropped anchor in the little creek. The island was utterly deserted, and bore no evidence of having been visited since he went away. His treasure was just as he had left it. Early on the following morning he commenced the removal of his riches, and ere nightfall the whole of his immense wealth was safely deposited in the compartments of the secret locker. A week passed by. 
Dantes employed it in manoeuvring his yacht round the island, studying it as a skilful horseman would the animal he destined for some important service, till at the end of that time he was perfectly conversant with its good and bad qualities. The former Dantes proposed to augment the latter to remedy. Upon the eighth day he discerned a small vessel under full sail approaching Monte Cristo. As it drew near he recognized it as the boat he had given to Jacopo. He immediately signalled it. His signal was returned, and in two hours afterwards the newcomer lay at anchor beside the yacht. A mournful answer awaited each of Edmond's eager inquiries as to the information Jacopo had obtained. Old Dantes was dead, and Mercedes had disappeared. Dantes listened to these melancholy tidings with outward calmness, but, leaping lightly ashore, he signified his desire to be quite alone. In a couple of hours he returned. Two of the men from Jacopo's boat came on board the yacht to assist in navigating it, and he gave orders that she should be steered direct to Marseille. For his father's death he was in some manner prepared, but he knew not how to account for the mysterious disappearance of Mercedes. Without divulging his secret, Dantes could not give sufficiently clear instructions to an agent. There were, besides, other particulars he was desirous of ascertaining, and those were of a nature he alone could investigate in a manner satisfactory to himself. His looking-glass had assured him, during his stay at Leghorn, that he ran no risk of recognition. Moreover, he had now the means of adopting any disguise he thought proper. One fine morning, then, his yacht, followed by the little fishing-boat, boldly entered the port of Marseilles, and anchored exactly opposite the spot from whence, on the never-to-be-forgotten night of his departure for the Chateau d'If, he had been put on board the boat destined to convey him thither. Still Dantes could not view without a shudder the approach of a gendarme who accompanied the officers, deputed to demand his bill of health ere the yacht was permitted to hold communication with the shore. But with that perfect self-possession he had acquired during his acquaintance with Faria, Dantes coolly presented an English passport he had obtained from Leghorn, and as this gave him a standing which a French passport would not have afforded, he was informed that there existed no obstacle to his immediate debarkation. The first person to attract the attention of Dantes, as he landed on the Canabière, was one of the crew belonging to the Pharaon. Edmond welcomed the meeting with his fellow, who had been one of his own sailors as a sure means of testing the extent of the change which time had worked in his own appearance. Going straight towards him, he propounded a variety of questions on different subjects, carefully watching the man's countenance as he did so, but not a word or look implied that he had the slightest idea of ever having seen the person with whom he was then conversing. Giving the sailor a piece of money in return for his civility, Dantes proceeded onwards, but ere he had gone many steps, he heard the man loudly calling him to stop. Dantes instantly returned to meet him. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said the honest fellow, in an almost breathless haste. "'But I believe you made a mistake. You intended to give me a two-franc piece, and see, you gave me a double Napoleon.' "'Thank you, my good friend. I see that I have made a trifling mistake, as you say. But by way of rewarding your honesty, I give you another double Napoleon, that you may drink to my health, and be able to ask your messmates to join you.' So extreme was the surprise of the sailor, that he was unable even to thank Edmond, whose receding figure he continued to gaze after in speechless astonishment. Some nabob from India was his comment. Dantes, meanwhile, went on his way. Each step he trod oppressed his heart with fresh emotion. His first and most indelible recollections were there. Not a tree, not a street, that he had passed, but seemed filled with dear and cherished memories and thus he proceeded onwards till he arrived at the end of the Rue de Noailles, from whence a full view of the Allée de Meillon was obtained. At this spot, so pregnant with fond and filial remembrances, his heart beat almost to bursting, his knees tottered under him, a mist floated over his sight, and had he not clung for support to one of the trees, he would inevitably have fallen to the ground and been crushed beneath the many vehicles continually passing there. Recovering himself, however, he wiped the perspiration from his brows, and stopped not again till he found himself at the door of the house in which his father had lived. The nasturtiums and other plants, which his father had delighted to train before his window, had all disappeared from the upper part of the house. Leaning against the tree, he gazed thoughtfully for a time at the upper stories of the shabby little house. Then he advanced to the door, and asked whether there were any rooms to be let. 
though answered in the negative, he begged so earnestly to be permitted to visit those on the fifth floor, that, in despite of the oft-repeated assurance of the concierge that they were occupied, Dantes succeeded in inducing the man to go up to the tenants and ask permission for a gentleman to be allowed to look at them. The tenants of the humble lodging were a young couple who had been scarcely married a week, and seeing them, Dantes sighed heavily. Nothing in the two small chambers forming the apartments remained as it had been in the time of the elder Dantes. The very paper was different. While the articles of antiquated furniture, with which the rooms had been filled in Edmond's time, had all disappeared, the four walls alone remained as he had left them. The bed, belonging to the present occupants, was placed as the former owner of the chamber had been accustomed to have his, and, in spite of his efforts to prevent it, the eyes of Edmore were suffused in tears as he reflected that on that spot the old man had breathed his last, vainly calling for his son. The young couple gazed with astonishment at the sight of their visitor's emotion, and wondered to see the large tears silently chasing each other down his otherwise stern and immovable features, but they felt the sacredness of his grief, and kindly refrained from questioning him as to its cause, while, with instinctive delicacy, they left him to indulge his sorrow alone. When he withdrew from the scene of his painful recollections, they both accompanied him downstairs, reiterating their hope that he would come again whenever he pleased, and assuring him that their poor dwelling would ever be open to him. As Edmond passed the door of the fourth floor, he paused to inquire whether Caderousse the tailor still dwelt there, but he received for reply that the person in question had gone into difficulties, and at the present time kept a small inn on the route from Bellegarde to Beaucaire. Having obtained the address of the person to whom the house in the Allée des Meillons belonged, Dantes next proceeded thither, and under the name of Lord Wilmore, the name and title inscribed on his passport, purchased the small dwelling for the sum of twenty-five thousand francs, at least ten thousand more than it was worth, but had its owner asked half a million, it would unhesitatingly have been given. The very same day the occupants of the apartments on the fifth floor of the house, now become the property of Dantes, were duly informed by the notary who had arranged the necessary transfer of deeds, etc., that the new landlord gave them their choice of any rooms in the house, without the least augmentation of rent, upon condition of their giving instant possession of the two small chambers they at present inhabited. The strange event aroused great wonder and curiosity in the neighbourhood of the Allée de Millon and a multitude of theories were afloat, none of which was anywhere near the truth. But what raised public astonishment to a climax, and set all conjecture at defiance, was the knowledge that the same stranger who had in the morning visited the Allée de Meillon had been seen in the evening walking the little village of the Catalans, and afterwards observed to enter a poor fisherman's hut, and to pass more than an hour in inquiring after persons who had either been dead or gone away for more than fifteen or sixteen years. But on the following day, the family from whom all these particulars had been asked received a handsome present, consisting of an entirely new fishing boat, with two sens and a tender. The delighted recipients of these munificent gifts would gladly have poured out their thanks to their generous benefactor, but they had seen him upon quitting the hut, merely giving some orders to a sailor, and then springing lightly on horseback, leave Marseille by the Port d'Aix. End of chapter 25
A few dinging olives and stunted fig trees struggle hard for existence, but there with red dusty foliage abundantly prove how unequal was the conflict. Between these sticky shrubs grew a scanty supply of garlic, tomatoes, and escalots, while, lone and solitary, like a forgotten sentinel, a tall pine raised its melancholy head in one of the corners of this unattractive spot, and displayed its flexible stem and fan-shaped summit, dried and cracked by the fierce heat of the subtropical sun. In the surrounding plain, which more resembled a dusky lake than solid ground, were scattered a few miserable stalks of wheat, the effect, no doubt, of a curious desire on the part of the agricultural tourists of the country to see whether such a thing as the raising of grain in those parched regions were practical. Each stalk served as a perch for a grasshopper, which regaled the passers-by through this Egyptian scene with its strident, monotonous tone. For about seven or eight years, the little tavern had been kept by a man and his wife, with two servants, a chambermaid named Trinette and a hostler called Pacot. This small staff was quite equal to all the requirements, for a canal between Bukhar and Egmort had revolutionized transportation by substituting boats for the cart and stagecoach. And, as though to add to the daily misery which this prosperous canal inflicted on the unfortunate innkeeper, oh, what a ruin it was fast accomplished! It was situated between the Rhone from which it had its source and the post road it had depleted, not a hundred steps from the inn, of which we have given a brief but faithful description. The innkeeper himself was a man of from forty to fifty five years of age, tall, strong, and bony, a perfect specimen of the natives of those southern latitudes. He had dark, sparkling, and deep set eyes hooked nose, and teeth white as those of a carnivorous animal. His hair, like his beard, which he wore under his chin, was thick and curly, and in spite of his age but slightly interspersed with a few silvery threads. His natural dark complexion had assumed a still further shade of brown from the habit the unfortunate man had acquired of stationing himself from morning till eve at the threshold of his door on the lookout for guests who seldom came. Yet there he stood, day after day, exposed to the meridional rays of a burning sun, with no other protection for his head than a red handkerchief twisted around it, after the manner of the Spanish maltiers. This man was our old acquaintance, Gaspard Cadrose. His wife, on the contrary, whose maiden name had been Madeleine Radel, was pale, meagre, and sickly looking. Born in the neighborhood of Arles, she had shared in the beauty for which its women are proverbial, but that beauty had gradually withered beneath the devastating influence of the slow fever so prevalent among dwellers by the ponds of Egmort and the marshes of Camargue. She remained nearly always in her second-floor chamber, shivering in her chair, or stretched languid and feeble on her bed, while her husband kept his daily watch at the door. A duty he performed it so much to greater willingness as it saved him the necessity of listening to the endless plates and murmurs of his helpmate, who never saw him without breaking out into bitter invectives against fate, to all of which her husband would calmly return an unvarying reply in these philosophic words. Hush, La Carcotte, it is God's pleasure that things should be so. The sobriquet of La Carconte had been bestowed on Madeleine Redel from the fact that she had been born in a village, so-called, situated between Salon and Las Banques, and, as a custom existed among the inhabitants of that part of France, where Cadrose lived of styling every person by some particular and distinctive appellation, her husband had bestowed on her the name of La Carconte in place of her sweet and euphonious name of Madeleine, which, in all probability, his rude cultural language would not have enabled him to pronounce. Still, let it not be supposed that, amid his affected resignation to the will of Providence, the unfortunate innkeeper did not write under the double misery of seeing the hateful scanel carry off his customers and his profits, and the daily inflictions of his peevish partner's murmurs and lamentations. Like other dwellers in the South, he was a man of sober habits and moderate desires, but fond of external show, vain, and addicted to display. 
During the days of his prosperity, not a festivity took place without himself and wife being among the spectators. He dressed in the picturesque costume worn upon grand occasions by the inhabitants of the south of France, bearing equal resemblance to the style adopted both by the Catalans and Andalusians. While, like Arconte, displayed the charming fashion prevalent among the women of Arles, a mode of attire borrowed equally from Greece and Arabia. But, by degrees, watch chains, necklaces, particolored scarves, embroidered bodies, velvet vests, elegantly worked stockings, striped gaiters, and silver buckles for shoes all disappeared. And Gaspard Caderousse, unable to appear abroad in his pristine splendor, had given up any further participation in the pomps and vanities, both from him and his wife, although a bitter feeling of envious discontent filled his mind as sound of mirth and merry music from the joyous revelers reached even the miserable hostelry to which he still clung, more for the shelter than profit it afforded. Caderousse, then, was, as usual, at his place of observation before the door, his eyes glancing listlessly from a piece of closely shaven glass, on which some folds were industriously, though fruitlessly, endeavoring to turn up some grain or insect suited to their palates. To the deserted road, which led away to the north and south, when he was aroused by the shrill voice of his wife, and grumbling to himself as he went, he mounted to her chamber, first taking care, however, to set the entrance door wide open, as an invitation to any chance traveller who might be passing. At the moment Caderus quitted this sentry-like watch before the door, the road on which he so eagerly strained his sight was void and lonely as a desert at midday. There it lay stretching out into an interminable line of dust and sand, with its sides bordered by tall, meagre trees, altogether presenting so uninviting an appearance that no one in his senses could have imagined that any traveller, at liberty to regulate his hours for journeying, would choose to expose himself in such a formidable Sahara. Nevertheless, had Caderousse but retained his post a few minutes longer, he might have caught the dim outline of something approaching from the direction of Bellegarde. As moving object drew nearer, he would easily have perceived that it consisted of a man and a horse, between whom the kindest and most amiable understanding appeared to exist. The horse was of Hungarian breed, and ambled along at an easy pace. His rider was a priest, dressed in black, and wearing a three-cornered hat. And, spite of the ardent rays of a noonday sun, the pair came on a fair degree of rapidity. Having arrived before the pont to guard, the horse stopped, but whether for his own pleasure or that of his rider would have been difficult to say. However that might have been, the priest dismounting led his steed by the bridle in search of some place to which he could secure him. Availing himself of a handle that projected from a half-fallen door, he tied the animal safely and, having drawn a red cotton handkerchief from his pocket, wiped away the perspiration that streamed from his brow. Then, advancing to the door, struck thrice with the end of his iron-shod stick. At this unusual sound, a huge black dog came rushing to meet the daring assailants of his ordinary tranquil abode snarling and displaying his sharp white teeth with a determined hostility that abundantly proved how little he was accustomed to society. At that moment, a heavy footstep was heard descending the wooden staircase that led from the upper floor and, with many bows and courteous smiles, my host of the pont besought his guests to enter. "'You are welcome, sir, most welcome,' repeated the astonished Caderousse. Now then, Margotin, cried he, speaking to the dog, will you be quiet? Pray, don't hit him, sir. He only barks, he never bites. I make no doubt a glass of good wine would be acceptable this dreadful hot day. Then, perceiving for the first time the garb of the traveller he had to entertain, Cadros hastily exclaimed, A thousand pardons, I really did not observe whom I had the honour to receive under my poor roof. What would the heavy please to have? What refreshment can I offer? All I have is at his service. The priest gazed on the person addressing him with a long and searching gaze. 
There even seemed a disposition on his part to court a similar scrutiny on the part of the innkeeper. Then, observing in the countenance of the latter no other expression than extreme surprise at his own want of attention to an inquiry so courteously worded, he deemed it as well to terminate his dumb show, and therefore said, speaking with a strong Italian accent, You are, I presume, Monsieur Caderousse? Yes, sir, answered the host, even more surprised at the question than he had been by the silence which had preceded it. I am Gaspard Caderousse, at your service. Gaspard Caderousse, rejoined the priest. Yes, Christian and surname are the same. You formerly lived, I believe, in the Ailes de Milan, on the fourth floor. I did. And you followed the business of a tailor. True, I was a tailor, till the trade fell off. It is so hot at Marseilles that really I believe that respectable inhabitants will in time go without any clothing whatever. But talking of heat, is there nothing I can offer you by way of refreshment? Yes, let me have a bottle of your best wine, and then, with your permission, we will resume our conversation from where we left off. As you please, sir, said Caderus, who, anxious not to lose the present opportunity of finding a customer for one of the few bottles of Gehors still remaining in his possession, hastily raised a trap door in the floor of the apartment they were in, which served both as parlor and kitchen. Upon issuing forth from his subterranean retreat at the expiration of five minutes, he found the Abbey seated upon a wooden stool, leaning his elbow on a table, while Margotin, whose animosity seemed appeased by the unusual command of the traveller for refreshments, had crept up to him, and had established himself very comfortably between his knees, his long, skinny neck resting on his lap, while his dim eyes were fixed earnestly on the traveller's face. "'Are you quite alone?' inquired the guest, as Caderousse placed before him the bottle of wine and the glass. "'Quite, quite alone,' replied the man. Or, at least, practically so, for my poor wife, who is the only person in the house besides myself, is laid up and with illness, and unable to render me the least assistance, poor thing. You are married, then, said the priest, with a show of interest, glancing round as he spoke at the scanty furnishings of the apartment. Ah, sir, said Caderousse with a sigh. It is easy to perceive I am not a rich man, but in this world a man does not thrive the better for being honest. The Abbey fixed on him a searching, penetrating glance. Yes, honest, I can certainly say that much for myself, continued the innkeeper, fairly sustaining the scrutiny of the Abbey's gaze. I can boast with truth of being an honest man, and continued he significantly, with a hand on his breast and shaking his head. That is more than everyone can say nowadays. So much the better for you, if what you assert be true, said the Abbey, for I am firmly persuaded that, sooner or later, the good will be rewarded, and the wicked punished. Such words as those belong to your profession, answered Cadros, and you do well to repeat them, but added he, with a bitter expression of countenance. One is free to believe them or not, as one pleases. You are wrong to speak thus, said the Abbey, and perhaps I may, in my own person, be able to prove to you how completely you, you are in error. What mean you? inquired Cadreus, with a look of surprise. In the first place, I must be satisfied that you are the person I am in search of. What proofs do you require? Did you, in the year 1814 or 1815, know anything of a young sailor named Dantes? Dantes? <laughs> Did I know, poor dear Edmund? Why, Edmund Dantes and myself were intimate friends, exclaimed Caderousse, whose countenance flushed dark because he caught the penetrating gaze of the Abbey fixed on him, while the clear, calm eye of the questioner seemed to dilate with feverish scrutiny. You remind me, said the priest, that the young man concerning whom I asked you was said to bear the name of Edmund. 
set to bear the name, repeated Caderous, becoming excited and eager. Why, he was so called as truly I myself bore the appellation of Gaspard Caderous. But tell me, I pray, what has become of poor Edmund? Did you know him? Is he alive and at liberty? Is he prosperous and happy? He died the more stretched, hopeless, heartbroken prisoner than felons who paid the penalty of their crimes at the galleys of Toulon. A deadly pallor followed the flush of the countenance of Caderus, who turned away, and the priest saw him wiping the tears from his eyes with the corner of the red handkerchief twisted round his head. Poor fellow, poor fellow, murmured Caderus. Well, there, sir, is another proof that good people are never rewarded on this earth, and that none but the wicked prosper. Ah, continued Caderus, speaking in the highly colored language of the house. The world grows worse and worse. Why does not God, if he really hates the wicked, as he is said to do, stand down brimstone and fire and consume them altogether? You speak as though you have loved this young Dantes, observed the Abbey, without checking any voice of his companion's vehemence. And so I did, replied Caderous. The once I confess, I envied him his good fortune. But I swear to you, sir, I swear to you by everything a man holds dear, I have, since then, deeply and sincerely lamented his unhappy fate. There was a brief silence, during which he fixed, searching eye at the abbey, was employed in scrutinizing the agitated features of the innkeeper. You knew the poor lad, then, continued Caderous. I was called to see him on his dying bed that I might administer to him the consolations of religion. And of what did he die? asked Caderous in a choking voice. Of what, think you, do young and strong men die in prison, when they have scarcely numbered their thirtieth year, unless it be of imprisonment? Caderous swept away the large beds of perspiration that gathered on his brow. But the strangest part of the story is, resumed the abbey, that Dantes, even in his dying moments, swore by his crucified Redeemer that he was utterly ignorant of the cause of his attention. And so he was, murmured Caderous. How should he have been otherwise? Ah, sir, the poor fellow told you the truth. And for that reason, he besought me to try and clear up a mystery he had never been able to penetrate and to clear his memory should any false spot or stain have fallen on it. And here the look of the Abbey, becoming more and more fixed, seemed to rest with ill-concealed satisfaction on the gloomy depression which was rapidly spreading over the countenance of Caderous. A rich Englishman, continued the Abbey, who had been his companion in misfortune, but had been released from prison during the Second Restoration, was possessed of a diamond of immense value. This jewel he bestowed on Dantes upon himself could in the prison, as a mark of his gratitude for the kindness and brotherly care with which Dantes had nursed him in a severe illness he underwent during his confinement. Instead of employing his diamond in attempting to bribe his jailers, who might only have taken it and then betrayed him to the governor, Dantes carefully preserved it. Then, in the event of his getting out of prison, he might have with withal to life, for the sale of such a diamond would have quite sufficed to make his fortune. Then I suppose, asked Caderous with eager, glowing looks, that it was a stone of immense value? Why, everything is relative, answered the Abbey. To one in Edmund's position, the diamond certainly was of great value. It was estimated at fifty thousand francs. Bless me! exclaimed Caderous. Fifty thousand francs! Surely the diamond was as large as a nut to be worth all that. No, replied the abbey. It was not of such a size as that. But you shall judge for yourself. I have it with me. The sharp gaze of Caderous was instantly directed towards the priest's garments, as though hoping to discover the location of the treasure. Calmly drawing forth from his pocket a small box, covered with black shredging, the abbey opened it, 
and displayed to the dazzled eyes of Cadarus the sparkling jewel it contained, set in a ring of admirable workmanship. And that diamond, cried Cadarus, almost restless with eager admiration, you say, is worth fifty thousand francs? It is, without setting, which is also valuable, replied the Abbe, as he closed the box and returned it to his pocket, while its brilliant hues seemed still to dance before the eyes of the fascinated innkeeper. But how comes the diamond is in your possession, sir? Did Edmund make you his heir? No, merely his testamentary executor. I once possessed it four dear and faithful friends, besides the maiden to whom I was betrothed, he said, and I feel convinced they have all unfittingly grieved over my loss. The name of one of the four friends is Cadarus. The innkeeper shrieks. Another of the number, continued the abbey, without seeming to notice the emotion of Cadarus, is called Danglars and the third, in spite of being my rival, entertained a very sincere affection for me. A fiendish smile played over the features of Cadarus, who was about to break in upon the abbey's speech, when the latter, waving his hand, said, Allow me to finish first, and then if you have any observations to make, you can do so afterwards. The third of my friends, although my rival, was much attached to me. His name was Fernand. That of my betrothed was. Stay, stay, continued the abbey. I have forgotten what he called her. Mercedes, said Cadros eagerly. True, said the abbey, with a stiff-lit sigh. Mercedes it was. Go on, urged Cadros. Bring me a carafe of water, said the abbey. Cadros quickly performed the stranger's bidding and, after pouring some into a glass, and slowly swallowing with content, the abbey, resuming his usual placid manner, said, as he placed his empty glass on the table, Where did we leave off? The name of Edmund's betrothed was Mercedes. To be sure, you will go to Marseilles, said Dantes, for you understand, I repeat this word just as he uttered them, do you understand? Perfectly. You will sell this diamond, you will divide the money into five equal parts, and give an equal portion of these good friends, the only persons who have loved me upon earth. But why into five parts? asked Cadarus. You only mentioned four persons. Because the fifth is dead, as I hear. The fifth chair in Edmund's back was, was his own father. Too true, too true ejaculated Cadarus, almost suffocated by the contending passions which assailed him. The poor old man did die. I learned so much at Marseilles, replied the abbey, making a strong effort to appear indifferent, but from the length of time that has elapsed since the death of the elder Dantes, I was unable to obtain any particulars of his end. Can you enlighten me on that point? I do not know who could if I could not. Why, I lived almost on the same floor with the poor old man. Ah, yes, about a year after the disappearance of his son, the poor old man died. Of what did he die? Why, the doctors call his complaint gastroenteritis, I believe. His acquaintances said he died of grief, but I, who saw him in his dying moments, I say he died of... Of what? asked the priest anxiously and eagerly. Why, of downright starvation. Starvation? exclaimed the abbey, springing from his seat. Why, the village animals are not suffered to die by such a death as that. The very dogs that wander houseless and homeless in the streets find some beating hand to cast them a mouthful of bread, and that a man, a Christian, should be allowed to perish of hunger in the midst of other men who call themselves Christians is too horrible for belief. Oh, it is impossible, utterly impossible. What I have said, I have said, answered Cadrus. And, and you are a fool for having said anything about it, said the voice from the top of the stairs. Why 
should you meddle with what does not concern you? The two men turned quickly, and saw the sickly countenance of Lacarcon peering between the baluster rails. Attracted by the sound of voices, she had feebly dragged herself down the stairs, and, seated on the lower step, head on knees, she had listened to the foregoing conversation. Mind your own business, wife, replied Catherus sharply. This gentleman asks me for information, which common politeness would not permit me to refuse. Politeness, you simpleton, retorted La Carconte. What have you to do with politeness, I should like to know? Better study a little common prudence. How do you know the motives that person may have for trying to extract all he can from you? I pledge you my word, madam, said the abbey, that my intentions are good, and that your husband can incur no risk, provided he answers me candidly. Ah, that's all very fine, retorted the woman. Nothing is easier than to begin with fair promises and assurances of nothing to fear, but when poor, silly folks, like my husband there, have been persuaded to tell all they know, the promises and the assurance of safety are quickly forgotten, and at some moment, when nobody expecting it, behold trouble and misery, and all sorts of persecutions are heaped on for unfortunate wretches who cannot even see whence all their afflictions come. Nay, nay, my good woman, make yourself perfectly easy, I beg of you. Whatever evils may befall you, they will not be occasioned by my instrumentality, that I solemnly promise you. Lacarcon muttered a few inarticulate words, then let her head again drop upon her knees, and went into a fit of ague, leaving the two speakers to resume the conversation, but remaining so as to be able to hear every word they uttered. Again the Abbey had been obliged to swallow a draught of water to calm the emotions that threatened to overpower him. When he had sufficiently recovered himself, he said, It appears then that the miserable old man you were telling me of was forsaken by everyone. Surely, had not such been the case, he would not have perished by so dreadful a death. Why, he was not altogether forsaken, continued Caderousse. For Mercedes, the Catalan, and Monsieur Morel were very kind to him, but somehow the poor old man had contracted a profound hatred for Fernand, the very person, added Caderousse with a bitter smile, that you named just now as being one of Dante's faithful and attached friends. And was he not so? asked the abbey. Gaspard, Gaspard! murmured the woman from her seat on the stairs. Mind what you are saying. Carus made no reply to these words, though evidently irritated and annoyed by the interruption, but addressing the Abbey said, Can a man be faithful to another whose wife he covets and desires for himself? But Dantes was so honorable and true in his own nature that he believed everybody's professions of friendship. Poor Edmund, he was cruelly deceived, but it was fortunate that he never knew, or he might have found it more difficult, when on his deathbed to pardon his enemies. And whatever people may say, continued Caderousse in his native language, which was not altogether devoid of rude poetry, I cannot help being more frightened of the idea of the malediction of the dead than the hatred of the living. Imbecile! exclaimed La Carconte. Do you then know in what manner Fernand injured Dantes? inquired the Abbey of Caderousse. Do I? No one better. Speak out then, say what it was. Gaspard! cried La Carconte. Do as you will, you are master, but if you take my advice, you'll hold your tongue. Well, wife, replied Caderousse. I don't know but what you're right. So you will say nothing? asked the Abbey. Why, what good would it do? asked Caderousse. If the poor lad were living, and came to me and begged that I would candidly tell which were his true and which his false enemies, why, perhaps, I should not hesitate. 
but should tell me he is no more, and therefore can have nothing to do with hatred or revenge, so let all such feelings be buried with him. You prefer, then, said the abbey, that I should bestow on men you say are false and treacherous, the reward intended for faithful friendship? That is true enough, returned Cadruz. You say truly, the gift of poor Edmund was not meant for such traitors as Fernand and Danglars. Besides, what would it be to them? No more than a drop of water in the ocean. Remember, chimed in Alacarconte, those two could crush you in a single blow. How so? inquired the abbey. Are these persons, then, so rich and powerful? Do you not know their history? I do not. Pray relate it to me. Cadruz seemed to reflect for a few moments, then said, No, truly, it would take up too much time. Well, my good friend, returned the abbey, in a tone that indicated utter indifference on his part, you are at liberty either to speak or be solid, just as you please. For my own part, I respect your scruples and admire your sentiments, so let matter end. I shall do my duty as consciously as I can, and fulfill my promise to the dying man. My first business will be to dispose of this diamond. So saying, the abbey again drew a small box from its pocket, opened it, and contrived to hold it in such a light that the bright flash of brilliance used passed before the dazzled gaze of Cadrus. Wife, wife, cried he in a hoarse voice, come here. Diamond! exclaimed La Carcon, rising and descending to the chamber with a tolerably firm step. What diamond are you talking about? Why, did you not hear all we said? inquired Caderus. It is a beautiful diamond left by poor Edmond Dantes, to be sold and money divided between his father, Mercedes, his betrothed bride, Fernand, Danglars and myself. The jewels is worth at least fifty thousand francs. Oh, what a magnificent jewel! cried the astonished woman. The fifth part of the profits from this stone belongs to us, then, does it not? asked Cadarus. It does, replied the abbey, with the addition of an equal division of that part intended for the elder Dantes, which I believe myself a liberty to divide equally with the four survivors. And why among us four? inquired Cadarus, as being the friends Edmund esteemed most faithful and devoted to him. I don't call those friends who betray and ruin you, muttered the wife in her turn, in a low, muttering voice. Of course not, rejoined Cadarus quickly. No more do I, and that was what I was observing to this gentleman just now. I said I looked upon it as a sacrilegious profanation to reward treachery, perhaps crime. Remember, answered the abbey calmly, as he replaced the jewel in its case in the pocket of his cassock. It is your fault, not mine, that I do so. You will have the goodness to furnish me with the address of both Fernand and Danglars, in order that I may execute Edmund's last wishes. The agitation of Caderousse became extreme, and large drops of perspiration rolled from his hated brow. As he saw the abbey rise from his seat and go towards the door, as though to ascertain if his horse was sufficiently refreshed to continue his journey, Cadros and his wife exchanged looks of deep meaning. There, you see, wife, said the former, this splendid diamond might be all yours if we choose. Do you believe it? Why, surely a man of his holy profession would not deceive us? Well, replied La Carconte. Do as you like. For my part, I wash my hands off the affair. So saying, she once more climbed the staircase leading to her chamber, her body convulsed with chills, and her teeth rattling in her head, in spite of the intense heat of the weather. Arrived at the top stairs, she turned round and called out, in a warning tone to her husband. Gaspard, consider well what you are about to do. I have both reflected and decided, answered he. 
La Carconte entered her chamber, the flooring of which creaked beneath her heavy, uncertain tread, as she proceeded towards her armchair, into which she fell as though exhausted. Well? asked the heavy, as he returned to the apartment below. What have you made up your mind to do? To tell you all I know, was the reply. I certainly think you act wisely in so doing, said the priest. Not because I have the least desire to learn anything you may please to conceal from me, but simply that if, through your assistance, I could distribute the legacy according to the wishes of the testator, why, so much the better, that is all. I hope it may be so, replied Caderousse, his face flushed with cupidity. I am all attention, said the abbey. Stop a minute, answered Caderousse. We might be interrupted in the most interesting part of my story, which would be a pity, and it is as well that your visit thither should be made known only to ourselves. With these words he went stealthy to the door, which he closed, and, by way of still greater precaution, bolted and buried it, as he was accustomed to do at night. During this time the Abbey had chosen his place for listening at his ease. He removed his seat into a corner of the room, where he himself would be in deep shadow, while the light would be fully thrown on the narrator. Then, with head bent down and hands clasped, or rather clinched together, he prepared to give his all attention to Caderus, who seated himself on the little stool exactly opposite to him. Remember, this is no affair of mine, said the trembling voice of La Carconte, as though through the flooring of her chamber she viewed the scene that was enacting below. Enough, enough, replied Caderousse. Say no more about it. I will take all the consequences upon myself. And he began his story. End of chapter 26